Welcome back to day two of the Wright IT Summit. Yesterday, I took you around Dayton to show you some significant Wright Brothers and aviation landmarks in the city. Today, I thought I would welcome you in front of David Black's sculpture on Main Street in downtown Dayton. It's here that you get to see a direct representation of the Wright Brothers' first flight, all 120 feet of it. This stainless steel material and winged forms allude to modern flight. My, how aviation has changed through the years. I hope you enjoyed today's first keynote on the Air Force's digital transformation. Good morning and welcome to day two of the Wright IT Summit. I'm Dave Dodds, the AFC of Dayton Wright Chapter President. I hope you stay tuned yesterday and we're able to have uh, some conversations during the networking session there. Uh, I think that went quite well. I want to do a shout out for ITA. They're our uh, platform provider here doing, coordinating this event. There's a lot of activity that goes on behind the scenes here. It's really interesting to see them put this production together in a nice professional format for us. If you have any technical difficulties, Again, it's the same uh, number that you had yesterday, 1-800-899-8877. So we have an exciting day planned for you, including five panels on digital transformation. But before we get to those panels, we will hear from Colonel Scott McKeever. Uh, if you have questions for Colonel McKeever, please use the window that's to the right. Uh, Colonel McKeever is the director of the CSAF Strategic Studies Group, headquarters, U.S. Air Force. He's leading, a, is a leading voice for innovation focused on digital transformation. Additionally, Colonel McKeever leads an innovative department-wide data project. Previously, he served as the Global Mobility Lead, where he spearheaded the Air Force's efforts to accelerate the commercial electric vertical takeoff and landing industry. Additional assignments include the Joint Staff as a Senior Strategist and Commander of the 818th Mobility Support Advisory Squadron. He is both a C-17 and a C-130 Command Pilot with multiple assignments. And he's also served as a Presidential Advance Agent. Please help me welcome Colonel Scott McEver. Sir, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you for that kind and uh, warm introduction. Uh, Really appreciate it, and also uh, thank you for all those that make these types of events happen. Um, it is not easy uh, to pull this off uh, virtually, and um, so thank you. So I just want to say, you know, hello, um, welcome to my home. Uh, that is actually not a real background. That's, uh, you know, one of those uh, virtual or actually in this case physical background, but, you know, it's important to recognize that many of us are logging in from our homes. Um, so there's a strong chance that you may hear a dog bark or maybe two dogs bark in the background or three kids yelling uh, for either me or their mom as they, what I call, excel in their virtual learning environment. Um, so if that happens, just uh, bear with us. It, it is like. So first, uh, again, thanks for having me. It's an honor to speak with you this morning. Um, I hope, uh, like uh, me, you've already had your cup of coffee. Uh, I've had two already uh, to start off because we're going to talk strategy and we're going to talk digital transformation. Um, so for some, of those, for some of us, this gets us excited. We wake up in the morning to tackle this. And for others, you know, this may be a topic that's uh, maybe not as interesting or as compelling. So I would like to say that um, and, and contend that when we think about the intersection between what we need to do strategically and digital transformation, and we think about the competitive nature of the world that we're in, that it may be one of the most essential things that our Air Force does in the next five years. So that statement is my opinion. Lots of people will say that they have the most important uh, thing on their plate, um, but I'm living and breathing uh, both the challenges um, of that transformation and its promise. Um, so what are we talking about here? Let's see if I can, uh, there we go, whoops. So what are we talking about here? Last night, um, I was trying to listen in for some inspiration, and I Googled digital transformation thought leaders, and I'd encourage people to do it because if you're looking for an ounce of uh, motivation, there's about 100 TED Talks that you can listen to, and some of them may be more interesting than me. Um, that's probably true. 
but one of them really, um, it was compelling. And this speaker said, digital transformation is less about technology. It is the active reimagining of our organizations through the perspective of a new generation who have grown up surrounded by sophisticated smartphone technology. So I'd say keep that thought in mind, if that imagining part about and about organizations and then that, that characteristic of people. Keep it in mind as you think about your own personal digital life and experiences as compared to the one in your own workplace. And I'll come to back to that here shortly. Some of what I'll talk about today has to do with data. Um, we're gonna talk about people, data, culture, a little bit of, uh, across the board, but I wanna key you in on that uh, quote there at the bottom. And I'll let everybody read it. But one aspect of that quote is about understanding ourselves. And if you pull the logic through what Sun Tzu was saying there, that the inability to understand ourselves will or could potentially result in our defeat. And I think that's extremely important as we enter into this you know, much more digital world. We have the ability through data to understand ourselves in a way that maybe we haven't before and then unleash the power of some of the tools and technological advancements in order to ensure that we're that much more competitively positioned with regards to understanding ourselves. So we said we're gonna talk a little bit about strategy. So um, I think uh, we'll start off with the strategic environment. Most people start on the left side of the slide. I'm gonna start on the right. So over there on the strategic environment side, our you know, guiding documents, national defense strategy, we've all heard this, right? So um, obviously we're in this long-term strategic competition. It specifically calls out China. And, and if you read um, you know, lots of what's written here, you know, there's challenges across the darn. Uh, across the diplomatic information information space, the military and the economic, there's it. We are confronted. We also have to think about right this world order that was created in post World War II. It's resilient, but it's potentially weakening, and it's potentially weakening uh, because of the actions of those competitors. And then third, our military advantage may be no more. So we have to consider, you know, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? And then I added, so this is Scott McKeever's view, in order to kind of deal with that strategic context, we need innovators. We need people that are gonna bring in new capabilities, new ways of doing business. And we have to recognize that there are strong forces to push against innovation. So I have a quote uh, here um, from Machiavelli, and I think it's really powerful. He said, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. So think about that. We rely on innovators to bring us new things, new ways of doing business, and the innovator's journey is perilous, surrounded by enemies of his friends, potentially, and of those of the old order. So when you think about all that, that's the context. We look over there to uh, the left side of the slide and we think about you know, digital transformation. What does it do? Um, and I think ultimately it's allowing us to deliver a more lethal force. If we get down to our national defense strategy, the lines of effort, really line of effort one is all about lethality. And, you know, some people think, you know, this is about people, you know, really the combat side of the military, but this is also about our ability to deter or to compete. How do we do that, right? So this transformation allows us to, to think faster and make uh, quicker decisions. And it's really about, you know, in one respect, you know, it's about taking data, turning it into information, um, using that information to power analytics and the power and the promise of AI on top of it to really speed up our decision making. But it's also about, it's about putting people to work solving people problems, things that we're good at, things like that require an emotional aspect or maybe ethical challenges and put digital tools to work solving problems that digital tools would solve, repetition, uh, those kinds or big data enabled uh, types of activities. And I think the bottom one for me is really important. I look at our Air Force and we have excellence everywhere. 
Um, we are the envy of many air forces across the world, but we do have lots of stovepipes. And these stovepipes exist between commands and organizations, between countries. And a digital world allows us to kind of uh, expose who we are um, and allows us to share that transparently across those stovepipes, maybe across those commands, and potentially connect uh, nations together um, in a way that hasn't done before. And so how are we gonna do this? And I think that that little tagline there at the bottom is really important. So if we are gonna compete, the Department of the Air Force has got to ingest, modify, and use digital technology at the speed that commercial innovation is done. You know, our commercial partners live and breathe and maybe more of that Machiavellian world that I discussed. You know, it's a, it's a world of competition, uh, a world of innovation, and we need to be able to adapt and move um, at that speed, and we have a lot to learn there. So when I think about digital transformation, everybody can think about it differently. Um, for me, I kind of bucket into these big kind of bins. So we have people and culture, technology, and data. I'm going to focus a little bit on the people and the, the data side. Um, it's, a, it's where I kind of work and live. Um, so on the people side, you know, this is about the totality of the Air Force. This is about that transformational journey from the, we call it from the flight line to the four star. Yes, we are gonna have ninjas and they need a different level of training, but we need our senior leaders to expect more um, from either data or from the digital tools that we create. Um, and we've not, we need probably a, a higher level of basic uh, knowledge across the force. And I like to say, we have, we have come out publicly, the Air Force, and said, you know, JADC2, we are all in. But we don't get to JADC2 unless we have JADC2 airmen. And so we need to start building that today. Building skills is a long process. It is not something you just do overnight. And I argue that we are probably behind on that journey. If you look at what's happened out there in the commercial space, I think it was AT&T just said that they were going to invest a billion dollars in upskilling their workforce. So I'd like to say that we uh, are starting that journey and I'll add on that uh, here in a little bit. But how do people and culture connect, right? So when an airman comes in and he's lived or she has lived a life with uh, their smartphone technology and they come into the Air Force and like, oh man, oh, I'm back in the like early 90s, you know, back when maybe I was, you know, I was born. Um, and they demand more. The worry that I have is that that demand, it goes away in time and they become accustomed to living in maybe a, a digitally backwards world, potentially in the Air Force. We want them to stay hungry. We don't want acceptance of something different. We want them to, to demand more. So we have to think about that interplay between the people and the culture. On technology, um, just touch on that a little bit. We need it accessible, easy to use uh, for all. We need to be able to deploy it. Um, and I say that, you know, deploying at the edge as far as we can uh, to the edge of uh, our organizations. Uh, it needs to be able to deliver value though, all the way up to the, the top of our echelons and agile, right? We, uh, although I love the B-52 and I flew C-130s, they've been around a long time. Um, I would argue that we need to be able to adapt uh, and bring in new technologies fast. And then, on to data. I think yesterday, for those that were on, Colonel DeStefani talked about Baltus, so I'm not going to add uh, much there. But I, maybe I will add that the interplay between people and data. So there's a lot of data. The Air Force, I think, has 2,800 different data systems, maybe more, depends on how you count them. And right now, those were built for specific problems. Uh, there's tables and columns and what that all means. But we need people to turn that data into information. And if we think about it, that's when the power of data, that's the power of data. It can make d data sing if we're able to create what I call like that organizational digital twin. Um, and that's hard work that requires people that both understand the data um, and uh, people that understand our Air Force. And then I add that little remark there, the ways of working. So I have a British exchange officer that works for me, group captain, little child. This is his way of saying, these are the norms. This is kind of like what you do when you show up to work. How do you send messages? How do you operate? And this gets back to the quote I, I talked about, about reimagining our organizations. 
you know, the digital, digital transformation is about really changing our ways of working. So maybe you could think about that as, you know, it's part of the ends. That's the ends that we seek. Um, but in the end, it will have a potential to really just transform um, everything from how you log into your computer, how you interact across uh, organizations, potentially even internationally um, with our partners. So that's a little bit about um, how I think about digital transformation. I'm going to go into a little bit about kind of what we're doing. Um, so on the people side, I think this is just uh, really uh, kind of amazing work that has been done and innovative work. And we've got a long way to go, but with Digital University and maybe some that are listening in have uh, licenses and are on this platform. Over 7,000 training courses. Um, it covers the gamut of all kinds of different digital skills that we need um, and really using the best of breed from commercial um, kind of applications of how they do this with badging and certi uh, certifications. But this is about upskilling uh, the entire force. It's a platform that allows that to kind of level that playing field. It shows a strong commitment to invest in our people. There are tons of uh, people in our Air Force that are personally motivated and are already engaging um, either with their own money or using this platform to upskill themselves. And this shows a strong commitment um, to those types of people and an incentive maybe to those that are on the fence and thinking about it. And as we've heard from uh, the Space Force uh, recently, you know, about baking in kind of digital skills uh, at the birth, if you will, of the Space Force, this is about um, weaving in digital competency is kind of a part of who we are. So if you're not familiar, for those of the government folks that are on here, you know, uh, check out uh, Digital U. It's uh, extremely exciting. And then I'll move here to, uh, to data, right? So what's going on here? I think it's important to kind of foot stomp this approach. I think it's excellent. Um, I think Colonel DeStefani probably talked about this yesterday and uh, our chief data officer's approach to data. Um, I'm not going to read all the words in this slide. Um, and this is where we need to get from that phase one to phase three. And for me, you know, how do we get there? Right? This is a great strategy. Um, and we, we are all in on this. But we get there with people. So again, we need those visionary leaders that have some kind of a greater probably uh, digital acumen that can demand from data what they need from data. They need to be driving these, um, I hate to use the word requirements, and we also need a skilled workforce that can deliver on those demands. So as we move from kind of uh, maybe where we are right now from a federated data to thinking about data as a service and then, um, and then layering, on, um, uh, layering on tools uh, such as AI and ML, um, this is that pathway, and I would just say that we need people as part of that pathway to forge the way. So I think it's important. So there's a little bit about people, um, a little bit about data, but it's kind of like, so what? So what's happening? So I think this is a great success story. And if I were to tell people, you know, where should we be investing or what should we be doing? Um, there's all kinds of way, places to go, but this is a place that to me is a no brainer. So robotic process automation. And real quick, I'd like to just, I'm just gonna throw it out there. The Air Force is woefully, woefully behind here. So uh, I'm not saying we're necessarily behind our competitors, but we're really behind the state of industry. Um, there are legions of airmen um, that I think everybody's aware of that are cut and pasting in Excel spreadsheets from one system to another, doing repetition of task over and over again. And I would just argue that we need to do everything in our power to stop that. We need airmen to do airmen problems. So, but real quick on the success story. So with 12, within the last few months, 12 RPA deployments, think bots at AFPC, we are showing the promise to deliver over 120 man years of savings every year with a approximate you know, manpower cost savings of over $5 million with the potential uh, with the future deployment of other bots to get to 200 man years and potentially uh, six to seven million a year. That's just one command with a series of a few bots deployed. Um, on a project that I'm working on kind of related to COVID related readiness, um, 
with under four weeks of development work in kind of a prototype fashion, um, we've saved at least 30 man days of work a month, which is really unleashing um, at least six airmen um, who were spending about five days a month, so a week a month, to be able to then answer those so what kind of questions, the why question, not just doing uh, what they were doing, which was, um, well, I watched it, 28 tabs on a spreadsheet from seven different systems. We have now been able to automate some of those things um, so that they can then do those so what. And then um, within our office, we run the Vice Chief Challenge um, and airmen know what's possible. So when you look at what they're submitting with 350 ideas generated, I would say a vast majority of them are in this bucket. Um, of course, you know, the Vice Chief Challenge this year was all about saving airmen time. Um, so, you know, one of the best ways to do that is with uh, robotic process automation. So, of course, you know, kind of uh, we expect that, but they know what is possible. So I think, you know, this is an example. Again, it's about the lethality um, and we really need uh, airmen to do tasks that only airmen are uniquely suited to do. And again, I think I've foot stomped enough on the, uh, the cut and pasting that's going on. Um, and for those, I'll just say on that note, for those that haven't had an opportunity to go maybe work in an AOC, and we now have Kessel Run that's out there doing amazing work with AOCs, but um, literally scores of airmen um, that are uh, really hamstrung or hands tied behind their back on what they can do. But we're getting after that um, and really trying to kind of unleash their potential. So, um, I'm going to tell a quick story, and I think this helps kind of get at the why and, and the what. So when COVID uh, kicked off, organizations all over the United States and all over the world um, were maybe ill-equipped with their current structures to deal with it. So um, we're not special, right? So the Air Force stood up uh, task forces, and maybe your command stood up task forces. So the headquarters stood up task force and teams of teams. And I'm just gonna list a bunch of questions that came and the challenges to just to be able to answer those questions. So here's where, here were some of them. Well, what's gonna happen when we stop flying training sorties at a rate of say 50%? What's gonna happen to uh, the readiness of our squadrons um, across the board? Which squadrons are more impacted? Where should I? Um, should I be directed that some uh, fly more? How about that balance between the health uh, or the, the spread, say, of COVID and uh, commanders' uh, authorities to either uh, modulate what they're doing on the ground? What, wait a second. Are you telling me that this might impact our working capital funds and that that's going to then potentially impact our downstream supply? Um, how, how does that look and what's happening in the, you know, on the assembly lines or what's happening in the depots? How is that then in turn impacting our ability to potentially pull out of this readiness question? Wait a second, schools, schools aren't open. People are home. How many people are home teaching their kids? I'm home teaching my kids. I don't know about you. Um, wait, are there different kinds of missions more impacted than others? Uh, wait, Command X, you have a, an older workforce. How much more at risk are you? Do you need to take different approaches to, um, to your protective measures? Another question that I thought was really interesting, which is, look, the, the facts on the ground in, in this area or around my base are different um, than, say, in another base. Um, is that HP con measure we're taking, is that keeping them more safe or less safe? Meaning, is it more safe to be on base where we can control um, the health kind of precautions or is it better that they're out in the community? Um, what are those decisions I need to make? What are they, that then relate to combat readiness or training? Um, how does that then relate to our financial story? So these were questions that were coming in at a rapid pace and i would say they pull on the thread that uh, carries through um, things that might have been a personnel story a health protection story 
uh, operation story, but we need to be able to pull and sync um, our data together to be able to tell that Air Force story. We were challenged and we still are. So that is a challenge that I have today that I think all of us have and we'll probably have for a while to come. So what I just described there, and I meant to put this slide up, it's this picture. So up there you have all the data and all those 2,800 data systems. And we're trying to paint the picture of who the airman is. What does that installation look like? How does the money flow? What do those weapon systems look like? All, the, all to get to the decisions on the right. We need smart decisions proposed that's data informed so that those one stars, two stars, or whatever commanders that ever installation can make smart decisions. So that's just a little bit of that, um, that story, but I'm gonna move on here. So I, I'm gonna kind of wrap up so we can get to some questions. Um, if you look over on the right, this is the help that we need. Some of you may have seen some of this before, but we are gonna continue to fight uh, with some of the COVID challenges and continue to fight through it. Um, we are on a path to upskill our airmen um, and we are continuing to push on digital modernization across the spectrum. Um, I like to think about what digital modernization can do about that partnership role with across the DOD. Uh, partner nations are, even our congressional uh, partners um, and how this then, um, this kind of modernization can blend in with our very important industrial base. Um, and then thinking about reimagining organizations, the, the role of digital transformation that we have all now reimagined what is, how work is possible um, in, in a COVID world. And in all of doing that, right, we need to be thinking about our airmen and working on that uh, user experience. I, over there on the left, so my boss, General Wilson, um, he's always saying attack, 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 Scott. Um, and he gives a very compelling uh, message there about the need to connect the force and then I'm also gonna wrap up here with a quote from the former acting secretary of the Air Force. Our advantage in future battles depends on our ability to fuse vast amounts of data, to accelerate our decision cycle, to guarantee the success of any mission. Victory in combat will depend on us becoming a digital Air Force. And that was signed by the Honorable Matt Donovan. And I would argue that victory in competition and being able to deliver the promise of deterrence is also dependent on us becoming a digital Air Force. So with that, I'll close and I am really looking forward to uh, hard questions and hopefully I can answer most of them. So thank you. Thank you, sir. That was very enlightening. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. So uh, I'll, I'll throw some of those out there. Um, it sounds like COVID has maybe moved up to the top of the list of issues right now. Um, but where do you see the most pressing need outside of, you know, the COVID arena that we're in right now? And where can industry help you the most? Right. So um, great question. Um, and I'd like to say that um, these are not necessarily uh, separate issues. Um, so it's, and I'm, I'm gonna caveat this a little bit onto, um, onto the digital transformation side. So not necessarily the totality of, you know, what the most important uh, kind of capability the Air Force needs, whether that's, you know, JADC2 or, but really on the digital transformation side and um, what can industry do? So I think when we get back to the agility that we need and the ability to rapidly uh, bring in new technologies in a way that is uh, competitive. Um, and I think we've heard this from Dr. Roper when he talks about, you know, his E-series and, um, but we need to, we need to be brought solutions that look like that. Um, we need to be demanding that from our industry partners. Um, and I think industry lives in this world. So it's really sharing kind of how that process works um, and helping us um, be able to do what for so much of this country already happens uh, day to day. You know, I've seen some kind of plans out there or ideas on, you know, 15 years, say, journeys to, um, let's just call it uh, uh, data in, in the cloud. And 
that's interesting. It's an interesting roadmap. Um, I would say 15 years ago, um, to be able to lay out a path to where we are today, nobody would have envisioned where we are today. So in this world of digital transformation, our foresight and the ability to see the future is not great. And that's okay. Like we need to accept that that's the reality and, to, and then move. So we have a tendency in the Pentagon to a little bit of a, a, a uh, analysis paralysis. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from our industry partners about in that, in that world of uncertainty is how to move you know, directionally correct um, and deliver capability. Great question. Thank you, sir. Um, you also mentioned about the, uh, the vice chief challenge. And there's a question here, is there an approach to do more innovation labs at the point of delivery, such as the shop floor and the flight line and things like that? Yeah, so um, I'll talk about what I know. And then uh, uh, I'm not sure, like down at that level, right? So I think that gets into probably, you know, what command commanders are doing and how they can organize their forces, whether that's wing commanders, group commanders, um, you know, even squadron commanders. Um, I will say that, you know, innovation right now, it definitely is, I call it, a, you know, battle space. Um, our chief of staff of the Air Force, you know, with his message on accelerate, change or lose, um, you know, that is, uh, that is a push. We do have spark cells that are out there across the Air Force. And so, um, you know, for those that are on the government side here, or on the Air Force side, you know, I encourage people to, to reach out to them. Um, there are uh, amazing airmen that are finding kind of their best selves, selves by interacting with those uh, organizations. I do not see um, these types of organizations um, necessarily going away. Um, if anything, maybe they will grow. And when I say grow, that's not um, to use. So for those that are on the government side, like the, the UMDs, or like the manning documents may not adjust. But our ability to use our workforce differently um, to get after these problems, I see continuing to grow. Um, so I would say engage with, if you are out there, you know, on the flight line, engage with your local spark cell. And uh, you can always send me a note and uh, I'll, I'll see if I can connect you with those local innovators at, at your location. Thank you, sir. A reminder to the audience folks, uh, you can uh, send in your questions. Uh, by the uh, link at the bottom there. And uh, I do see that we had a number of folks that uh, you hit a note with the digital U, uh, so people will be uh, referencing that in the future. Um, so as airmen, here's another question. As airmen become uh, more digital, are you concerned about retaining them? That is, as their skills become more valuable within the commercial world, might retention be affected? And has there been any thought given to offsetting some sort of IT professional pay because of that? So that's, a, that's an excellent question and could be no more timely. Um, so this uh, very question is one that is always discussed, um, I will say at a very a senior level, probably even discussed yesterday. So, um, and this has been an issue that our senior leaders over the last two years are grappling with. Um, and I think the question says, are we considering? And I would say everything is on the table, right? So we need to just make a decision and move out. Um, when we think about those key skills uh, that are important, or in how we compete with the private sector. We have all kinds of tools at our disposal. So, um, you know, pre-COVID, you know, pilots, right? They're a uh, critical resource. We have an aviation um, retention pay. You know, our neurosurgeons, right? There's a, a pay for them, cryptolinguists. Like we have these tools. Um, I think what a lot of people have realized also is we need to allow people to do meaningful work that feels like they are making a difference. And that sometimes is the number one tool that we can give people. And right now, I would say that we have handcuffed some of that for our airmen. We are trying to unleash them. So, um, you know, for those that we send to very 
maybe specialized training in this regard. You know, we have software factories, but what about those other, say 50,000 or 100,000 airmen with these skills? Um, we are trying right now to think about how to, uh, this gets back to those in, that innovation question uh, and what we're doing at kind of the edge, but how do we use those people differently and allow them to do work so that they're not stuck, for instance, writing macros in Excel, maybe they're able to do some development work uh, outside. No decision's been made there. Um, and I will say that we are looking at other um, programs we have like the foreign language um, incentive pay as maybe models for how we would maybe get up to the pay side. But I would say it's not just pay. Um, that, that's gonna be very difficult, I think, for us to compete. Um, and so maybe our, we are also thinking about our models of retention and recruitment in this area. And uh, so that, those are all on the table and a very pertinent question. Thank you, sir. Um, we have a, a question in here about how you're going to measure transformation success. Are there any metrics that you've all been considering in regard to that? So um, that's um, so that's not my expertise. I'll put that there, uh, out there. We do have, you know, at a very high level. So the way we organize with uh, um, it, across the Air Force, we do have, you know, SAP MG. So um, they are kind of tasked with some of that measurement. I will say though, um, along certain projects that we are working. Um, we have to we have to consider uh, we have to consider that assessment. I'll also state that this is a difficult question, and the time scale that we're looking at here is very important. So sometimes it's difficult to measure step by step, but when you when you step back maybe ten years from now, it'll be very easy to measure. And so we have to think about the timelines uh, associated with that measurement. It's sometimes very difficult to understand if you're on that upward path while you're on it. You get accustomed to kind of where you are. You can measure, like, was this program successful? Was that? But when you step back from a department-wide view, um, you know, did we make a difference? And the perspective, and I think the issue of time is uh, incredibly important there. I know I didn't answer that uh, perfectly, um, and it is a great question. I would say that at the if you're in this world of bringing in new or changing the way of doing business, it should be baked in from the beginning. Um, I will also say that the desire that people have in order to show near-term gains in, um, when we do innovation can sometimes, um, and when we don't get the time scale right, can sometimes inadvertently uh, squash that innovation. So we need to give uh, the new a chance to grow and excel and to compete against what I will call the old. Um, and we need to make sure we're measuring it at the appropriate time and maybe not expecting too much too early along maybe a capabilities journey. Thank you. Uh, that's almost a perfect lead in for the next question here. Um, as you mentioned, the, the culture of the innovators, and then there's the status quo block as well. Uh, so how is the Air Force tackling that problem, and, and how are they uh, tracking to work around it? That's yeah, so a great question. And um, what I didn't mention with the quote, so if, uh, and I'm not a Machiavelli expert, uh, so there's probably somebody here that correct me. But what's really interesting in that quote is he's talking about the prince. So he's talking about the leader and really talking about the innovator. Um, and he's talking about the need to create stability in the order. And he is essentially saying that the only way you can create stability in the order is to embrace those that create really disruption or innovation within yourself. Um, and that that person who needs to bring in new and do new things is journey is perilous. Because if all you do is maintain the status quo, you will be assured of some external force disrupting uh, your job maybe to create stability. So I think that's just a really interesting uh, view. 
I think at a very senior level, um, our senior leadership gets it. So uh, I work for the vice chief, he gets it. So senior leader buy-in um, of that kind of idea is incredibly important. Um, and whether that is, you know, us stepping out with uh, AppWorks, um, you know, I think most people are aware it was named uh, the number 16 on Fast Company's uh, best workplace for innovators. It's the only government agency to make the list. You know, how did that happen? That happened with, um, I would call extreme senior leader buy-in. We also think about, for instance, the uh, MIT AI Accelerator, a very different partnership model and uh, not a high cost kind of uh, approach um, to really kind of interact with some of the, um, the world's best um, uh, AI, I would just call it ecosystem. Um, and in order to do something like that, that really requires um, senior leader uh, buy-in and advocacy. And right now at this moment, um, I'm excited um, because we have that within our force um, everywhere. And that's a strong message that was from our previous air chief, uh, excuse me, previous chief of staff to now General Brown. Uh, General Wilson is kind of that uh, the powerhouse, if you will, of innovation uh, with Dr. Roper and others. So I think the leadership team is right. Now they just need to make sure that those good ideas uh, bubble up to them um, so that they can give it top cover. Thank you. Um... Well, sir, we, we don't have any more questions that have come in right now, but I would uh, ask if you've got final thoughts you want to leave our audience with uh, to take a couple minutes to do that. Great. Absolutely. So thanks uh, for the opportunity. Uh, you know, I think thanks for the questions. Uh, hopefully uh, I was able to answer some of them. Um, and for those that are there, you know, feel free to, you know, reach out to us. I lead a, a small team. We call it smalloffice.com. Report directly to the vice chief. I have uh, the senior most exchange officers from France, the UK, and Germany that work for me. So all colonels, uh, a chief, and, um, and a GS-15. And so we're like a little small team. We, uh, excuse me, and a Japanese liaison officer. Um, and we get after uh, the problems that we can and try to push um, with some innovative ideas through our leadership. I think for me, I spent time on the joint staff and was thinking about long-term competition, thinking about issues of economic competition. Um, and now as I move and, you know, I went through AFWIC and I'm here working for the vice chief, this is, this is a moment, right? So I try to wake up every day knowing that I'm in a battle, um, knowing that what we're doing here is important. I look at my kids every day and they kind of, um, sometimes they frustrate me because we're also trying to teach them uh, in their virtual school. But really, I'm trying to create a, um, a future for the next generation that was one uh, that I had. So the recognition that we have an important role to play in the Air Force, uh, in the Department of Defense, in that long-term uh, competition game. So it powers me every day. The power, again, of the innovator and bringing in new is uh, fraught with peril um, and can be frustrating. And is a story, really, of failure, right? So every new thing you try, you're gonna probably fail nine out of 10 times and that's okay, you just gotta pick it up uh, and keep going. And so for the leaders on the line, um, you know, we just need to keep adding fuel uh, to that fire because I think it's incredibly important. And when we bring this to digital uh, transformation, um, we deserve to do this for our airmen and for our country. Um, there is so much opportunity here and really with the power of things that have happened in the commercial sector, we have the ability to move at pace and scale um, that is, is remarkable. Um, we don't necessarily need a whole bunch of R&D necessarily. We might need to just modify, and it's about kind of uh, uh, reimagining, uh, again, to use that quote from before, reimagining what is possible, especially within our organizations. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully I gave a little bit of inspiration for folks, uh, maybe some heavy topics uh, early in the morning with strategy and Sun Tzu and Machiavelli. Uh, but uh, I, I hope it did uh, provided some inspiration. I know the rest of the day looks like an exciting lineup of, uh, of some really meaty topics. So thank you. 
Well, thank you, sir. We appreciate uh, you taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us this morning and sharing your thoughts and uh, getting us kicked off for the day with uh, some deep thoughts there. So uh, thank you. Uh, we'll go to a break now, and we will be back at 1010. Thank you. I wonder if the Wright brothers could have imagined the transformation of aviation from a manned bi-wing aircraft to an unmanned drone. I'm here at the Springfield Beckley Municipal Airport, home of the 178th Wing Unit of the Ohio National Guard, just 15 miles from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The 178th Wing transitioned from a fighter wing to an intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance wing. It supports the MQ-9 Reaper remotely piloted aircraft and is under the control of the Air Combat Command. Pilots based in Springfield are able to fly MQ-9s on the other side of the world. How could the Wright brothers have ever imagined that? By the way, Springfield would be a great home to the Space Force mission. Well, good morning. I'm retired Colonel Wade Ruper from the United States Air Force and now with Telos Corporation. And I am truly humbled and honored to moderate today's panel comprised of such a talented and seasoned set of United States Air Force Expeditionary Cyberspace Communicators. When we first started talking about the Wright IT Summit, I wanted to make sure as a moderator that we had the point of view of the warfighter at the tactical edge. As acquisition and defense industrial base members think about supporting the warfighter, it's imperative that we think of those people first. Today's panel entitled Defending the Cyber Realm in an Edge Environment will focus largely on capabilities, technologies, and approaches. But before we self-introduce our warfighting panel members, I'd like to focus on a few things that are unique about providing services to non-flying and flying customers at the pointy edge of the sphere. Typically, we think about the tactical edge as being located overseas, but repeatedly in recent times, the edge has quite often been co-located with first responders and government support agencies, such as FEMA, the Department of Homeland Security, the Emergency Management Agencies, and the U.S. Northern Command. They provide customers with the disaster relief services within the 54 states and territories. In many instances, the effects of weather related events, such as CONUS based hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Wilma, Gustav, Harvey, and Michael, and the 2017 hurricanes Maria and Irma in the Caribbean, have provided as many challenges requiring adaptive and resourceful responses to quote unquote military operations at this pointy end of the spear. Even as we speak right now, we have Hurricane Delta formulating out in the Gulf Coast. When the entire southeastern western range was absolutely decimated in 2018, we had things at Tyndall Air Force Base absolutely obliterated and could have been at a tactical edge and were in fact at a tactical edge. The U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico were decimated and flooded in 2018. Again, when you're supporting things for the 54 and the United States on the home front, your customers can be as if not more demanding than if you were at the pointy edge of the spear. Keys at the tactical edge are a strong IT infrastructure and initial support plan. We have things out there with copper, fiber, and engineering installation squadrons, as well as combat communication squadrons in the United States Air Force, provide those first initial communications that can last anywhere from 48 hours all the way up to six to nine months. Those units are organic capability units, meaning they are self-sustaining, they, re they required no power. They bring everything with them in the way of power. Tran they provide the transmission links. They provide the circuits. They provide the comsec. 
They provide absolutely everything that you would expect and have on your desktop computer sitting at your office at, say, a Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. These great Americans are on a 72-hour response time and can be anywhere in the world on short notice to provide world-class communications. What does the term organic really mean? It really means being self-sustaining and self-reliant for up to four and a miserable amount of time. When we think about the tactical edge, when we think about the communicators that provide our services, about 94% of all the organic infrastructure capabilities are provided by Air National Guard engineering installation squadrons. That is all the fiber, all the copper that you would have at any location in the world. The Air National Guard and our active duty counterparts at the 85th provide that organic infrastructure, basically the highway, which all the data, all the voice and all the services flow by. Additionally, about 65% of our capability in the combat communications arena comes out of the Air National Guard. That is the United States Air Force provider in addition with the 5th Combat Comm Squadron and our brothers and sisters over in the USAFE and European Theater at the 1st Combat Communications Squadron. Some last thoughts just before we meet the panel. What's really important at the tactical edge is that they may be deployed and positioned at only a dirt landing strip. Things like water, fuel, and a good common ground are critical to being successful at the tactical edge. When you think about things as us this year, and every American household has come to rely on these items, things that make things bearable, especially at the tactical edge, when you're out there in about a four by eight living condition space between you and your next door neighbor, sanitizing wipes, toilet paper, water, all common mindset items for unit and members that are at the tactical edge. Protective, protective equipment is paramount and items like parachute cord, nylon rope, shower curtains, batteries, coffee, having a grill with your package, a football and a Frisbee, as well as maybe a, a set of cornhole boy, boards can make all the difference in the world when you're out in the middle of nowhere for months on end. Velcro, Velcro duct tape and tie wraps, shower curtain rings, those are all other things that you would think about. Most importantly, however, at the tactical edge, in addition to all the IT and all the communications that we're going to talk about, is having strong emotional, solid relationship skills, having some grit and some patience with positive attitude. Those are as critical to success at the tactical edge and for not only our warfighters, but our customers as anything else in the world. I'll say you this. As a member of the United States Air Force for 36 years, don't ever worry about our millennials. They won't let you down. And a good logistics planner, a power production and air conditioning person, and a good vehicle mechanic will make sure that we all stay focused, safety oriented, and relevant so that we can do the job that we need to do in an organic environment. So with that, what I would like to do next is have our panels do a self-introduction, and I would like to start with Colonel James Coughlin of the 5th Combat Comm Group. Jim, over to you. Thanks, Colonel Rupert. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to everyone today, and I really appreciate the Dayton Wright AFSEA chapter for uh, enabling this uh, IT summit. So my name is Jim Coughlin. I currently uh, serve as the Command Combat, which is our last remaining active duty combat comm group. Um, we are comprised of um, two combat comm mission squadrons, which is one or one half of the active duty combat comm mission squadrons. And we have one combat comm support squadron, which is the only total force combat comm support squadron in the United States Air Force. I've been in the Air Force for just over 20 years. I've been a communicator for uh, 19 years of that time. I've served from the squadron all the way up to the combatant command level and headquarters Air Force level. Uh, as a squadron commander, I served as a member of the 85th Engineering Installation Squadron, which as Colonel Rupert alluded to, is our last remaining active duty EI squadron. And now I just joined the team here at the 5th um, on 1 July, which was our 64th birthday of our organization. My previous assignment to this, I served as the 
Air Force's Central Command, Air Force's Central Director of Communications and Headquarters Chief of Staff. So there I served as um, the purveyor and, and senior cyberspace um, enabler for the command under U.S. CENTCOM for all air power in the U.S. CENTCOM AOR. Uh, that's, a, that's a brief introduction to me. I'll turn it back over to Colonel Ruper. All right. Next, uh, technology always has its challenges, and today we've hit one of those challenges. So next, via phone this morning, we're going to have Colonel Francisco Dominguez of the 251st Cyberspace Engineering Installation Group uh, go ahead and give a self-intro on himself this morning. Frank, over to you. Thank you, Colonel Rupert. Good morning. Dayton Wright, I see a chapter. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to come and uh, spend some time with you this morning. Uh, as uh, Rupi said, I'm Colonel Frank Dominguez. I'm the commander of the 251st Cyberspace Engineering Installation Group right down the street from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at the Springfield Backley Municipal Airport. And um, I spent my entire adult life in the Air Force uniform, um, starting with an enlistment right uh, with the regular Air Force right out of high school and then transitioning to the Air National Guard to uh, finish my education uh, down in Texas. Um, afterwards, I was commissioned and spent my entire career working the infrastructure mission with ENI. Uh, which is uh, not uh, totally unique. Um, most guardsmen uh, do that very deep in our missions. Uh, but I've also spent a uh, half, half my life as a professional in the civilian high tech sector as well with uh, Compact Computers and Hewlett Packard doing about 17 years and a mix of roles that include services engineering, uh, systems engineering, internet operations, strategic marketing, uh, worldwide program management. But at some point, you know, I did feel the call to serve my country full time. And so I've been doing that for about the last decade. Um, as a drill, drill status guardsman, however, my experiences include uh, three separate deployments uh, after 9-11 in 2002, helping to build the team that will that built the first CAOC at IUD. Uh, in 2005, leading the infrastructure projects across Iraq, um, and in 2012, leading the build-out and transition of the surge infrastructure in Afghanistan. Um, like I said, my current role, I'm the commander of the 251st Cyberspace CNI Group with uh, eight Alliance squadrons, one Combat Com, and seven Air National Guard ENI squadrons in Utah, Minnesota, Oklahoma, Texas, and Louisiana, and here in Ohio. Over. Okay, fantastic. Next, I would like to introduce one of the most wicked smart people I've ever met in my life, and I've had the opportunity to work with him a little bit over at United States Transportation Command. I would like to introduce Colonel Ivan Hurwitz. Ivan, to you. Hey, Colonel Roper, thank you for the, uh, the, the kind words there. Um, I'm Ivan Hurwitz, as you mentioned. Um, thanks first to the Dayton Wright FCA chapter. Um, what, a, what a great uh, effort putting this together. Um, these, are, these are no small feats, I understand that, uh, made all the more uh, complex and, um, you know, with the, the current environment. So really thank you for putting together a great event. I appreciate that. Um, I'm currently the uh, commander of the 88th Communications Group on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, providing IT service and airfield support uh, to the various uh, mission partners on the installation. Um, I've had the opportunity to serve at base level multiple times uh, at the MAGCOM level, headquarters Air Force joint, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, spent some time even with you at uh, U.S. Transportation Command. Um, most notably, uh, relative to our panel today, some of those times at uh, Transportation Command doing uh, defensive cyber ops and DODEN operations, uh, as well as I spent a year as a, a communications squadron commander in the AOR, uh, providing support as we drew down our, our activities in Iraq. Uh, so looking forward to the panel today. I'm a career communicator. Um, turned uh, cyber operations officer as we made that transition in the Air Force. So looking forward to today's discussion. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Ivan. But certainly not least, I would like to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Samantha Duccio. Samantha is very unique in the fact that she is the commander of the 269th Combat Communications Squadron, the oldest combat communication squadron in the United States Air Force, by the way. 
and also the chief technology officer over at NASIC. So tr Samantha is a traditional drill status guardsman. And Samantha, I'll kick it over to you. Great. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And again, I echo everyone else's comments. Um, uh, the Dayton Wright chapter, um, AFSIA chapter, thank you for putting this on. I know it's a challenge in the COVID times. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's uh, we're getting used to virtualization here and virtualizing our meetings, but it still, um, it still takes a lot of coordination um, and sometimes outages as uh, Colonel Dominguez is dealing with right now. Um, so I am the 269th Combat Com Commander. Um, we're a little different than active duty just in the sense that we um, have that DOM Ops mission as well. And we have a suite of equipment that we currently have that we support um, those sort those missions for um, hurricane relief. So recent, um, as recent as Hurricane Maria, um, we went to the Virgin Islands to Puerto Rico to support those things, um, as well as just brought a team back, um, reopening PSAB, um, actually with the Fifth Combat Com, um, to bring that back online. Um, so those are things that um, that this squadron does, and that's where we focus our energy at, uh, and we're hoping as uh, we watch technology come together that um, that we um, bring the active duty equipment and the, um, I'll call it guard equipment together as a single complement. I think I would love to see that in the future. It'll make everybody's lives a lot easier and a little easier on the taxpayer as well. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I did not start in the guard. I had originally Planned to go active duty, changed my mind at the last minute, um, went to college, uh, got a job at John Deere, did database administration, architecture. Um, but the calling, I had always had this calling since I was a child. So um, went into the guard um, and was commissioned and started in St. Louis in Combat Com. And I've kind of stayed there um, my whole time. I transitioned to Ohio. My husband is here. Um, and so that's how I made it my way to Ohio from. Illinois, St. Louis, and then over to Ohio, um, and deployed to uh, Kuwait right as we um, entered into Iraq. So that was an experience we hopefully, um, uh, we'll talk through a little bit, some of the challenges, but opportunities, things that we learned as we went in and had those experiences. Also um, did a really quick um, jaunt to, um, to Bahrain, sorry, I couldn't remember the name. And then I've done support to Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane um, Maria, obviously, as, as stated. So I think that about wraps up my background. I'm obviously hard IT, always um, done uh, architecture inside of uh, NASIC. I worked OPIR as their chief architect, the overhead um, persistent radar. Um, and then now I'm the CTO for NASIC. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Colonel Whitaker. All right. Thank you, Samantha. I had the opportunity to deploy with Samantha back in 2002 and 2003 when we were at Al Jabra Air Base. And we went from a base construct of about 1,200 people and pretty much an Air Force uh, centric organization. And we exploded to about 8,500 people in about uh, 30 days, uh, full, fully joint. Uh, Marines were our largest customer. And uh, we were there with the Brits, the Aussies, and all those kind of great folks. So, uh, Samantha was amazing in our network control center, and uh, I think the reason we were as successful as we were is because of the great people like Samantha Duccio that made things happen. All right, so let's get to the panel and to the questions. So the first question I would like to direct towards Colonel Coughlin. Colonel, what are the opportunities for the United States Air Force and to other DOD services to leverage the tactical cloud to process data on the edge? Yeah, thanks, sir. So quite honestly, um, I, I have this phrase, I say, I'm, I'm tired of delivering yesterday's technology tomorrow, and I want to deliver tomorrow's technology today. And that's what that's what tactical cloud gives us at the edge. So we need the ability to process copious amounts of data, um, as the other panelists have discussed, um, at that leading edge in the combat environment. We're, we're going to fight away games. We don't want to fight home games. So we're going to be in someone else's backyard. We need the ability to shoot, move, and communicate and move large amounts of information to decision makers at the speed and need. Uh, and that, inclu that includes leveraging uh, advancing technologies such as cloud, but it also requires us to have resiliency baked into that and the ability under 
Air Force construct of ACE, Agile Combat Employment, to be able to move around the battlefield, which is not just a physical movement, it's also a command and control mechanism and methodology. And so all that requires the ability to have access to data from multiple points and for that data to be as near real time as possible. Um, that as a communicator allows me to share loads some of the defense of, of that um, security effect is to to spread the risk to force risk to the data across the battle. So what what we what we need entities to do is to bring that capability to the battlefield, but it also has to be able to be managed by airmen in that environment and um, and not re require exquisite expertise at the tactical edge because I don't have the bandwidth in airmen or the time to get those airmen up to speed. And so, and I can't, as I saw in my last assignment, I can't always rely on having contractors forward in the battle space because as we saw, whether pandemically informed or or nation state informed, there are rule sets that apply to contractors in a combat zone that are different and decision calculus that is different than someone that is in uniform. So hopefully that gets to the meat of it, sir. Over to you. All right. So Colonel Herwick, uh, being as you helped bring the cloud into United States Transportation Command for the first time, is there anything you would have, uh, say one minute or less that you would add into Colonel Coughlin's uh, response? Yeah, so as you mentioned, spent some time doing uh, uh, cloud transformation or, or at uh, US Transcom. And one of the things that excites me the most, um, on top of the fact that it is, it is more today's technology and the ability uh, to put more compute and more storage capacity at the edge, is the idea that it's a scalable presence. So you can have the same infrastructure in the field uh, that you have available to you um, at home station when you may perhaps have a more resilient, more robust uh, communication infrastructure and attachment to those commercial cloud environments. Uh, so really an opportunity to uh, maybe utilize at a low, smaller scale, um, but uh, closer proximity at some of these uh, geographic um, locations that might be disadvantaged uh, from a connectivity perspective, uh, but when able, uh, be able to reach back into that larger uh, uh, ecosystem uh, to do more intensive, larger uh, efforts uh, with the added bonus of it being a known infrastructure that's going to be on the, on the ground ahead. So units aren't in, uh, potentially uh, needing to bring their own infrastructure because they can't count on exactly what is going to be present uh, when they roll forward. Ivan, those are great points. Thank you very much. Uh, question number two, I'm going to wrap this question to Colonel Dominguez, please. What are some of the challenges, particularly regarding security at the tactical edge? Over to you, Frank. Okay, Rupi, thank you. Um, well, you know, I mentioned that I've deployed a couple of times down range to a couple of our theaters of operation. And I think when I uh, when I think of the tactical edge, I think of those environments. I don't really think about what we, um, you know, hear in our exercise scenarios, which are important to develop our TTPs. But what I think about are these very chaotic uh, multi-service, multinational environments where the number of endpoints, uh, the variety of systems, the uh, mix of sources uh, for equipment, um, all of that, you know, is intermingled, it's interacting with each other. It's a very dynamic uh, environment where missions start and stop at your location, mm -hmm. especially with the given you know construct that we're developing for the next generation of our of our conflict. Uh, you know, adds our combat employment and adaptive operations in a contested environment. All of that is just going to make it even more so. Right? We would operate in scenarios that. Um, are going to have multiple layers of risks, multiple layers of unknowns. And um, some of that is friendly fire on our cyber and uh, spectrum operations, which we also have to consider as part of our pace uh, and growing uh, requirements in information warfare. So, you know, how do you, how do you calculate the, the activities, uh, the threat vectors that are being brought upon that might include friendly fire by you know, air-based defense forces, force protection forces. You know, how do you deal with disruptions that were really built into the base layouts? Right? Disruptive mission systems that are too closely uh, placed together or 
poorly designed layouts uh, at tactical locations. Some of those you have no control over as a, as a communicator. You respond to the need and you deal with the environment that um, you find yourself in. You know, you may come late to it, you may be early to it, but it always change on you. So um, how do we vet those, those, uh, those new environments, you know, especially when you're starting to add equipment in a very, you know, uh, rapid way. If you look at what we did in Iraq uh, in the early knots, we had uh, new threats that were being identified and new technologies that were being rolled out uh, very quickly to deal with that. I don't know if anyone remembers that we used to have, you had the RF jammers, like the Duke counter RF, uh, IED defensive pieces, uh, the RF jammers on the, uh, you know, the Star V and the Thor and some others that were uh, built for convoy jamming, microwave based item, you know, defense uh, systems as well. And all that contributes to the noise that our, our mission uh, defense teams or cyber protection teams will be uh, working through. It won't just be the, the traditional threats and think about, you know, uh, with with uh, phishing and, and, and spoofing and denial of service and, you know, intrusion to our endpoints, different multiple endpoints. It's all of the other. How do you, how do you prioritize the mission uh, needs in that type of environment? All right. The questions that I would have, you know, how do you tabletop for that environment? And who manages that cyber spectrum incident response, right? How do you deal with uh, integration governance? Uh, when Kama has always been a challenge, you know, how will it work in the shoot and move calm environment that uh, Colonel Coffin talked about? But, you know, when you start to look at the, the types of incidents that you have, um, you know, there are some things that we can do. In the infrastructure, we look at that as a as the first layer of protection to our to our uh, cyberspace domain and our and our spectrum systems, including you know properly installed and terminated, properly routed and grounded, and, uh, cyberspace infrastructure properly tested. Right, but the testing is yet another challenge. Uh, at Hewlett Packard, we did a lot of integration testing uh, and and regression testing of our systems. To make sure that they operate well together, that doesn't happen in a, uh, in a in a wartime environment. That's rolling out technology, and rolling out endpoints, and rolling out you know a mix of of joint and coalition uh, forces all doing it together. So it's uh, you know how do we do that whole um, you know prep and identification, containment, um, eradication. In recovery, how do we learn those lessons if we haven't even been in that environment uh, with this focus? So there are some things that I would say, you know, we would map out our vectors for containing known incidents, generating actors, right? So all those mission systems that interrupt uh, and, and jam our shells, we can, we can be very deliberate how we deal with them. We could eliminate noise from the infrastructure or learn to operate in a very noise rich environment, right? With very you know high signal to noise ratios. Uh, you know, you're talking about spectrum, talking about uh, analog communications and our pace plans. Um, you know, maybe artificial intelligence comes into play where they, you know, artificial intelligence can help us um, filter out the, the friendly uh, interference and identify those things that are very unique and could potentially be a risk that's uh, from a, a threat uh, actor. And uh, you know, how do you train your your mission defense and your incident response managers to to operate in that, that environment? So those are the questions that I have. You know, that's a really that's a very complete answer. And uh, the AI thought process there for industry is something that I think is is very interesting, Frank, that you bring up. Yeah. Um, Venus, that was such a good answer. I think what we'll do is we'll go to question three and we'll, we'll direct this question to Colonel Herwick, please. What is the role and importance of the U.S. government checking and ensuring vendor credentials while still attempting to provide rapid acquisition for tactical edge customer providers? And how do we keep that process agile? That, if we can get a great answer to that, will be the $64 million question today, or Ivan. 
Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Wade. So over the next uh, three hours, I'll be outlining a, a multi-point plan <laughs> of the. Uh, but uh, you know, in all seriousness, um, I, I think what you're seeing is us move to exactly what you were hinting at. Um, and how do we bake those credentialing and certification processes? Uh, into our relationship with those vendors and into the acquisition process itself, as opposed to it being a, a thing that we bake on at the end, right? So we tack it on at the end and we want to make sure that the thing that was produced uh, is secure and meets all the requirements. So how do we, how do, we do that in the, in the process itself? Uh, because in that process of just tacking it on the end, we all know this, it, we are uh, we are hurting the, uh, some of the most innovative uh, activities coming from some of the, uh, the smallest uh, vendors, right? Some of those uh, niche vendors, if you will, uh, that uh, stand, up at, uh, stand up for a particular use case, but just don't have the, the depth yet uh, to withstand uh, some of the legacy acquisition processes. So how do we bake that in so they understand uh, what they're trying to get into if they want to get into that space? Uh, so you're seeing things like third-party uh, validation, uh, CMMC, all of these processes that raise the assurance level uh, as we go along. And, and we as the federal government need to become a little more comfortable with managing risk. Uh, so in many cases, we use things like the risk management framework as a more robust checklist uh, to ensure that things are you know, meeting all the squares that, uh, uh, that we decide that they should, be, uh, that they, they should fill. We need to empower ourselves uh, to make appropriate risk decisions uh, that given a current, uh, current situation, uh, need, operational need, uh, we can tailor that risk uh, tolerance uh, to something that uh, some of these other inline uh, certification processes can help uh, address. Uh, so really, it's a shift from uh, what are the things that we need to check, right? And so, or about the thing that is produced at the end, what are the things we can do about the process that produced uh, that thing um, that can raise our assurance level to a, to a level that we're comfortable uh, putting that uh, capability um, into use in a particular situation. So I, I, that would be my answer to, um, uh, to that question. Yeah, Ivan, that's a very, very solid answer. Um, a lot of good thoughts in that. So uh, I think what we will do is we'll head on to question four. And uh, thank you. Thank you again for that. That was uh, some good thoughts. Uh, for Lieutenant Colonel Aduccio, what are the challenges associated with patching at the edge and in a deployed austere location? Is it really important or does mission sometimes dictate network availability over compliance. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, so I guess I look at it as two primary challenges related to patch management today, um, hoping to take advantage of some of the tactical cloud, I think will, will help uh, minimize some of these problems potentially. But um, when we go to a forward location, we have generally have smaller pipes coming in. Um, we layer them, but they all tend to be layers of smaller um, bandwidth, right? So when we're pulling patches down, we're going to compete for that bandwidth with mission operations. So one, making sure that when we do that, we're not impacting um, the current mission happening. And then the other side of that is that actually implementing those patches um, and, and understanding the impact of that implementation. Um, going to deployment actually to Kuwait, right? Right before we're going into Iraq, we had um, a ton of patches coming down. Um, and we would every day go to the AOC and I would talk to the AOC chief and I would say, um, these are the patches that we have. Um, it should take roughly this period of time, right? We would rack and stack it on um, the severity, what systems they were gonna impact. Um, some of those patches are um, just um, good to have, I guess, um, make life easier, right? Maybe my button isn't in the right place, kind of a fix. Um, those generally don't get looked at first. So we would, I would go to the AOC and I would um, talk to them about what time frame, what time frame they were looking at when we were actually in the process of moving forward. We were following blue forces, so understanding that there was a imminence of what is happening on the ground, and then what we need to to try to to take care of, 
and what the severity was and what the impact was every single time. And then the, the effect of that would be if the patch was bad, which did happen, we had this strange thing on base where we had brownouts in different sectors of the base. Um, and we had to roll some patches back. That was then the same conversation of that we're going to hit these places first and coordinating that with the mission. So going back to, is it more important? Compliance is a requirement and it's going to help us all. Um, balancing that with the mission is a requirement anywhere you go. So it's so at the edge, um, we tend to move a little faster. The other challenge is um, we have some inconsistent baselines. So depending on where you go, if you go to a base that's been there for a while and we haven't pulled out some of the older tactical comm layers um, and we've put fixed comm on top of them, that causes additional challenges to both patching um, as well as even removal of that equipment, which would which which would come later. Um, but then we get a little unique, right? So when you're in a tactical environment and you have to make the mission go, sometimes we have some unique fixes. And then after you get through one or two rotations, the knowledge that that fix is there is not known. So then you kind of run into those traps sometimes and you have to undo those. Um, but the biggest challenge for the commander is understanding um, what the risk is to the mission, whether it is to the actual um, cyber device or whether it is to the, to the operational mission, um, right? So the, the primary question in the, in, the, um, in the Air Operations Center is, is the air tasking order going to go? Can I receive it? Can I get it? Can I brief my pilots before they go out? Can we make sure that individuals that are going to go, that are going to go, um, even if we're going to pick somebody up, can we get them the intel that they need in order to, to complete that mission. And so um, that those are the those are the, the the challenges with patching at the edge are not a, a ton different than when we're in at home, but um, the impact of the mission tends to move a lot faster and we we tend to run into trip wires as we go along. So I'm back That's to you, fantastic. Colonel Ripper. That's fantastic. I mean I would I would submit that authorized service interruptions across the board whether it be patching or any other kind of activity maintenance whatever it might be really make big decision points that are magnified at the tactical edge because you are definitely impacting flying mission uh, if you make bad choices so uh, i think that's a fantastic answer samantha so thank you um, next question i would like to direct uh, back to colonel coglin this time uh, and I think he's in a very unique uh, position to make a great answer to this. Uh, how does PACE, primary alternate communications, come into play at the tactical edge? The pros and cons in relation to security versus mission sustainment. What is the role of HF, TROPO, the whole nine yards? So let's talk PACE, Jim, because I think that's a key factor to the tactical edge. Yeah, and, and sir, you're on target and, you know, Colonel Duccio kind of led into it. So PACE is the lifeblood of a tactical communicator because our responsibility is to make sure that those ones and zeros that enable command and control, enable missions, enable whatever that is you're tasked to, to uh, provide transport for, secure, um, happens. And so what you have to do is you have to go in at the tactical edge and you have to determine what those risk to force, risk to mission decisions are. Is it a patch that I'm going to push or am I going to, am I going to delay it? And I will tell you uh, in my previous role, there were things that I put off from DISA on the regular because of combat operations. And we accepted the risk because the risk against the mission uh, did not necessitate the impact of bandwidth, the impact to operations necessary to pull down that patch or to implement that ASI. And so there was a lot, it was a very open communication discussion between me and not only the um, combatant command J6, but also my air component commander on certain decisions that we would make. And there were things I would speed up. There were things I would, I would uh, slow down, but as articulated by uh, my colleagues on this panel um, in a tactical environment, it's not uh, a baked in every location is the same because you have different missions. You have different uh, longevity concerns, you have different equipment. As said, you can have some EI well-engineered stuff, and then you can have some tactical stuff. And so as we talk about pace, it's it has to start at our very junior levels when we start training. Um, I went to an event about a year ago, uh, and it had a bunch of senior communicators in the room, and the senior leader said, how many know what pace stands for? 
And I was a little bit disheartened by the percentage of officers in the room that didn't even know what PACE stood for or an expeditionary community. That is like the first word we learn as a student um, be so critical to us. And so um, we bake that in here in the organizations I've been in. Um, General Ray, who was the CENTCOM J6, he built this brief for our combatant commander that said, hey, sir, across our entire CENTCOM AOR, here's what our bandwidth looks like. Here's what we currently move. And then as we start to peel that onion back, it was literally called the onion brief. As we start to peel that onion back, we're going to make these trade-offs. Maybe I'm not going to push this data anymore. I'm not going to enable these access points anymore so that the information can get through um, and so so that he can have correct, well-informed, timely decisions. And I will tell you over the last year, from the pandemic to a nation state hitting one of our, our locations to violent extremist organizations, it was vitally important that our comms did not go down. We One of our leaders once said that uh, comm is like oxygen. You don't realize how important it is to everything you do during the day until you don't have it. Um, and that, that was kind of the approach it. And so we have, we approached every brief, every ASI, every action we took from our net, our network operations center down to our expeditionary communication squadrons, down to the individual comp flyaway kits with pace in mind. And then to your, to your latter points, that's where HF, which is something we've, we hadn't really focused on and is now coming back up. Tropo, all those types of things come, come into play because I can't just go out thinking I only have one means in which to transport the vital information I need, uh, data information, which becomes knowledge and understanding to execute combat operations. So to me, if PACE isn't the first word we're teaching communicators and our contracting organizations that we work with, then we need, we're doing ourselves a disservice and we need to start that over. Amen. I, I would definitely say that uh, cyberspace is dependent upon space, but if space goes south on us, we definitely have to have other methods to uh, transport data and information around the theater. So uh, great answer. Uh, next question I would like to direct towards Colonel Dominguez. Uh, Colonel Dominguez, what do you think the role that a reserve component is and what special skills or talents do those members bring that you may not just get from a uh, active duty unit when you're in the deployed environment at the tactical edge? Yeah, thanks, Rubia. That's a great question. Um, I think today's Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve is a completely different organization than that prior to 9-11. Obviously, we've changed quite differently uh, across our services, but uh, a significant portion of our uh, ARC components are made up of former regular Air Force members already. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they come in, they're the same airmen that you have in your units today on the regular Air Force. Um, but if you look at the work that we do, and when we get activated, we go down range. Um, I would say the most effective work that that, um, that gets done is done on the ground and not back at, uh, you know, the rear with all the monitoring uh, and all the different uh, location, uh, you know, different support locations that we have away from the front lines, away from the tactical edge. It's done there on site uh, by airmen walking around, monitoring spectrum, monitoring uh, the cyber uh, landscape, uh, and then mitigating in real time. So that's, you know, the success of our Air Force. You know, we, we, we developed as leaders to, to know that to enable success, um, you know, we have to have a diverse mission force. And that is what our art component brings to the fight. It's a very diverse mission force uh, in all aspects. We bring a different set of cultural and technical capital because we are in uh, you know, different lives day to day. And uh, we have experiences that um, you know, add that richness that we need at the tactical edge. We've got first responders. We've got, you know, um, defense contractors, we've got, uh, you know, other public servants, uh, people that do risk analysis real time on, on the outside, do cyber program management uh, that need uh, at a very high level. And uh, they, they put their uniform on, they go to the tactical edge, and they bring that different uh, mission and life experience to bear. And, um, you know, that's that's where we get, you know, tremendous amount of goodness that comes out of it. Deep experiences within our particular missions also come into play, right? I mentioned how I've been in cyber infrastructure my entire uh, commissioned life here when I joined the Air National Guard. 
And that is true for a great many of our drill status guardsmen. Our great many of our our members have very long times in their in their um, in their mission roles, and they bring very deep understanding of of a variety of environments that uh, help us and help the warfighter address the risk at the tactical edge in a much much richer way. So that's fantastic. Uh, all right, so we've got about four minutes to get through the last two questions. So I don't want to rush everybody, but we're going to get there and get it done. So, Colonel Hurwitz, what is the role of 5G wireless at the tactical edge? And is it NSA, National Security Agency Encryption, always the required standard? Are there times when portable devices that are commercial are secure enough? Yeah, Colonel Roper, I appreciate the question. Um, and uh, the, the answer is yes, there are times that uh, commercial products are, are, are secure enough. Uh, there are times that no security is secure enough. Uh, and that time is when the, the commander in the field says that it is. Uh, you heard uh, uh, times here in the conversation already where it was more important to, to communicate than it was to have security, right? And the only person that can make that, that, that calculus, that risk calculus, is that fielded commander. Um, so backing backing away from that is uh, NSA absolutely critical, right? They're they're the subject matter experts when it comes to uh, you know data and uh, communication security for us in the uh, in the DoD. Um, but even they leverage commercial technologies, right? So we we uh, assess that certain commercial solutions are more than sufficient to protect even classified information. Um, and then backing that into a, a 5G conversation, that becomes an art of the possible conversation. And this is where uh, we can't just deploy 5G. We have to understand 5G. We have to understand the architecture and the risks that it may pose uh, so we can have those conversations in the, uh, in the field and understand where those risk trade-offs are. Uh, we can't just have a, a magic box that consumes service off of you know, some uh, commercial satellite or a, uh, a tactical uh, set that we bring with us. We need to understand uh, enough to be able to uh, inject the right things into that risk calculus at, at an operational level. Fantastic answer, Ivan. Last question, Samantha. Um, you know, being as you've been out at the tactical edge and been on the, uh, the edge of the world on numerous occasions, do you think that the equipment sustainability and contractor logistics support uh, methodology that we're using today, do you think that we are doing it well and are you getting the right kind of support for the warfighter? Should we have regional support, uh, almost like depots out there to help support us with the tactical edge IT equipment? Yeah. So um, when we the, just to, to lay lay the framework, so when we go out the door today, we tend to go out what we call heavy, right? So we take extra equipment with us. We take out the pieces, um, the components we tend to have the most that maybe are the most fragile, depending on the environment. Like, I mean, honestly, the number of fiber ends and either ends we take is ridiculous. But we never know what we're getting into, which is why we tend to take more with us because we sometimes actually often go out the door and not actually even know where we're going to land at when we get there. There's an assumption about what's there. Um, so that's generally how we handle it today. And I, and I will tell you from, you know, fielding of equipment to tactical comms, they've, the, the industry's done great as far as, you know, I want to be able to drop this transit case by five feet and I don't want anything in that box to move. That's hard to do when we also are asking, we need to be able to replace cards, physical cards in those boxes so that it's not, so it's not a whole box replacement, it's a component replacement. Um, as far as staging, I'm gonna try and go fast because I know we're short. Um, but as far as staging forward, we've talked about it a little bit. We've talked about, um, do we put spares at the CAOC? Um, do we put spares at the PMO? Do we pr provide spare kits that go to each of the units? Um, that's a hard question because that's a financial question primarily, right? Um, I think, and, and I think we've talked about that a little bit with Tactical Cloud, is that as we start to look forward to where we want to be in the future as far as technology goes, we're going to get closer to 
where we don't need to have so many spares at the edge. Let's utilize tactical cloud for what we can get from it. Let's let it do that routing for us. Um, let's take advantage of those things that it can provide as opposed to always feeling like we need to um, create our own at the edge, um, which actually we talk about some of the patching concerns, some of the, it, we, it, it tends to, uh, they, they build on top of themselves over time. Um, the other part I feel like we're gonna get to, which will help with a lot of the cyber problems, not cyber problems, but cyber threats that we maybe aren't communicating clearly, is you know the, the air battle management systems and the JADC2 capabilities that want to be able to take this capability from tip to tail, which we wanna say, we wanna know what this thing is doing so we can give it back to analysts, but we want the analysts to be telling the front edge what the threat is and what the threat potentially could be so that we can posture ourselves and respond appropriately. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, but yeah, I think that the industry is doing a good job helping us get there. Um, but I think technology is going to be the thing that, that makes that next step for us. That's fantastic. So I'd just like to really thank the panel today. I can't think of four individuals that I would rather be surrounded with or, uh, on the tactical edge anywhere in the world, you know, at the end of the day in the air force, our technical expertise is with our airmen and having fielded capabilities that make it easy to produce fantastic results in the way of IT and services is what it's all about. And that's where industry can make such a huge difference for us. Um, training techniques and practices are key to success on the edge as are things like batteries and Velcro. So with that, we're gonna wrap it up and just say thanks to the panel and thanks for letting us host this for you guys today. Back over to the main control center. There is no other place on the planet that honors aviation history more than the National Museum of the United States Air Force, located right here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It is the oldest and largest military aviation museum in the world. The museum sits on more than 19 acres of indoor exhibit space and features more than 350 aerospace vehicles and missiles. Make sure you add this site to your next on-site trip to Dayton. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. I hope you enjoy this next panel discussion. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Sharwoff from Sable Systems. I'm a managing principal for our practice that does digital engineering, uh, Internet of Things, and, uh, and several elements within the Industry 4.0. Our panel this morning is going to cover a, a variety of topics related to industrial control systems and uh, utilities and how to enable them at the edge, uh, protect them securely, and how to in, induct new technologies and architecture paradigms into uh, the solutions. What's fascinating about this environment, and I've always loved uh, this piece of, uh, of our industry, um, you know, it's been relatively static uh, for several decades in terms of how you implemented industrial control systems and, and powered utilities. But there's, with all these fascinating new technologies, there are so many opportunities to not only better utilize the technology that's in place, but also generate more value for the organization. Um, with that in mind, we've actually set, assembled a diverse panel of uh, multiple perspectives uh, from both industry, large business, small business, as well as government. And I will have each one of my panel members introduce themselves briefly, starting with uh, Alexander Avid. with the Air Force Research Lab Information Directorate in Rome, New York. I have more of a tech advisor type role, and we've got a number of programs in our branch dealing with critical infrastructure systems and targeting. So that's just a, a brief introduction, but we're, we're working with a number of government agencies and other Air Force bases looking at rolling out, you know, critical infrastructure systems, looking at how they can better apply updates, how we can, you know, better quantify what, what infrastructure we have on our bases, what the cyber threats are, what the um, attack vectors are, and how we 
do the matchmaking for the people on the bases, the, the engineers that need to maintain those systems safely, that need to maintain and patch them. And then that dichotomy between needing to patch systems and change working systems and, you know, versus not wanting to touch them and understanding what the cyber threat footprint is. Thanks, Alex. Jordan, Garrett, would you like to introduce yourself? Hopefully we're going to switch over to Jordan. My name is Jordan Garrett. Uh, and forgive me, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties, but I'll attempt to give my introduction. Dell Technologies uh, lead for digital twin edge solutions for our Dell public business, working with our partner ecosystem uh, to build solutions so people can adopt the digital twin technologies, and begin to push capabilities further out to the edge, um, specifically in the sense of the public sector to help the warfighter uh, and those who sustain warfighters be able to deliver uh, new capabilities, better, faster, cheaper, more efficiently uh, for better outcomes to the in individual. Mr. Todd Ed Edmonds. Hey, great to be here. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Todd Edmonds with Dell Technologies. I'm the director of industrial IoT and edge strategy, as well as developing our uh, strategy and solutions for digital twin. I work a lot with uh, Jordan Garrett. Um, I've been doing this for quite a long time working. Um, I've been with Cisco. I've been with Rockwell Automation, Alan Bradley. I've done done it from an integrator point of view. So I have a, a really good perspective on, on how we deploy the next generation of uh, smart manufacturing and industrial IoT applications, as well as, as what we're doing with Digital Twin. Anusha. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I'm Anusha Iyer. I'm with uh, Korsha. I'm the CTO and co-founder, and it's a cybersecurity startup in the um, authentication space. What we've done is come up with a way to do multi-factor authentication for machines, so machines at the edge, IoT, um, you know, industrial control systems, microservices. Uh, my background is um, heavily on the, the cyber side, been in and around the government space, including the Naval Research Lab and managing various DARPA programs in areas of cyber mission planning, security, privacy, and so forth. And I'm um, excited to be here today. Thanks. Michael. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Yukis. I am the Government Engagement Manager for MXD, home to the Department of Defense Digital Manufacturing Institute and National Center for Cybersecurity and Manufacturing. Uh, we're, we're actually home to the first 5G testbed that's affiliated with DOD outside of a DOD uh, installation. So we're actually very proud of that. And we're, we're working with a number of partners to kind of leverage that for the benefit of the par department, especially as it relates to some of our government partners, whether it's DLA, you know, the arsenals and shipyards and kind of all the service labs. Our, our role is to accelerate the adoption of digital technology on the factory floor, not just for small manufacturers, but also for those places like Rock Island Arsenal, where you find a 125 year old building and uh, manufacturing, you know, dating back to forever, right? Uh, in a former life, I spent 16 years in the Air Force as an Arabic linguist and intelligence analyst at NSA, and uh, it was actually kind of cool to see the video of the, uh, the Air Force uh, Museum because I've, I've been there, and it's a pretty neat place. So I'm happy to be here. And with that, we'll uh, step into our first series of questions. The first question will be for uh, Todd. Uh, what types of design approaches are you seeing for industrial console control systems and IoT, uh, given their evolution of the technologies and the changing of paradigms? Yeah, great, great question. I'm sure it's no surprise. A, a, a lot of the conversation in, in these last couple of days, I've been uh, focused around edge computing and, and really that is, it's really hot, but it really answers and helps a lot of the challenges that we've seen in, 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 in industrial controlled systems and industrial IoT. The industrial control systems themselves sometimes are getting a little bit virtualized, but mostly they're staying the typical type of control systems, hardened devices, hardened control systems. But what really is changing is that approach to industrial IoT and building a data layer over the top of those control systems, let them do what they need to do, get that data out of them. And, and that's really you know that what we're talking about, distributed edge computing. For Dell Technologies, it's really helpful when we talk to our customers to divide it into two things. And an industrial edge where you have 
uh, hardened edge compute devices that can go out in the field, that can go on the shop floor, that can go in vehicles and, and aircraft and, and, you know, collect that sensor data and do the transformation of that data, where it's coming from, where it lives, and then building on top of that an enterprise edge infrastructure using modern IT grade, enterprise grade infrastructure over the top of it. It's you know it's no surprise that the 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 that the data right now is 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 residing mostly in those core data centers. You know, seventy percent of the data is typically inside the core. But Gartner estimates in three to four years, seventy five percent of that data is going to be coming from and being acted on at the edge. And so, what's really driving that then is those next generation of applications for the industrial IoT really to make much be much more efficient and, 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 and get more out of the assets you already have. Applications like just simple data aggregation and transformation, it, it doesn't make sense in most cases to send all that data to the cloud. You need to do something with it locally and act on it quickly. Um, and, and when you do go to the cloud, you want real quality data. So you use some, you know, that, some of that enterprise edge compute power to, to really transform that data. But then we can start talking about the next generation of applications, things like advanced analytics and AI and machine learning, you know, that, that are possibly the models being created up in the cloud, but being applied at the edge and needing that compute power to do that. Add in computer vision for some, you know, industrial inspection or quality control or thermal vision. Even you need to have that you know, that compute power where that's going on. It's not necessarily something that can live in the cloud. And you know, add in containers and microservices so you can move workloads and data anywhere and 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 at right application once. But you need to manage that on the edge. And then we start talking about digital twin and digital thread. Um, near and dear to our heart as well. And even 5G and, and, and the next generation of communications in a plant, outside a plant, and the capabilities that that's gonna enable, but it's still gonna require some on-prem compute. So we're really seeing that focus on distributed edge compute in two ways, the industrial edge, hardened devices, and an enterprise grade edge that's, that's gonna need to aggregate that data. And then the second point is really that compute becomes much more diverse and it becomes much more accelerated. So you're gonna see a lot more of, of newer, you know, not just the GPUs and the FPGAs at the edge to do, you know, the, uh, the analytics processing on, on video, but we're gonna, we're starting to see some, some powerful AI based chips like TensorFlow and Neuromorphic, which really em emulates the neural structure and function of the human brain. And, and we're going to see those start to appear and need to be need to have a home on that enterprise edge out there in the you know in the factory or in the field where that's happening, and that's going to mean some new form factors as well. So so those design approaches to be able to use have hardened devices to host all of those. So that's really what we're seeing in terms of those design approaches. Cool. Thank you, Todd. Next question is for both Jordan and Todd. Uh, given those design approaches, uh, are there Big differences or subtle differences between uh, enabling for smart buildings on equipment, weapon system uh, tracking, or a digital factory. I, I I'll I'll take go that go first if you don't mind, Jordan. Um, I think really the key here um, is what we're seeing. The the architectures really need to be software defined. If you look at a lot of the architectures that have previously been a, a part of these type of uh, implementations, you know, they they follow a, a Purdue model. Well, really, we, you know, you turn around and look, and all of a sudden, the Purdue model is twenty four years old. It it was it was really um, invented back when Windows ninety five was first released. So, we really need to start looking at a different way to do the architectures, to do the connectivity, and software defined compute storage and networking is going to be key we're no longer able to just throw up firewalls everywhere, you know, to be able to just keep data from going anywhere. We've got to have the capability to to seamlessly and easily share that data between that floor system, that shop floor or field system 
and the information systems and the systems that need to, to, to see that as well at that at that level, you know, and not not ignoring this, the security part of it, obviously, that's going to be critical. But with these new software defined architectures and implementations, there's a whole new role and a whole new way of implementing security. Micro segmentation is one. So micro sending micro micro segmenting um, all the way down, dividing that network into distinct security segments all the way down to that individual workload level. Yeah, and from my perspective, uh, you know, looking at it at this whole space is really driving more than ever closer business and IT convergence. So I think from the IT community, as these architectures are developed and then implemented, uh, there needs to be closer coupling and understanding of the expectations the end users are going to have, what they're trying to do with that data, how you unlock all that value that's been sometimes siloed apart across functional organizations, um, particular uh, units or, or groups, and allow that to now be released so that it can be accessed by these uh, digital twin or smart capabilities that are going to be um, enabling more efficient operations of these uh, entities uh, and more value driven for the end users. Thank you. So Todd, you know, building off that, that thread you had on there on, on the uh, business side focus, what do leaders need to think about in terms of their adoption of these technologies and in terms of people process and their technical technology investments are changing in their practices? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, segmenting those uh, the implementations into an industrial edge and an enterprise edge helps kind of bridge that gap between the IT and the OT side. But I think one of the things that, you know, uh, security is definitely something that needs to be f first and foremost. And that really, um, that security is really no longer going to be uh, a bolt on. It needs to be deeply embedded you know, centrally managed uh, security capabilities. A lot of AI work is going on in terms of that next generation of implementing security. And I, I mentioned it earlier, the micro segmentation piece as well. Yep. Um, so if you had to pick two pieces of infrastructure to put in place for IIoT, ICS and utilities for performance, resilience and cybersecurity, what two technologies would you pick? Or elements would you pick must yeah, have the must must have is next generation security just basically mentioned that you know it's not bolt on it's 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 built in through and through designed in from the ground up from the get-go from the very first um and then and then secondly really multiple storage domains and and that's kind of a, a somewhat of a new concept but it, it's really when you look at it it really makes sense in that you've got really three storage domains and you want to make sure that you take take uh, consideration of because you have your traditional storage that we're all used to, you know, spinning disks, flash disks, et cetera. And those are like the traditional, what you see normally in a data center or even at the edge. Um, but then we start to see a couple of different storage domains uh, emerging like a, a, an enterprise integrated storage domain, kind of a hybrid cloud managed and provisioned but you store it one place and it's really available almost anywhere you need it, right? Un under the right circumstances with the, the, the right authority. But, you know, having, having a, a cloud, any cloud multi-blended capability for that inter enterprise integrated storage. And then the third type of storage that's really important is, is to have the high performance storage. So if you're doing um, analytics and provision, you're going to need that kind of storage that's that's very high performance, much more expensive. So you've got to make sure that you have a storage infrastructure that understands the different types of storage and where to store and long term and where to store the short term. But that high performance storage capability is going to be is going to be really, really key. Part of that as well as the hybrid cloud strategy is so that that, you know, if you are going to store it, on-prem, if you are going to have that hybrid storage, you need to have a hybrid cloud strategy so that if you're working with this vendor or this particular device, it needs to have the storage, you know, in the Azure cloud. And this one might need to have it in, in a secure cloud. And this one needs to have an AWS cloud. But make sure you build that into, into whatever 
industrial IoT, digital twin, smart manufacturing initiatives you're having. Thank you. We're going to switch over to uh, Anusha and Michael. So one of the themes that a lot of customers sort of struggle with, and particularly the defense customers, is there is a difference between your third party service providers as well and your organic employees. So what are some of the drivers that provide that remote access to IoT and industrial control system? And then what rules and controls are you seeing placed on third party providers uh, as part of the mission support? I would defer to Anusha on this one specifically because the, the folks in my world, you know, if you go to any of the arsenals or in the organic industrial base on the army or the Navy side, you know, everything's air gap to the umpteenth degree, right? So there is no ability to remote anything. I think the challenge we face is that IT policy and OT policy are usually separate things. And so any changes going forward, you have to figure out a way to integrate that. Otherwise your new newfangled widget's not going to work. <laughs> So I'm going to pick on you a little bit on that, Michael, and not to put you yeah. in a sub spot, but, you know, what are they for going? I by? <laughs> right. <laughs> I know you did. I know. But, you know, given your example of, uh, you know, that ITOT barrier, you know, are those customers seeking solutions? And then it kind of, I think it'll dovetail a little better into Nusha's response. You know, do they, do they see the need, want the need? Or is it they don't have the need and not really trying to drive a substantive change of how the architecture is managed? I think it, it varies. There are examples I can think of, you know, like Rock Island Arsenal, you could, their paint line is entirely manual. There's no reason from their own perspective to digitize that or to, to automate anything and introduce any real digital technology other than a signal saying we're done painting. Um, yeah. So there is a want, though, among manufacturers in the defense industrial base or the organic industrial base on the, on the military side to implement the most up to date technology on the factory floor. The challenge they face, I think, is what they want and what, you know, the infrastructure behind them can support because they're in a lot of old buildings and, and they're dealing with a lot of, you know, when was the last update at Rock Island in like 1995 or something, right? So. So there's a desire to be at the cutting edge on one hand. Uh, on the other, I think the challenge is, you know, again, those policies are not integrated. I think to Todd's point earlier, he briefly mentioned building in security and building in from a design standpoint from moment one. I think that will force DOD to kind of adopt certain standards and to, to progress and accelerate on the digital side a little faster because you can't buy this new machine. You can't get the CNC machine without this built in because right now you, they buy it and it's got some sort of software package and integration with the internet and they just turn that off. So eventually it's going to come to the point where, well, no, the only way this operates is when it's integrated and it's safe and it's protected. If it's sitting there by itself, it's just a $2 million hunk of metal. So I think that there are some avenues going forward for folks on that side. There's a desire to be at the front edge, even on the, you know, on, on the policy side, but, but again, there's so many disparate issues when it comes to IT and OT, when you look at it, that, that it's going to be a real challenge to coordinate all that. You could go to Rock Island Arsenal and you can go to Crane Army Ammunition Activity. They're within Army Material Command, but when you look at where they're at structurally, those are two different IT teams that, that govern all that. And some say, yes, they think it's a great idea. Let's do it. And, and same guy, same position, different base. And they're like, yeah, no, no, thank you. <laughs> so. Yeah. Anusha. Yeah, it, I would. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of piggyback onto that. Certainly, you know, I think the most obvious drivers today for remote access, and maybe this highlights the difference between IT and kind of the traditional what we view as IT roles and kind of OT um, devices and networks and infrastructure that we're supporting is most obvious is patching, applying security, functional updates, um, you know, obviously another is configuration updates. I think the, you know, the burden that ends up falling on IT staff, as, as Michael alluded to, is with OT equipment, with industrial control systems, ends up being quite a variety of devices, software stacks, hardware stacks, that oftentimes it does make sense to have the vendor come in and apply the patch, right? And so, there may be essential drivers for allowing that remote access, but that's not to say that it can't still be intentional, right? And so yeah. 
yeah. you know, what are ways that um, enterprises, organizations can kind of scope and limit this access, understand the impact. Um, certainly things like, you know, policy-based mechanisms of having service providers request access into a network for specific functions um, and ultimately to a device. As Todd was mentioning, the idea of leaning into the micro segmentation of networks all the way even down to the device level and implementing kind of layered access authentication control down to individual network segments and then just you know from policy perspective kind of driving what that access looks like to um, to enable you know some of these these drivers traditionally industrial control systems are uh, you know, remain unpatched because it's difficult to do. But perhaps bringing in those service providers indirectly helps the overall kind of cyber posture. Thank you. Uh, this next question will be for uh, Michael. Uh, can you provide one example of an internet of an industrial Internet of Things implementation that had an unfortunate uh, cyber outcome, and then what key behaviors or decisions contributed to that outcome? You know, I, I told you earlier, I asked a couple of my colleagues for some good stories and everybody, you know, oh, Stuxnet or something like that. You know, it, it's there's a lot of tried and true back and forth. But from my perspective, I think one of my favorite stories is there's a, a small business that we've worked with that uh, is a DOD provider. They, they make uh, and manufacture dry goods, and dry foods, specifically those that I guess would be readily available to eat in a forward location not to be too specific. Um, one of the challenges they faced was when you make those things, they have to be pasteurized. You have to get to a certain temperature to ensure that they can sit from an airman's perspective on a shelf for seven, eight, 200 years, whatever it ends up being before you get to open it up in the middle of a rack. <laughs> and, you know, they, they found that in, in testing their system and integrating their, their network into their production process and the ovens that they specifically use that you could actually spoof the temperature on the oven to indicate that yes it has been pasteurized when in fact it hasn't um, so what would happen is it would just rot on the shelf and that's obviously a problem when you're trying to provide food to a forward location and and ensure that you can do it readily um, so all the proposals that came out of that from solution providers and from folks in the know and, and this is how we're going to fix this the big one was we're going to go straight to a digital twin. We're going to build you a simulated system and we're going to show you exactly where the problems are and we're going to be able to, you know, everything that the, the ideal of what a digital twin is down to the umpteenth degree. And the problem was they just weren't, they couldn't afford it for one. And two, you know, the, the, the paymasters weren't, weren't, didn't have the ability to fund it at the time. And the solution they came up with was, well, they added an analog dial to the ovens and then put a guy, a, a human in the loop and uh, put them on clipboard management. And so I think if I could make a prediction about the future, and we talk a lot about at MXD, how you know CMMC is gonna impact small businesses, how you know making sure you're cyber secure at the lowest level is going to guarantee that you know an F-35 doesn't walk out the door to China, right? It's easy to sell that story to say, oh, the F-35, and we need, to be, we need to be secure as much as we can. If we don't sell it at the lowest level and find simple solutions for folks, I don't think we'll ever be truly secure. So saying, yeah, I hear you. I want to build a digital twin. It's a great idea. I want to do this and I want to do that. Um, but an analog dial that we then digitized later, we, we built a, uh, a system that would read the dial for them and provide some near real time uh, framework so they could they could know this is what the dial is saying. This is what the digital dial is saying. And this is how they're they're interacting with each other so they can make certain predictions on the information. If you can't sell that story at the simplest level without referencing an F-35 or centrifuges in Iran or something like that, we're never going to be secure enough, especially from the DOD perspective, because that supply chain is writ large. You know, the second we involve DLA, how many, what, two million vendors or whatever it is. So uh, that's, I think, my favorite story. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of switching over another combo answer for Anusha and Mike, uh, provide one or two real threats that people often overlook and are there techniques or solutions that are readily available to mitigate those uh, cyber threats? And anyone else, if you want to kind of add in after they're done. Um, I'll throw mine out there and then pass it over to Michael. Um, so, you know, I, I'd say the obvious one is really the need for effective authentication of edge IoT. And, and you know, this has been something that's been 
and smart devices just been overlooked, underdesigned. Um, so, you know, I'm sure all of us have probably heard of of Miraya, but until about four years ago, that idea of a coordinated device attack was really urban legend, right? And then all of a sudden, with we saw the chaos that was unleashed on several high-profile services, even Dyn DNS, through a massive coordinated uh, distributed distributed denial of service attack using simple things like air quality monitors, routers, surveillance cameras. So. You know, this notion of, you know, being able to survive on static password based techniques just doesn't extend well to IoT at scale. It's not something that is easy um, to manage or update. And, and so fortunately, there are a number of emerging technologies that are trying to bring strong authentication to small devices, even given the constraints of power and compute storage, the whole bit. And what we really need is a the next gen way to support kind of user to device and device to device authentication. If we really want to bridge this, as Todd mentioned, that, you know, um, edge all the way back to, you know, the industrial edge, all the way back to kind of the enterprise edge or even the cloud edge. Um, so, you know, one, a few of the, the questions that I would say it's important to ask as we're bringing new systems, new vendors, new devices into our networks are really from the get go, have they thought about kind of authentication and design that into their systems? What are the user authentication methods that they're using for into the device for management, configuration, patching? Um, does it support things like multi-factor authentication? And then once you've added this device into your network, how do you actually pin access and communication to only this device, right? And guarantee that communication, whether it's in a closed enclave or whether it's in a more hybrid system is really only happening between trusted elements. I would say to add to that, uh, you know, from our perspective at MXD, we always start at the lowest level, right? We're always worried about you know, not what Lockheed needs to do, but really what a small business can do to make sure that they're secure. And I think it starts with awareness, but also with that awareness comes understanding that as you bring new technology onto the floor and it comes with all the bells and whistles, you have, there's also a printer that's been there since 1996 that's hooked up to the network. You have to make sure that's secure. And I think building awareness at the lowest level and also highlighting ways for small businesses to engage with cybersecurity professionals. One of the things that we just produced recently and pushed out was a, a cyber hiring guide for small businesses, which paints a simple picture on not only where we are today from a cybersecurity professional perspective, but also where we're going to be in the next 10 or 15 years. And I think it, it it's really going to work hard to highlight the use case and the business case for small businesses to make those decisions and say, you know, I can I can engage in cybersecurity and I can do it at the lowest level and ensure that I'm protected. Not even realizing that as a fourth tier supplier, eventually to DLA, they're actually making the entire infrastructure and the entire network secure. So I think it starts just kind of being aware of what's going on around you and, and knowing that, yeah, you got this new fancy thing and it's hooked up and it's ready and it's safe. And there's a vending machine that hasn't been patched in five or six years. And this is just a sitting there being a vulnerability on your network and allowing access to the open internet. So. Thank you. So Anusha, kind of building off your uh, authentication uh, point there, you know, when you, when you look at some of the more traditional risk mitigation techniques, um, such as uh, whether it's user IDs and passwords or PKI certs and pin based activities, those all have a cycle of uh, support, right? Whether they're annual, whether they're quarterly, whatever you need to do to kind of keep that refreshed and controlled. Um, do you see that kind of as a detriment to uh, adoption? And then what, what would be an alternative to that? Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think this is um, an, another instance of where we can't really use kind of a stock copy and paste of traditional IT defense over to industrial control cyber risk strategy, really. Um, so, you know, specifically with edge compute, when you're talking about large scale, like you said, Chris, these traditional authentication approaches, whether it's, you know, that static password you put into that admin configuration or a PKI type infrastructure, 
it's just not realistic. What ends up happening is either they um, get stale or lead to things like credential reuse, or they're too heavy handed in the case of PKI and require just this constant management infrastructure if you actually want to get it right. And, you know, I can't imagine being the poor IT person that's trying to manage hundreds of thousands of PKI certificates for some sort of edge sensor network, right, of, of devices that are going to keep entering and leaving the ecosystem. So, you know, what we really need is something that's lightweight, self-managing in terms of authentication and can handle um, the notion of ephemeral elements entering and leaving a network. And that's really a must for 5G and IoT. I think we have to, to take the burden off of the human having to, to manage and get it right, both from a deployment, but also a sustainment perspective. Thank you. Um, and I'm gonna kind of adjust on you guys a little bit. Uh, the next question we had slated for Michael and Anusha, but I think that, you know, Todd and Jordan, as well as Alex can kind of chip in here a little bit in terms of the, you know, kind of running the themes from a Q&A perspective and your answers. Uh, one of the things that I've run into as part of our engagements on uh, IoT is, well, you know, I got really old equipment and it's twisted pair and, and well, are you going to put modern sensors on it? And you kind of get that whole talk to the hand because I just don't have the technology. All my technology is not at the same baseline and I can't do anything until I replace all my tech. But when you look at particularly our organic industrial base, there are you know, national defense assets that are 50 years old. I can pick on the, the uh, wind tunnels down in Arnold Air Force Base, right? Some of them are actually surprisingly uh, really old, <laughs> dating back to the World War II in some cases. Uh, still viable, still executing and, and supporting the mission. But how do we integrate that into the IoT framework and what tools are there available so we can take those old twisted pair devices and, and get them into the framework, but keep them secure and, and generate that value? Uh, who wants to go first? Anusha, Todd? Todd's got it. I can, I, I can kind of give it just to talk a little bit about it earlier when we talk about the edge and the multiple edges. and down at that industrial edge um, capability. And, you know, a lot of people think it's just gateways down there, you know, doing protocol translation, but the modern industrial edge capabilities includes the, you know, almost like a, you know, a, a, a firewall capability where you're, you, you can put an industrial, a hardened industrial edge device that has a secure OS, that has an approved OS, that has, you know, that, that's part of the enterprise grade infrastructure and act as that barrier between those, you know, older obsolete protocols and, you know, the serial ports and stuff that you can't necessarily upgrade on, on your patch Tuesday, right? So, we, it, it, you know, you'll break the control part of it. So instead, as part of that, you know, building the IoT data layer over the top with secure edge devices, you know, that are continuously expanding and getting, having more power. And it's really edge compute rather than just a simple gateway. That's one approach. Anusha? Yeah, this Michael? is Alex. Yeah. Alex, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can just jump in. So like you've, like you've said, we need, in some cases, we have needs to connect these devices to networks for logging and diagnostics and analytics and whatnot. So in some cases, we can add some kind of an encryption diode in the line where when the output of that diode would be encrypted on an overlaid network and still allow that device to function. Another type of device that we're starting to see in industry is looking at the state that the system is and the state that the, the usage is in and only allowing certain types of messages if that system is in the appropriate state. Some of the details of where these can be applied depend on the specifics of those networks and what they're authorized to hold, what kind of traffic and whatnot, even if they're encrypted. And then there's also other programs out there more at the basic research level that are looking at understanding the firmware that's actually on these devices. Because you have proprietary firmware, you have firmware, you know, in which the 
the source code is no longer available? And can we extract that while maintaining the same functionality where there's intentional or unintentional and run some of that some of that logic in a cloud environment, for example? So can we do your lift and shift or whatnot? It's just a couple of the things that we see out there. Thank you. And I would add uh, from my perspective, and it kind of goes to what Michael said about um, the example of the digital twin uh, for the um, foodstuffs manufacturing. Um, I think people first need to realize that it's, some of these things are at the top of the cycle. Um, there's more in the buzzword than there is sometimes behind, uh, behind it when you're trying to actually implement organization. But when you and then how do I go about understanding that approach and concept, then what can I do from it from an outcomes oriented perspective? then that informs how I model the world, the tools I adopt, and then the technologies I need to support it. Uh, and then I think that framework and approach helps you work in this environment, especially in defense, where you're always going to have something that's sitting, you know, something that's older, maybe archaic, sitting alongside the most advanced technologies in the world. Uh, you know, an aside, I worked with an innovation project with some um, cadets at West Point, and they're trying to solve, um, you know, problems, and they were all looking towards AI and machine learning. And I gave the example of a Moses pole, uh, you know, for clearing trenches. And I'm an infantryman, so this is a, a, a dumb infantryman <laughs> tool. But right now, when you're when you're clearing trenches and you're you're a uh, hundred yards away uh, observing, and you want to know the forward trace of the uh, of your guys as they clear the trench from left to right. A big long pole with a chem light on it is still probably the best technology we have and probably will be for some time. Um, so how does that live right alongside all these other things that we're going to put on soldiers, that we're going to put on uh, aircraft and everything supporting the battlefield around it? Uh, and I think that that is very analogous to what's going to happen in uh, factories and maintenance facilities uh, as old technologies continue to provide value but how do we integrate them, model them, proxy them in this larger system of digital twins and, and other technologies? Michael, new yeah. I, I would, I would definitely uh, plus one everything everyone has said. I guess you know it's it's got to be the uh, underlying premise or the starting point that we do have to support a hybrid architecture, a hybrid set of devices and some of them are going to be you know very shiny and forward leaning and uh and some of them are going to have a little bit of dust and so that idea of of creating tiered architectures kind of enclaves um where yeah maybe you you use kind of a an edge gateway or edge device to kind of aggregate everything and create a certain security level of everything behind and then going forward is a really way, effective way to to bolt on security, I suppose, for some of those that we're those devices we're going to have to live with for a while. Michael, well, that chem light is certainly cyber secure, right? We can guarantee that. So I think you know, <laughs> much like Anusha said and everyone else has said, I, I would echo that again, saying, you know, it, we have to consider what works right now and, and what we need to work in the future in any way we can integrate those in a way that directly benefits the warfighter, especially, I think is going to be a win and is going to be something that the Department of Defense and the organic industrial base is certainly going to support. The more we can push forward while bringing those legacy systems, you know, Rock Island Arsenal, there's a Cleveland Press. And the reason it's called the Cleveland Press is because I think it was made in Cleveland. So, and it's been there since forever and it, it, it works, you know, and if we can put a sensor on it, we can integrate that sensor and make sure it's cyber secure all the better. So I'm gonna change up the last question on you too a little bit. We're gonna start with Alex from an answer perspective uh, and we'll use that as our wrap up. Um, and it's, uh, it's always that fun question. Um, if you could change one thing about how uh, customers are, are, are approaching cybersecurity for smart equipment, what would you change? And I'll start with Alex. Right. I would say that the bluff is looking at the properties of zero trust networks. Your challenge is on a smart device, you have software, you have hardware, there's gonna be 
bugs, there's going to be insecure configurations intentionally or as a function of applying an update. So there's going to be some unknown behavior, whether you can update that via software. If you look at like, you know, your Spectre or your Meltdown tools, where you know, fixing it would require firmware or change of hardware or something you can't push out. I would say the answer is looking at your zero trust architecture. So device authentication, user authentication, encryption at rest and whatnot. And then we'll move on to Jordan. Uh, forgive me, there was a, a cut in the audio when you asked the question yeah. and I came in halfway through Alex's What one answer. thing would you change about how people are approaching um, cyber for smart equipment? Organizationally um, or te technically, you can pick it anywhere on the spectrum. It's that classic I, end of the I, interview. What would you do different, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it has to be something imbued throughout people process and technology. Um, you know, leaders who, you know, in the past wanted to say, okay, there's my IT support, there's my cyber support, tell me what to do, um, make sure everything works, and then that's the end of my involvement in it. Uh, you know, if I'm looking at commanders, people running facilities, uh, shop leaders, um, they need to get in, understand it, understand how it needs to be baked through all the business requirements that they provide that inform these architectures. Um, the days where, you know, IT is over there and business over here are over, uh, and you need to understand the concepts so that you can better work with and articulate and build these uh, capabilities with your IT support um, institutions and, and um, resources. Thanks, Jordan. Todd? Uh, I think I could said it earlier, bolt-on security is no longer viable. It's too cumbersome, too many different vendors. It needs to be deeply embedded into everything we do. Um, it, it needs to be software-based, code inspection is built in there and orchestrated centrally. So the cloud, secure cloud is going to play a big portion, a, a big uh, role in that, but really it has to be done, you know, fr from within and not just bolted on. Anusha. Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, you know, to me, cyber is not a point in time thing. It needs to be, you know, when you, you, bring in a new architecture, a new device, a new system, one of the important questions is, okay, what is the sustainment leg from the perspective of keeping the cyber guarantees I have when I set it up and turn it on the first time? What does that look like, both from a people process policy perspective? And, and as much as possible, making these systems kind of self-assuring um, and choosing systems that are self-assuring from a cyber perspective so that you know things like authentication are are dynamic not point in time things like encryption are kind of you know um self-rotating if you will so all of those notions of having cyber be a continual aspect of the system and operations is is i think crucial mike I would say, you know, it comes down to the policy side, right? We, we need an integrated policy across the OIB and, and I would say the defense industrial base as well that allows for the engagement uh, and integration of, of digital technology on the factory floor and allows for next gen communications to be integrated as well. And I think on the policy side, we need to make sure that, you know, those improvements and innovations come from the lowest level and that there are mechanisms in place to allow a young airman to fix the air for the game because right now the next great idea sitting at, at the a1c level is, is going to be stuck uh, snuffed out by by an unintegrated it and ot policy across the board thank you all so with that we're going to wrap up our panel i really like to thank all of you for taking uh time out of your busy schedules and it's not just this panel but it's also all the prep work uh that all of us put into it uh, for the audience out there, we are going to be breaking for lunch uh, and returning at 1300. Thank you very much. For five years, I came to work every day to this building as an Air Force industry contractor. Each day, I had the privilege of seeing this Air Force Memorial replica before entering. The original Air Force Memorial overlooks the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. 
This one is on Pentagon Boulevard in Beaver Creek, Ohio, a few miles from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The Air Force Memorial honors the pioneers of early flight, like the Wright brothers, but also the personnel of the United States Air Force. Seeing this every day was a constant inspiration to me and those of us working on that Air Force project. This next panel discusses the impact of cybersecurity across industries. I hope you enjoy it. Good afternoon and welcome back. I'm Don Bowen, Cybersecurity Outreach Director for Huntington National Bank. I'm joined on today's panel by Major General Mark Bartman, Lou Lyons, Max Olick, and Christopher Zell. I'd ask each of them to introduce themselves uh, after their first question. And we'll dive right into the questions now. Max, can you please talk to us about why cybersecurity is an important in product and technology development? Sure, absolutely. So uh, Don, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, I wanna thank everybody on this panel for, for being here uh, with me. Um, just a little bit about my background. So I started my career in the Air Force as a security forces member, spent majority of my time in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, got uh, joined right after 9-11 and, and then got sent over there, uh, spent time as a, as a linguist, came back and actually started working here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So I'm pretty excited to be part of this panel, uh, considering all the history and, and uh, a lot of my friends are out at Wright-Patterson. And then I immediately started working on Ignite. So today uh, we are leading uh, and developing a product, which this is a good question uh, for, for next generation leaders in, in corporate environments, right? Financial services, healthcare, those kinds of things. So uh, the question is why is cybersecurity important in product or technology development? Uh, the way I look at it is to, uh, cybersecurity is a culmination of finance, legal, and technology, right? That's what makes up uh, the whole concept of cybersecurity or, or risk management. Uh, we have to start baking in cybersecurity considerations uh, at the start of the requirements life cycle and at the start of when you even start to conceptualize about what a product should be. Uh, because at the end of the day, we all rely on products and services uh, and a lot of our, our uh, uh, critical infrastructure, whether it's on the Air Force side or the commercial side, we're using one form of a product or another. Um, so it's very critical to have some of these things, cybersecurity uh, as part of that life cycle. I'm gonna pause here. I'm sure um, uh, uh, General uh, Mark has some comments about this as well. Uh, but all in all, you know, in the summary, I, I think it's, it's a very important part of uh, cybersecurity uh, because a lot of the vulnerabilities and issues are actually found in some of the most cutting edge products that we hear about. So we have to build a little bit more awareness about uh, why this should be considered as part of the, the technology development. Thanks, Max. Uh, appreciate the handoff. Uh, Don, thanks for uh, being the uh, gracious host uh, to try to corral uh, all of us today. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to just a quick shout out to the Right IT uh, Summit that uh, today for all the great things I know that uh, they're, and also the Dayton Right chapter, the Armed Forces Communication Electronics Association. They've got their uh, 75th anniversary coming up next year. So I've uh, been around uh, for uh, actually longer than the United States Air Force uh, has been around. So pretty an impressive organization. Um, as uh, Max started out uh, talking about there, I'll just real quickly a little bit on my background for everybody. I um, uh, actually graduated from Ohio State University back in 1982, so about a million years ago. And uh, I spent most of my career actually as a uh, fighter pilot. And so I'm sure your first thought is, so what on earth is a fighter pilot doing on end of a panel? Well, the last eight years actually of my career was probably the most uh, formative when it comes to understanding cybersecurity and industry and how this all comes together. Um, I was the initially the commander for the Air National Guard here in Ohio, and then the last four years uh, worked for Governor Kasich as the Adjutant General for the state of Ohio. And it was back actually in 2015 when the governor uh, came to me and said, we need to figure out this cybersecurity thing. We need to make sure that uh, our elections are secure and uh, I want you to do it. And again, my reaction, of course, at the time, uh, in many ways, uh, was, 
uh, yes, sir, I'll uh, get right on it. And so I immediately went back and sat down and started talking to all of my experts uh, within both the Army and the Air National Guard to try to understand better what it was really that we need to be doing. And I think it really boils down to one word, and the word we use is trust. So, uh, you know, for a industry and you're selling a product and you are hoping that somebody is going to buy your product, the first thing that you should be thinking about is that the customer is going to trust that your product is going to work, number one. And then number two, that it will uh, keep their information secure. So, uh, and obviously, as we all know, um, there's been many large hacks of information over the last, uh, just the last 10 years in particular. Um, me being in the military, obviously, uh, I have been, it's been unfortunate, but I've been a part of uh, uh, several of those large days. And so if the first thing that goes is trust when it comes to product development and technology development, then obviously you're not going to be able uh, to uh, sell your product. You're not going to have people that are going to want to buy your product and uh, you're not going to be a very successful industry uh, for the long run. So I think that's really one of the, the key areas uh, for that. And although I don't think we're, you know, we're really going to get into it today, but um, the uh, un having the C-suite uh, understand exactly what it is and why cybersecurity is important is critical as well. If you're CISO, uh, and uh, Chris L, I'm sure at some point will talk about this, but if your CISO doesn't have a direct line to the CEO to be able to walk into the office and say, hey boss, uh, this is what's going on here, we need to take care of it right away, uh, then the industry has got a problem and it probably is not going to survive very long. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Don. Thanks, Mark. Lou, this next one goes to you. In what innovative ways do companies inculcate good cyber hygiene practices into their workforce? I'm Lou Lyons. I'm the founder and CEO of cyber, Shadow Rabbit Cyber. Uh, also a retired Air Force working in electronic warfare and airborne electronic warfare. Uh, when I look at hygiene, there's so many different pieces to hygiene. Uh, one I would focus on would be education. So when you look at education, so there's multiple pieces. Fitting it into your environment is the best way to do it. Uh, I've done where we've done annual training. We've done training as newcomers came in, done pop-ups on your laptop, uh, sending out emails, walking around, even had my people stand at the doors when people came in and passed out little crossword puzzles. And if you turned it in and completed it, you'd get a $50 gift card. But keeping the people involved is the way to do it and keep it on their mind as you go through. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Lou. Mark, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of the supply chain in cybersecurity? Yeah, I would love to, actually. So um, one of the things that I've been doing since I retired in uh, January of 2019 is I work at uh, Ohio State University as a consultant. and. Initially, uh, what I got involved with was to stand up a academic program at Ohio State um, because they didn't have one specifically focused in cybersecurity. They, of course, have a, a computer science and uh, electrical and computer engineering degrees, um, industrial systems type degrees, but nothing that was really focused specifically on cybersecurity or brought all of those different disciplines together to uh, into one area. So for students that are interested, in getting um, bachelor's or, or higher level type degrees in cybersecurity, it was something that they, they could study. So uh, one of the things that I started to work on was to try to understand better um, how the supply chain actually works and where are the key areas within the supply chain that we sort of really need to start when it comes to cybersecurity. The, one of the things that, that, that uh, I was able to find um, was that um, it really starts, and uh, again, this is fighter pilot speak, right? So it really sort of starts with the ones and zeros, right? So it's not about just writing code and making sure that the code is secure, but it's also about the manufacturing of the integrated circuits, of the chips um, on the circuit boards. It's making sure, again, right, it goes back to that whole idea of trust. It's making sure that anything that is used 
uh, whether it's within the military or whether it's in the civilian sector, um, has that level of trust to it to make sure that it's going to work like it's supposed to work, right? So it doesn't matter whether, you know, we're talking about um, your uh, refrigerator at home, which is now part of the Internet of Things, um, and knowing whether or not, obviously, somebody is spying on your refrigerator uh, and you're low on milk, or whether it has to do with me flying, um, you know, an F-16 and knowing that when I hit uh, the, uh, the weapons release button, that that bomb that I'm dropping is going to hit what I'm aiming at, that I know it's going to, or that it's even going to come off the airplane correctly and uh, that it's going to fly the proper path to get to the target on the ground for that. And, and it's everything really in between, right? So the, the, the issue is so broad that it really goes to all different types of areas within the supply chain. So you have to start not only at the beginning, but you have to now address everything that's currently out there and how do we secure what is already out there and making sure that uh, we don't have to worry about any of these kind of hacks in the future time. Don, back to you. Thanks, Mark. That's a great lead into our next question. Lou, this one's from you. Uh, why should or shouldn't operational technology, or as uh, Mark mentioned, the Internet of Things, and information technology be integrated into one platform? Please integrate them. Uh, some of the issues I run into, though, is the, the different languages that are taught. Uh, I've went into businesses, and basically IT and OT were at odds with each other. They didn't want to deal with each other. I had to bring in actual outside people and, and basically translate what was going on and educate the OT staff on what we were trying to do and then educate the IT staff on how to do it. Uh, a lot of times there's a huge disconnect on what you can do. You can't just dub the widget in from IT into the OT environment. All you're going to do is break things. And, that, and they're highly sensitive to that because it's happened over and over again. Thank you, Don. Thanks. Chris, we'll start off with you on this one. Uh, why should industry be involved in training and education programs? Yeah, thanks, Don. So um, just to kind of give a quick background on myself, I'm currently Vice President and Head of Information Security for the Wendy's Company. Um, yes, we're a burger company, but, but make no mistake, we are uh, truly a digital and technology wow. company. I've got responsibility for almost 7,000 restaurants around the world um, and over 11 million digital customers, so a lot of data to protect. Um, spent 22 years uh, in the Air Force, retired about two years ago. Uh, spent about 12 years on active duty and I split the rest of the time uh, between uh, guard and reserves. So, you know, great, great question. Why should industry be involved kind of in the, in, in the training workforce development? I think about, you know, being able to give our industry a more common baseline of knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, can really help both candidates and employers like me uh, really be much, much more successful in, in filling openings. You know, everyone here is on the civilian side. There's this uh, lack of cyber talent, lack of um, positions uh, or, or candidates who are, who are able to fill open positions. Um, I, I think in my experience on the civilian side, it's really that we're pretty horrible at creating good job descriptions. I think that's one part of it. I think the second part of it is we've never aligned on a really standard taxonomy, um, jargon, lexicon, whatever you want to call it, on what we look for in cyber, right? And so that gives employers a hard time understanding how to create good job descriptions, with then, which then leads to, you know, candidates trying to understand how do I fit in. Um, if you look at, you know, something like the NICE framework, um, I'm actually seeing more um, civilian CISOs on our side starting to align like our job descriptions creating workforce development training programs uh, in alignment with those frameworks. I think it just allows a lot of the interoperability um, to occur. It allows for, again, candidates to understand, you know, what roles out there could really fit me and how can I help benefit organizations. And I think as industry, we know what we're doing as, you know, kind of the boots on the ground trying to defend the, the, the domain, so to speak, on a daily basis. And so how can we work more closely together with, um, with the government side to really understand how we can bring great candidates to, to the field that we need? 
Great. Lou, do you want to have anything you want to chime in on that same question? Yeah, I, I think you need the input from the industry as you're, as you're developing these frameworks and you're looking at the training. Uh, you have to have some input to gear the training towards what, what's effective. I've sat through 45 minute sessions of training that put me to sleep and five minutes of it actually had something to do with what I was doing. So you want, you want that input to make sure that you cater the training, make it effective, make it relevant, and make it real. I mean, make it to today. What, what are you doing today? Uh, I've been places where part of the training was I'd walk through the parking lot and I'd drop thumb drives to see who would plug them in after we just got through with, with a lesson of not to plug in thumb drives. Same things with emails. You know, you need to make it relevant with what's going on. You don't want to send out something that was from 10 years ago an email message for fishing, you want to send something that's happening in the world right now. You know, is it the holidays? Are we fishing for the holidays? Are we fishing because somebody just got compromised? Your credit your credit information is available now. So that's the type of fishing we should be doing. But make sure the training and get the input from the industry to specific to what they would be doing and the types of emails they would get or the types of training they're interested in. Thank you, John. Thanks, Lou. Chris, this one, I, let's talk a little bit about diversity in the cybersecurity workforce. Um, first of all, I'd kind of ask you, you know, what does diversity mean to you in the cybersecurity workforce? But how can we increase that diversity? Yeah, great, great question. Certainly something I'm, I'm quite passionate about and, and can talk about for, for a long time. So we'll have to time box this a little bit. Uh, you know, diversity to me, um, and, and this may not be reflective of, of what if we have a primarily kind of government-based uh, attendance here, but to me and kind of in our industry, anyone that doesn't really look like me, right? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about um, women, I'm talking about LGBTQ, we're talking about Latin, Latino, Latinx, we're talking about even differently abled um, folks, so neuro-abled, um, you know, folks on the autism spectrum, and of course, um, disabled veterans. So uh, my wife, a great example, um, she's a, is a woman in cyber and things have kind of been tough for her on occasion. So diversity is important to me, I think, for a few reasons. Obviously, one on the personal side, something very passionate about. But then also, you know, when you bring diverse backgrounds, when you bring diversity of thought, um, diverse ideas to problems, you can then solve them in ways that you would not have been able to solve for before. I think traditionally in technology, we're used to looking at the same problems the same way. We've hired the same type of people and we keep getting the same type of results. So I think really being able to bring a divergent thought to all of your processes, I, I think of it as kind of red teaming in your organization, right? The idea is to bring in someone with a contrarian view, um, dissimilar backgrounds, but still has a capacity and a propensity for um, deep thought, analytics, drive, motivation. I've just seen amazing results bringing folks in from non-traditional backgrounds who are able to look at problems so much differently. Um, but I think also as an industry, we as practitioners should reflect the audience, so to speak, that we actually support. So for Wendy's, for example, uh, obviously we're a very large service organization and I want our corporate entity to reflect the same values and workforce of the of the people that we actually um, provide services to. So whether it's your customers, your employees, or, or the American people, I think really, ultimately the community as, as a whole should really reflect those who, who we actually intend to protect. I think that also helps us understand who they are and how we can better support those folks. Um, I think a, a kind of a dovetail to that is, you know, how do we get people more involved into cybersecurity? How do we get more people excited from those diverse backgrounds? I think it's a few things. I think we really need to focus on getting kids more excited about cybersecurity, right? So middle school, high school, STEM fields. Um, and, and General Bartman kind of touched on it a little bit. There's this paradigm out there that to be involved in cybersecurity, I think, from what I've seen, you know, you have to be a programmer, computer science, math whiz, or it's all about being a hacker in a hoodie. And that's that's just not true. And, and I know for a fact, a lot of those paradigms really turn a lot of folks off um, from our industry. Um, so I think it's incumbent on us who are actually involved to get that message out there that, look, there are so many different career paths in cybersecurity that don't require a deep technical understanding. I, I run a global team of 90 people. 
And I've only got one team that's made of ethical hackers. There's about six folks, just, just as an example. Not everyone knows programming languages. So there are a lot of different career paths. And so to get in front of those people and help them understand, look, this is a very rewarding career field, both financially, personally rewarding. You can you know, work almost anywhere. Um, financially, you can be set up to very, be very successful. Um, so yeah, just a topic, again, we could go, go on and on, but um, a lot of great initiatives out there um, that, are, that are underway to help increase diversity and inclusion and equity in, in the cyber field. And, and I'm proud to be involved in a few of them. So. Thanks, Chris. Uh, this one, I'm going to get input from all four of our panelists, uh, you know, given their experience, and I know each one of them, so I know they are successful in their current cybersecurity careers, but really, how has that experience that they, achieve, that they, they achieved during the military uh, parts of their career, how has that really transitioned over to help them in that leadership in the civilian cybersecurity side of things? So we'll start off with Mark. Thanks, Don. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you being uh, very generous, uh, saying that I have a pretty cybersecurity career. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> that uh, that fits uh, what I'm currently doing, but I appreciate it very much. Believe me. Um, if I could, so I, what I think would be the best way to address this is actually to touch on the two previous questions very briefly. So um, the first one uh, a couple ago talked about um, having uh, training programs and, and the right kind of education training for cybersecurity. Um, and uh, NIST and NICE obviously being uh, ones that uh, the federal government highlights uh, the most. Um, and so as, a, as an example, when I started out at Ohio State, one of the first things that I realized um, talking to a lot of the faculty members and I and have to be a little careful here because my wife is a professor and I don't want to get in too much trouble here at home, <laughs> is, is the, um, this issue of that in academia and higher ed particularly, right, there doesn't appear to be a lot of interaction between uh, industry and academia. And so you tend to get these diverging paths where uh, academia feels that, well, this is, we're teaching the right things. These are the things that the students need to know but in fact, that may not actually be what industry wants. And so one of the first things that I did was I brought together a panel, and in fact, uh, both Don and Chris were two of the individuals that were on the panel. And we sat down with about a half a dozen faculty members and spent about three or four hours, one Friday afternoon, going through each and, and letting everybody kind of talk around the table to try to figure out what it was really that was being taught and then what it was that industry really needed. So that's really, I think, one of the key areas here is that to make sure that academia is listening to industry and it's going both ways, right? The, the second point is this uh, diversity issue, and, and Chris is absolutely right on target with that. I will just say that 38 years in the military, that many, many, many times I saw what I would consider to be groupthink. And, and usually that is because you have individuals that have similar backgrounds. They don't even have to look alike necessarily, but if their backgrounds are all the same, you end up with everybody having very similar type of thinking processes towards whatever the problem is that is presented to you. And so when it comes to, especially within cybersecurity, right, and you've got somebody attacking your network out there, you don't know who that person is. Um, so having people on your team with diverse backgrounds, with different of approaching a problem, with different ways of thinking about a problem is going to make your uh, business much more successful in the long run, just in my opinion. So I think, you know, I think I uh, sort of answered the question uh, in a roundabout way. Um, and I'll finish with maybe just saying that I kind of think of myself as a cybersecurity evangelist. Um, one of the things that I did while I was the adjutant general was to start what we call the Ohio Cyber Collaboration Committee. And that was, that was an attempt, and it's very successful now, to just bring together as many different people from across the state of Ohio that we could to sit at the table and talk about issues. What do we need to do? We now have an Ohio Cyber Range uh, that is fully up and running, uh, hosted by the Ohio Cyber Range Institute at the University of Cincinnati. We now have an Ohio Cyber Reserve that the National Guard is responsible for, and, uh, and they've already stood up several teams with that. 
Um, so there's a lot of great things that have happened just in the last few years. Um, and I like to think that it's been those experiences that I had in the military that have really helped me to better uh, think through and to be able to plan out as to how I was going to address some of these problems. So Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. You know, for, for me, um, and being at Wendy's, I actually have the, the great pleasure of, uh, of chairing uh, one of our employee resource groups is folks on veterans. So I, I lead the Wendy's Veteran um, Employee Resource Group. And, and there are really three things that we talk about when, when we like to evangelize, you know, what being a veteran means and why hiring veterans are important. And I, and I usually touch on training, resilience and leadership. You know, from a tra training perspective, in, in my 22 years um, as an airman, I was really afforded some of the best training uh, in the world, actually. And I remember being a, a one striper, you know, back in the mid 90s and, and being sent um, up to Seattle to learn things like, you know, packet capture and analysis. And, and I was banging on my first Cisco, you know, routers and switches as a 20 some year old kid. Um, I, I think being able to install and operate some of the first firewalls in the Air Force and some of the first vulnerability scanners, you know, really gave me a really deep understanding of what cyber and technology is. Um, so, so we talk about the training resilience. I think, you know, most everyone here can really relate to this, but deployments being away from home, um, dealing with high ops tempo, uh, working in austere conditions, and, and really having high levels of responsibility thrust upon you at an early age, I think really sets you up to be able to look at things through a different lens uh, when, when you enter the civilian workforce. So I, I think no matter how long you spend, you know, you served or will serve on, on active duty or in the military at all, I think spending any amount of time will really help make what you deal with on the civilian side sometimes feel like a bit of a, a cakewalk actually and and i think from a leadership perspective you know where we're thrust into leadership at, at early age as i mentioned it's not really that way in the civilian sector uh, we are groomed through professional military education uh, we have real work experience we're, we're groomed as servant leaders who really put our people on our mission first um, and, and that's a quality that's very highly sought after on the civilian side I think we're trained to speak very well, to, to carry ourselves a certain way, dignity, respect, um, and trained to take care of our people and, 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 of course, reflect the core values of each of our services every day. So I think taking all of those components that have really forged, I, I know everyone on this panel, myself as well, into who we are today has really helped us to be very successful in transition you know, into the civilian side of things. So. Thanks, Chris. We'll go to Max next. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I started my career in the Air Force right out of high school. So before before that, I had migrated from India and had recently just gotten my uh, my citizenship. So to me, uh, you know, what the, the most important thing that the military brought is a sense of purpose. And it fits perfectly within cybersecurity because it's not just about, you know, um, configuring a vulnerability tool, writing a, an executive presentation, whatever it might be, we're, we're really here to help protect and serve, right? And then when we translate that into a civilian side, that's really what the mission is. The mission is to serve, the mission is to help protect businesses. Um, and, and, you know, I, I like, like Chris said, you know, very early days, um, you received the best training in the world, right? Uh, I was configuring things like tack lanes and, and, loading up crypto equipment, things like that. Uh, at that time, I didn't really understand why, uh, what I was doing, uh, but I knew how to do it. And so that helped. Um, I, being an enlisted guy, you know, there's a common saying, hey, just shut up and color, right? So I followed suit. Uh, but uh, eventually when I got over into the civilian side, um, really uh, I missed my veteran friends, right? And then what we really learned is we all had a sense of purpose. And the purpose was to actually help protect and defend uh, our country. And now with the third, uh, uh, you know, third party supply chain issue, uh, it all impacts directly back to our national security reasons. And, and to me, it just makes the job a much more sweeter, right? Whether we're in, in leadership capacities, uh, which I am today, but in the past, I, I haven't been in the leadership capacities and it still made the job uh, much more sweeter because our, our, you know, our, our goal is really to help our nation uh, and, and the supply chain and all the civilians that are working within different corporate environment, believe it or not, they're an, an extension of, of the force of the entire country. 
Uh, so, so to me, you know, military actually set my path uh, uh, pretty early on uh, in my in my career, and I'm actually blessed to have that experience. So, what I'll say is, if you if you are young and you're looking to get into it, I got in what was called a three three papa. Uh, it was a security forces person. Today, the career has transitioned to three Charlie with communications. There's also three Delta cyber guys. If you can't afford uh, to actually go to cybersecurity school, military is an excellent option. Me as a foreigner, um, that I, I had a I had an awesome veteran uh, um, kind of a a mentor. He was a chief in the Air Force. He said, "Max, you need to serve your new country." I said, "Yes, sir. I'll go do it." And I didn't know what I was getting into. So it totally prepares you for what's coming up in the future. In the civilian side, uh, the skills are highly sought after. Everything that you learn there is a little bit of a translation, uh, but that's okay. Once you get past that, uh, you'll climb up the the, the ranks very quickly. So with that, I'll pass it over to Lou. Lou, I know you're a, you're a prior guy too. What are your thoughts? Well, don't tell anybody, but I was a horrible leader to begin with. Uh, <laughs> what the Air Force gave me was mentors to help me basically straighten myself out. I was a dictator. Uh, but they helped me see that the importance of your people and the importance of taking care of them and, and basically guiding them and mentoring them, which was what the Air Force did for me, the, the senior people I worked for, they basically led me through and, and showed me how to do things and basically straightened me out from the beginning. Uh, just love being in the Air Force, love the, the camaraderie, uh, miss it a lot of times. Uh, being in corporate world and the Air Force, when you're in the Air Force, you have, you have policies, regulations that show you how to do things. A lot of times in the commercial world, you're shooting from the hip. It's your decision, and it basically it's your head if you don't do it right. Uh, but, yeah, it's it just the, the the different aspects of leadership and the different aspects of, of training and uh, making sure you're educated and making sure you have the tools to do your job, which I've tried to bring over and, and have into uh, the corporate environment. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Lou. So uh, since we've talked a little bit about how the, your military careers kind of helped set you up for success on the civilian side, I'd like to compare and contrast a little bit the key differences in approach uh, to cybersecurity specifically when comparing you know, how the military organizations and how civilian organizations approach it. So with that, Max, you want to give us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So you know, when I, when I first uh, got out of the Air Force, let me start there. Um, you know, the, the Air Force, it's almost like when you speak in Air Force lingo, you have to say in accordance with AFI. That's how you can do things, right? If it doesn't exist in the AFI, then um, then it's really hard to make a case to do anything cybersecurity. I remember uh, I was doing these things called DITSCAP packages and DICAP packages and then trying to get the base firewall approved for some website, right? You always had to have a reason, and it was very much – uh, behind uh, a rigorous process. Uh, today, we call this kind of a compliance-driven process. Um, and, and, and it was good for its purpose, its time. And then when I went over to the civilian side, it's quite the opposite. There are no rules. Uh, just like Lou said, you're, you're shooting from the hip. So if you start to present it in that way, it doesn't work. The model breaks out, right? So what, what the commercial side demands is speed. And, it, and the speed has to be uh, taken into consideration with financial performance of the business, right? You can't just spend money on compliance. You can't just spend money on, on the Air Force side, what we call ATOs, right? Approval to operate, unless there's a financial need to do so, right? At a very large scale, right? So when you have organizations like Dell and Google, they're, they're all competing. At the end of the day, they're all financially competing for, for talent and as well as innovation, right? So one of the biggest things about the, the civilian side is uh, you, you're there to augment the innovation, right, uh, at, the, at the speed that the business needs to move. Whereas on the military side, you know, our culture is very much um, risk centric, risk averse, where we don't want to make moves. We don't want to go things forward. And so when I was trying to work things between cross agencies, let's say, you know, an army got something approved and now I'm trying to get it approved by uh, by. Um, you know, but by the Air Force, uh, interdepartmental, interagency things were very difficult. Whereas on the on the commercial side, if you don't have interdepartmental communication, you don't have global communication enabled very quick, lightning fast, your competition is going to eat your lunch, right? 
Uh, and so once I understood that, right, what we started to uh, do, at least in Ignite, is we started to build on this concept of, uh, you know, agile cybersecurity. How do we how do we feed cybersecurity solutions at the speed that it's required? And that's a very different way of looking at things, right? Where, where you're r- really looking at it from a risk and financial speeds perspective versus the compliance and, and the burden that you have to manage on the Air Force side. Yeah. So at least that, that was my experience 10 years ago. I am hopeful that the Air Force is changing. I have heard that that the government is changing, but uh, but that that was the biggest black and white difference uh, from, from, from my time. Chris, Chris, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that you're going to hear too terribly much different. You know, you're 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 bringing back some some memories for me. I was uh, a contractor working for the USF at NOSC at Shaw, and uh, I was leading the policies research section for the information insurance uh, unit. So, you know, it's cap now the RMF, you know, trying to work through the ATOs and various DAAs for, you know, all the different units downrange. Um, it, it was a bit of a mess, right? And I, I think my experiences in the military really highlighted a few, a few key differences. But you know, let me let me talk about the commonalities. You know, firewalls are firewalls, endpoints are endpoints. Microsoft is Microsoft. I think the big differences I found is really risk appetite, right? And Max alluded to this a little bit. On on the military side, you you typically have much less tolerance for risk for for obvious reasons. Um, I I was able to work for an intelligence unit um, at Ramstein, where risk tolerated right i mean you, you certainly have the, the, the capability to risk the the potential loss of life limb eyesight we say that all the time um we don't see that on on the civilian side military side very heavily dependent on processes right and for the for the seasoned folks like like max and i even going back to the to the dits cap even before die cap uh, very slow very cumbersome very process oriented and, and driven right i know on the civilian side we don't necessarily deal with the same type of risk there certainly is financial implications involved in everything that we do, uh, much to, to Max's point. You know, that's one of the main reasons why we're here, even even in a, in a burger company like I have. If we weren't faced with potential loss of customer uh, sentiment, uh, uh, availability of our point of sale systems due to ransomware, fines and penalties for not protecting credit card information, those are all financially motivated, financially driven um, risks. That's the primary reason why why we're here. And I think another key difference is um, uh, cultivating a culture of accepting failure. On on the military and government side, it's not really there. And again, I think that goes back to the speed that Max mentioned. On the on the corporate side, we have this culture where we are much more accepting of failure. Uh, but but I like to say fail fast and fail forward because we are competing. Uh, with other folks in the industry and while we're doing a much better job and make sure that we're embedding and integrating security into our application development pipeline devops devsecops and in the air force is is spending more time on devsecops as well um it's it is acceptable for us to be able to make some mistakes uh, and to be able to address those after the fact so um, i think some failure is required to continue to innovate um, if you don't have that culture where it's okay to fail fast and forward, you're not going to get creativity. You're not going to get innovation. You're going to get engineers and ideas that are really built around the idea of going slow, stable, steady, uh, which which might be fine in some circumstances. Um, but uh, again, to even what Lou said, shooting from the hip. There's a lot of that. We don't necessarily have Big Brother to go to. We don't have a Magcom to go to. We don't have a, another DAA. Uh, to lean on for reciprocity so a lot of these things are on us i i report all of our information directly to the ceo and the board there's no one else necessarily for me to go to to say hey you know how should i be doing this so a lot of it is is kind of building the ship down the you know going down the river as you go so thanks chris let's uh let's play on that just a little bit and have uh, Max and then Mark uh, really talk to the point at which, you know, what approaches have they seen uh, really that the DOD and Air Force can leverage from the private or the commercial sector side? Right. You know, it, it, to me, it, it all starts with the acquisition side. Uh, the, the Air Force and the DOD at large, they have to kind of fix their acquisition so they can rapidly onboard different types of capabilities, 
Um, and, and so they can attract new talent, right? Because a lot of this has to do with, like Chris mentioned, right? If, if you're if you have a culture where the, where failure is acceptance, you're going to get a different kind of crowd that wants to innovate because they're not punished, right? So a lot of that a lot of that has to do with fixing the acquisition. So some of the some of the things that uh, that I have seen that work really well on the on the commercial side is that you know CISOs like like Chris and and others that I work with, they have uh, you know they they have actual authority to make make decisions when something bad happens, right? So, so first of all, we, we, we need to figure out how do we downward delegate authority, right? I, I reach out to military folks all the time, and it's just that, hey, I, I can't sign a single MOU, a memorandum of understanding. I can't do this. I can't do that, right? Because they don't feel like they have the authority. So if you don't, have, if you don't, if you don't feel like you have the authority, you're really not going to innovate. You're really not going to push forward. The second thing is this whole new concept I'm, I'm seeing uh, and it really comes from uh, from from the civilian side is this this uh, rapid acquisition, right? Whenever there's a problem on the civilian side, Chris can call me up. He can call anybody up and say, "Hey, I need you to fix this," right? That's a, that's a form of a rapid acquisition. So OTAs, other transaction authorities, are are trying that. So I I think that needs to be worked out a little bit more, uh, which which essentially essentially is a legislation that allows. Uh, as Chris was mentioning, non-traditional players, right? Divergent thinkers, not your traditional, hey, this is how we've always done it, right? They're bringing about new ideas. So so, so to me, you know, a lot of, a lot of these things on the private sector have already happened. Uh, and Share practices in this area. Yeah, it's a really great question, Max. Thanks. Um, so, in fact, yesterday I uh, was uh, listening to uh, Brigadier General Pringle, who happens to be the new AFRL com um, commander, speak, and she was talking about a lot of the things that the Air Force is trying to do right now. And for anybody that's in small business, uh, especially if you're in uh, technology transfer, you're developing technology, and you'd like to sell it. Uh, or get the Air Force to buy it uh, and use it or the Department of Defense, right? The Air Force has stood up a new organization called AFWorks. Um, they, this summer, they did uh, their Agility Prime, which is um, uh, electronic vertical takeoff and landing uh, type of uh, development to try to, or what they call orbs, to try to uh, uh, better connected with uh, businesses around the country. Um, the uh, they, they've, you know, they've had some new leadership here uh, just recently, and I think they're really trying to be more agile, uh, more open. Um, they're trying to, to work a little bit more at the speed of industry, which for the federal government is generally those, those terms don't mix. You know, you don't think of the federal government as being agile. Uh, and in most cases, you probably don't think of the federal government necessarily as being innovative. Uh, but those are the two things, really, that they're going to have to figure out if the Department of Defense and particularly the Air Force really, truly wants to to do what their national strategy says. Right. I mean, they're they're trying to compete with uh, what they consider to be near peer adversaries. The only way to do that is to be able to be more agile, and more innovative in the way you think, uh, the way that you address the problems. Um, and in particular, when it comes to, you know, things like cyber, right, it, it's you have to have that. Uh, I'll go back to that diversity of thought. You have to have those kind of those kind of people working for you and you have to give them the freedom really to be able to, to do those kinds of things. Um, you know, when you think of the culture that uh, that permeate the different services, one of the things that we sort of used to joke about in the Air Force was that if it wasn't written in the regulation or the AFI, you know, then you couldn't do it. 
ships within the Navy, you know, uh, they kind of looked at it like if, if it, you know, didn't say that you couldn't do it, then you probably could do it. Um, those were two different types of thought processes. And I'm not necessarily saying that either one of them is right or either one of them is wrong. But I, I think in this particular case is that the DOD and the Air Force in particular, they have to be able to adapt some of the way that the commercial sector operates. Um, they have to be able to be willing to take those risks, to take those and do some unique things. You know, there's been a lot of talk over, um, over the last uh, couple of years within the Air Force of uh, bringing in people that are experts in certain particular areas and bringing them in, you know, at a, at a fair rank as high as Colonel uh, to be able to run programs within the Air Force that uh, that that uh, d they don't otherwise have the talent or don't have the time or the ability really to develop that kind of talent. So those are kind of, I think, novel and innovative potential approaches that uh, DoD really needs to think about and needs to further develop um, if they're going to truly compete uh, at the global level. And there's no question about it. And, and Chris alluded to it, right? He said that he, he has a global team industry and and uh, the things that are going on uh, you know that affect the united states are global and you have to be able to to think at that level and be able to work at that level and so it it definitely takes it takes everybody uh, to be able to do that so don back to you thanks mark so uh we're getting short on time here so we're going to go through a quick uh, closing round, a lightning round of closing statements from our panelists. Lou, over to you first. Uh, so I guess one thing if I wanted to highlight would be ITOT. You need to sit down and understand OT before you can implement security into it. Uh, basically, if not, you're going to shut down everything. So so you need to build that relationship and the trust uh, that you're not out to just, you know, check a box on your security checklist and make sure everything's going. So, uh, Thanks, Lou. Mark? Um, so I first of all, just say thank you again uh, to everybody that put this together for um, in a really great program um, and uh, the uh, thanking all of my panel mates here for uh, giving up the, their precious time from their businesses to be able to do this. I think I'll just add, you know, a quick one of that the the, uh, the the Department of Defense and the Air Force, um, they just really need to, uh, and, and this is a, an incredibly overused term, but I'll say it anyways, right? They need to be able to think more outside the box. They really need to be able to, to figure out ways um, to, uh, to be agile and to be innovative. And that may require some significant change to some of the rules that the federal government currently operates under but uh, they need to work with Congress and they need to try to get those things done. Thanks again. Thanks, Mark. Max? Yes, uh, just uh, I would second that. Just thank you everyone for, for my uh, you know, panelists here and also would love to take any questions afterward. But, uh, but I agree with, with Mark. Uh, in order for our country to do better, in order to enter into this, I'm calling it the era of innovation within defense, uh, we have to lower the barrier to entry in order to lower the barrier to entry, we have to delegate authority so we can actually get new kind of thinkers, people that like to fail, fail forward, fail fast. Uh, and all that takes is, 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 you know, a congressional power. We have to change the rules because we operate under legislative frameworks uh, that are very constraining when it comes to a, being a cyber professional. There's a lot of, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that, right? And, and, and so we have to figure out how do we match close to the speed of, of the commercial side by, by allowing some of those things in, right? So, um, so, so that would be my closing remarks, but would love to, would love to take any, any questions afterwards. And I think I'll pass it over to Chris. Yeah, thanks, Max. I, I think, yeah, just like everyone else, I want to thank uh, all the organizers of this of this panel uh, to share some of our experiences and thoughts. And, you know, I think my my remark is really to anyone who's who's watching this or listening who um, is is about to transition or will be transitioning to to where we are, you know, in, in, a, in a short to, to midterm term. You know, my, my time in the Air Force really afforded me with with the best experiences of my life. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am today without it. So so for those of you who are hoping to be where maybe where some of us are, join us soon. 
um, keep learning everything you can, right? Enjoy your experiences. Um, get your training while you're there. Get your college while you're there. Um, and keep an open mind when you transition. You know, as, as Mark stated, you know, we're, we're also facing global enemies and we don't have all of the answers, right? We don't, we don't have all the strict, you know, controls and processes that you may be used to. So just keep an open mind when, when you come join us and we'll be ready for you. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. I want to thank all of our panel members. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, so I don't think we're going to be able to take questions and answers, but I'm sure each one of my panelists here would be happy to take them offline. Thank you very much. So we're at HeroTech's main manufacturing building here in Auburn Hills, Michigan, setting up for the X Factory. The X Factory is all about taking today's technology and showcasing what the art of the possible is. So the X Factory is actually a, a mini factory that produces real mini computers. Users can actually step through step by step from design through to things like QA and packaging of how an actual product is designed in a, in a modern manufacturing environment. So we are showcasing over 15 to 20 different use cases that pertains to Industry 4.0. We have operator use cases where we do assembly operations. We also have use cases around material handling, tracking of materials, and of course, this is a factory, so we're measuring productivity metrics at each of the stations, which is a combination of availability, productivity, performance of the lines, as well as the quality produced by the line. So this X Factory actually allows us to demonstrate all these capabilities. Partners are key to our success. We couldn't have done this without them. Everything from the actual computers running things at the edge through to controllers and PLCs throughout the actual process are all provided by a whole ecosystem of partners bringing this technology together. We worked with EOTech, we provided uh, the facility, but in addition, provided the technology through their mobile robot uh, to do some of the material orchestration that we are showcasing in this demo. The mobile robot, it's, it's definitely one of the backbones of the, of the X Factory. Without it, uh, we would have to resort to either manually transporting bins back and forth or a very basic AGV solution. I'm really excited about bringing all these years of PTC expertise that our collective team has and uh, combining that with our latest and greatest technology and effectively show the entire digital thread. So from engineering all the way to down to manufacturing. The ability to have one demonstrator and showcase to bring everything that PTC does in one place I think is fantastic. What gets me most excited about my job at FlowServe is the level of investment in new technology and new ideas around services. We're trying to use technology at every point to make our services more efficient, more reliable, and more focused on safety. We've got 200 plus service centers around the world, so we're always within, let's say, three hours of a customer site. Uh, and we leverage that broad network, whether it's parts, services, repairs, and connect everybody so that we can serve the customer as effectively as possible. The aha moment for us was really around one particular client that we had. Uh, we detected cavitation within a couple of weeks of applying the solution at this customer site. Uh, we saved them potentially $1.6 million by detecting that failure right away. Uh, and we potentially saved them up to $16 million if we had not detected that within 45 minutes. FlowServe service solution around IoT is really built on three different things. It's really built on the analytics for predictive analytics that we've developed over the last couple of years. It's really dependent on the equipment in the field that we instrument and, and pull the information from, and it's dependent highly on the service that we provide to the customer. And all of that is connected through our IoT platform. ThingWorks helps our product be more competitive because of the ease of use in terms of laying it out for our customers. It's scalable, it was easy to train on, um, it's highly user friendly in terms of the look and feel of the application. So all in all, it was a pretty simple decision for us to move forward with that. The IoT service solution has really improved our customer relationships with those customers that we've engaged with. Um, I'm surprised actually at the amount of interaction that it's created with our clients because there's many more questions, there's inquiries about what's happening to the pumps or the valves. Um, so we're thrilled about the future of this. It ties a better connection point for us in terms of the world of service. The future of work is evolving. 
the new normal is more virtual than ever before. Demanding new methods of communication, instruction, and support for frontline workers. Augmented reality, AR, enables a better, faster, and more efficient means of transferring knowledge across the enterprise. PTC's Vuforia AR Enterprise Suite provides solutions for a variety of use cases and industry verticals, empowering frontline workers with the critical information they need to do their jobs, and helping customers embrace the shift to the new virtual ways of working. Vuforia Chalk makes over-the-shoulder remote collaboration and assistance easy inside and outside of your organization. It combines live video, audio, and the ability for both participants to annotate their shared view. This means experts can provide precise instruction as effectively as if they were on site. Vuforia Expert Capture makes it easy to capture the tacit domain knowledge of experienced workers to create step-by-step -step instructions that can be scaled across the enterprise, quickly making the best practice of experts the standard practice for all employees. Vuforia Studio efficiently transforms existing 3D CAD, animated sequences, and IoT data into intuitive and interactive work and training instructions tailored to specific product configurations, boosting employee understanding, safety, and efficiency for complex tasks. Vuforia Engine delivers market-leading computer vision technology, helping developers around the world deliver unique, engaging, and highly memorable mobile experiences for virtually any use case, accelerating sales cycles, driving customer engagement, and differentiating products and brands. Vuforia AR, transforming the way industrial manufacturers empower frontline workers and drive business continuity. So we're at Herotech's main manufacturing building here in Auburn Hills, Michigan, setting up for the X-Factory. The X-Factory is all about taking today's technology and showcasing what the art of the possible is. So the X-Factory is actually a, a mini factory that produces real mini computers. Users can actually step through step by step from design through to things like QA and packaging of how an actual product is designed in a, in a modern manufacturing environment. So we are showcasing over 15 to 20 different use cases that pertains to Industry 4.0. We have operator use cases where we do assembly operations. We also have use cases around material handling, tracking of materials, and of course, this is a factory, so we're measuring productivity metrics at each of the stations, which is a combination of availability, productivity, performance of the lines, as well as the quality produced by the line. So this X Factory actually allows us to demonstrate all these capabilities. Partners are key to our success. We couldn't have done this without them. Everything from the actual computers running things at the edge through to controllers and PLCs throughout the actual process are all provided by a whole ecosystem of partners bringing this technology together. We worked with EOTech, we provided uh, the facility, but in addition, provided the technology through their mobile robot uh, to do some of the material orchestration that we are showcasing in this demo. The mobile robot, it's, it's definitely one of the backbones of the, of the X Factory. Without it, uh, we would have to resort to either manually transporting bins back and forth or a very basic AGE solution. I'm really excited about bringing all these years of PTC expertise that our collective team has and uh, combining that with our latest and greatest technology and effectively show the entire digital thread. So from engineering all the way to down to manufacturing. The ability to have one demonstrator and showcase to bring everything that PTC does in one place, I think is fantastic. What gets me most excited about my job at FlowServe is the level of investment in new technology and new ideas around services. We're trying to use technology at every point to make our services more efficient, more reliable, and more focused on safety. We've got 200 plus service centers around the world, so we're always within, let's say, three hours of a customer site. Uh, and we leverage that broad network, whether it's parts, services, repairs, and connect everybody so that we can serve the customer as effectively as possible. The aha moment for us was really around one particular client that we had. 
Uh, we detected cavitation within a couple of weeks of applying the solution at this customer site. Uh, we saved them potentially $1.6 million by detecting that failure right away. Uh, and we potentially saved them up to $16 million if we had not detected that within 45 minutes. FlowServe service solution around IoT is really built on three different things. It's really built on the analytics for predictive analytics that we've developed over the last couple of years. It's really dependent on the equipment in the field that we instrument and, and pull the information from, and it's dependent highly on the service that we provide to the customer. And all of that is connected through our IoT platform. ThingWorks helps our product be more competitive because of the ease of use in terms of laying it out for our customers. It's scalable, it was easy to train on, um, it's highly user friendly in terms of the look and feel of the application. So all in all, it was a pretty simple decision for us to move forward with that. The IoT service solution has really improved our customer relationships with those customers that we've engaged with. Um, I'm surprised actually at the amount of interaction that it's created with our clients because there's many more questions, there's inquiries about what's happening to the pumps or the valves. Um, so we're thrilled about the future of this. It ties a better connection point for us in terms of the world of service. No trip to Dayton would be complete without a visit to the Oregon District with its Newcomb's Tavern, named after the very first bar in Dayton. But one of my favorite spots down here used to sit on this property. It was called Sloopy's, probably named after the Ohio State University Buckeyes fight song, Hang On Sloopy. It was here in the mid 90s where I met aircraft pilots for the first time. But these pilots were not speaking English. They were speaking Russian. What were Russian pilots doing in Dayton, Ohio in the mid-90s, you ask? Well, they were here with the Russian Federation supporting the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords that ended the war in Bosnia. How amazing is it that the birthplace of aviation was chosen as the site to realize peace in another country? Up next is a panel to talk about the business realization and value of Industry 4.0. Thank you, Yvonne. My name is Patrick Soler, and uh, I'll be moderating the panel today. I'm the general manager for Alton Technology. Um, we're an engineering services company, and uh, we'll be discussing the smart functionality in um, today's environment. With us today, uh, we have Kimberly Claven. Kimberly is the founder of Knotbox Creation and is a strategy and connected products consultant. Uh, she delivers strategies for applications and embedded solutions and in Internet of Things and uh, tailors the engineering approach to the value of the consumer as well as uh, her clients. Um, after that, we have um, Doug McCollum. Doug is the CIO of the city of Dublin, and um, Doug has been involved in a lot of smart city projects around central Ohio, including the Route 33 Innovation Corridor. He's also been involved with IT workforce development, expanding broadband and uh, connected and autonomous vehicles, as well as blockchain in government. Uh, next, we have Captain Robert Tai. Uh, Rob is with Siemens and the Director of Business Development, and he's responsible for the growing, implementing uh, U.S. military depot uh, readiness, as well as leading efforts to create digital twins of the naval shipyards, air depots, and military de depots. Rob brings almost 25 years of experience with the U.S. Navy as a retired captain, as well as Civil Engineering Corps officer uh, who worked on infrastructure, energy, and environmental programs. And then finally, we have uh, Major General Retired Brent Baker. He's with PTC, and his responsibility is to ensure PTC's amazing out-of-the-box software solutions uh, are provided to customers, ensuring immediate and significant value. Um, PTC remains a thought leader in federal aerospace and defense, and um, prior to that, Major General Baker was the Vice Commander of the Air Force Material Command at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base right here in Ohio. So our panel uh, is mostly based on um, 
a quite, quite a wide variety of smart technologies that are out there. And um, we will be touching on some of those so that um, you'll get a better understanding of what trends um, our companies are facing as well as manufacturers. And with the constraints of COVID-19 pandemic, it's forcing um, manufacturers and supply chain strategies to really accelerate the adoption of these digital technologies. Um, so I put a slide together to show some of those emerging trends. And you can see that on the next slide where you're seeing um, the influence of increasing labor shortages, uh, forced closure of factories, disruptions in delivery routes and logistics hubs due to lockdowns. Uh, along with evolving customer behavior, um, you know, are some of the major factors that are driving companies to adopt some of these digital technologies. Um, some of them that have the maximum benefit include artificial intelligence, big data, blockchain, digital twins, and robotics. And companies and government agencies are leveraging these to create new disruptive uh, product offerings and um, service and business models. So what I'd like to do is jump right in with, uh, with Brent Baker. And Brent, can you share with us some of the smart industry trends affecting the federal aerospace and defense? For example, like data analytics or government or some of those that you're seeing out there. You bet. Hey, Pat, thank you. And uh, thanks everyone for this opportunity to speak this afternoon. If uh, you could pull up my slides, I'll go ahead and uh, get started. Okay, so uh, just a couple things to think about, you know, right up front. I like to kind of start maybe big and uh, scale down, but, you know, the federal aerospace and defense landscape, it is changing and it's really changing very quickly. I like to tell folks in this space, you know, uh, a model we have is dream big, start small and scale fast. But uh, there's some amazing trends going on. You know, we're in a, a second space race, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of new threats out there from you know, large actors, asymmetri asymmetrical actors. There's a huge skills, skills gap now as people retire. Uh, our partners are playing larger roles. A lot of RD is being pushed into industry. And then you take all of that and you throw the COVID-19 uh, on top of that. And I like to tell folks, I think a lot of these trends were already happening but COVID has definitely accelerated them. So, so in our thought, in our process is you really have to start with value first. And that, that to me is really unlocking the value. Start with uh, really the end in mind and the business case. And then so, some of the technology that's out there uh, is absolutely amazing. And so, you know, a lot of folks ask like, can you retire? What was one of the things you noticed? And what I really noticed, quite frankly, is a lot of the technology that we need to solve some of our problems is readily readily available. And so I, I think, you know, you really have to have differentiators with teeth. And to, to me, this, you got to think the entire life cycle now end to end. It's not just about design. It's just not about systems engineering uh, or even maintenance. It's really about thinking of this process really end to end. Uh, and that's the other thing, too, is you really need really good partners. I, I don't think anyone can really do this by themselves as you've got to have the right partners to be able to really make digital engineering work uh, from end to end. And then the other thing too, that one of the really largest trends is folks are really starting to think about how we get these solutions uh, out of on-premise into a cloud solution. Next slide. So, so we, we really look at these in about, we've kind of boiled them down to five really big areas. One is digital factory. Uh, this is an amazing trend that you, there's many names for it, Industry 4.0, Brilliant Factory, Smart Factory. Uh, but this digital factory, uh, th this trend is happening and it's happening now and it's happening fast. You know, for instance, my, my company, PTC, we have helped digitize over 2,000 factories around the globe. And I tell people that, you know, people are amazed that, that just one company has done that many factories. Uh, the other thing is digital engineering. Uh, everyone is talking about digital engineering. Most of you probably saw Dr. Roper's discussion uh, last week or week before around digital engineering. DOD released a, a really good brochure on that. But digital engineering is really occurring across all federal aerospace and defense from commercial airlines 
uh, even into the major OEMs. I, I also mentioned the cloud. Uh, a few years ago, people were talking a little bit about the cloud, but they weren't necessarily really interested in it. Well, today, the cloud and cloud adoption uh, is very significant. And of course, with Jedi still pending, you know, folks are really figuring out what can we put in the cloud. Uh, and that's very important. The other one I would mention is additive manufacturing. A few years ago, I, I like to call that a mini wave. You know, it was small. People used to print things, set up on their desk and say, hey, isn't that cool and really unique. Uh, but today, uh, companies are doing adding manufacturing uh, really all over and all over the globe in all processes and even in some safety of flight areas. But additive manufacturing is really, a, it's really a game changer. It's going to be very disruptive technology. And then the last one I would mention is just knowledge retention. You know, we have an older workforce now or more senior workforce. A lot of folks are, are leaving the, uh, the industry and especially in manufacturing a lot of young folks are coming in. It's very hard to attract and retain and train these young folks. So we just believe like this knowledge retention, the way we attract, hire, and train people is going to be significantly different today than it was, you know, just even five years ago. Okay, if I could go to my next slide. And I, I would just mention that, you know, a lot of folks like to say, well, this technology is coming. It's coming down the road. But I, I will just mention it is here uh, and it is here in a big way. A great example is we just uh, signed a, a deal with the United States Navy have seen around digital thread, digital twin. Uh, and it's, re it's really replacing a lot of their old outdated government uh, system, GOT systems. And um, so this is an example of DOD really embracing, again, we talk about digital thread, digital twin, IOT, digital engineering, but this is an example of one, uh, you know, customer, a DOD organization that says, you know what, we're going to do this digital thread end-to-end -end solution. And so uh, these trends I mentioned, I guess my final point is, I just want to make sure folks understand that these are things coming down the road, they're here today and here in a big way. Thanks. Yeah, I think that uh, definitely the, uh, a lot of the adoption of digital technologies is happening at a at a much faster pace. And um, Rob, um, I know you've um, been working on some of those smart scenarios at the depot level. Can you share with us some of the things that you've done uh, around the digital twins? No, thank you, Pat. Appreciate it. So uh, we're currently. Um, working to create digital models of the Navy shipyards and the Naval Air Depots. Um, what, what we have found is, you know, what, what are the reasons that we would want to improve the throughput or how would you uh, improve the throughput at these depots? And, and, and capturing or having a connected work uh, floor where you have machines, you know, connected to the business systems of of these depots of these shipyards is is increasingly important, and as uh, Brent just mentioned, that uh, that there are a few reasons actually to do this. One of them is capturing tribal knowledge. Um, there is a there is an older workforce out there. There were challenges in hiring in the depots for decades, and then you have this new workforce coming up. So. Uh, digitally capturing the knowledge of your senior workforce and putting that in the form that the younger workforce can can use is important. The, the skill, the, the things that are noticed by the senior workforce uh, could be items uh, missed by the younger workforce while, while reassembling ships, aircraft, tanks, etc. Um, another reason for having a, a connected uh, shop is just maintaining and managing the, the equipment you have out on the floor. And uh, what, what we've noticed is that there is, that there could be better uh, information provided to leadership as to how often certain equipment is used, who's using that equipment and for what purpose. And all that leads back to a quality assurance, quality control, and a, a feedback mechanism to the to the artisans about uh, you know how the work is being performed and and how you can track work. Uh, connected workforce also feeds into your ERP uh, uh, 
connected uh, equipment, excuse me, feeds into your ERP and your MES systems. And therefore you can track repair going through the, through, through the, uh, the depots. And, and it's, and it's really about the throughput of the depots. What is, uh, it, what, what can improve that throughput? And until you start tracking the data, that becomes difficult. What do you do with all this data is also uh, really important. And creating digital models or digital twins of the depot of the repair process, which is it's different than an object. It's, it's the actual repair process, which is resource constrained by people, equipment, material, um, and, and also constrained by the, the processes of the, of the depots themselves, uh, the, their rules and regulations. Um, having a digital twin of that and then being able to accurately reflect what's actually going on in the depot and then using that digital twin to do what if scenarios is we found is important. When depots want to buy new equipment or make major infrastructure upgrades and repairs, it's great to have a digital twin to test that theory and make sure that it's delivering the goals and the metrics that uh, the service wants. Um, and that's really important because dollars have always been tight and they're still tight now. And before you spend tens, hundreds or billions of dollars on a new depot upgrade, you need to know how and you need to have the assurance that's going to uh, give you what you're looking for. Um, so, Rob, do you, so you have a slide for um, like a three oh, yeah. visualization. Um, maybe Thanks. we can put it's that up. Nice. Is that a um, is this a representation of what you mentioned as a as a digital twin? No, thanks, Pat. That, that's exactly right. So this slide and uh, in, in here, it's not animated, but when it's animated, it shows the people, the equipment and uh, the material storage moving through the uh, moving through a factory. And this is just uh, any kind of factory. Um, this is uh, this is the glossy version. This is the three dimensional one to help. Uh, leadership visualize what's going on. But it's not, again, it's not just the people, it's the material coming into the factory, where it's stored afterwards, and how things are done efficiently. Um, and, and, and capturing uh, specifically the workforce is really important. Uh, that, that's usually a, a big constraint is the skill level of the workforce and, and where those people are. Uh, we, we've also found there's a lot of older equipment in the depots that can't necessarily be uh, purchased new or up, upgraded uh, and bought new, uh, so that that equipment can be um, can be advanced, modernized. But but you'll always have an artisan working with that equipment. So we see the the there's a lot of factory automation, tracking of materials, uh, and 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 then data collection that would help improve the throughput of our shipyards. Uh, air and uh, land depots. Uh, and so, Pat, I, I, we, we really think it's important that the, uh, the depots um, become more digitally friendly. Yeah, and it, I can see how with a, uh, from a learning aspect, if you have a, a digital uh, model or three-dimensional model, you'll be able to train people in a more effective manner. You'll be able to communicate what the process flow should be. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. And I know we talked a lot about, you know, data and the importance of that and also that workforce development. And um, Doug, you know, you're a CIO of a large city that has been implementing, you know, kind of a major um, smart city, smart corridor project. Um, can you talk about maybe some of those lessons learned around you know, that data governance and workforce development, and maybe even touch on the blockchain work that Dublin is doing? Uh, absolutely. Is that all? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can, can we bring up, a, there's a slide describing the uh, 33 Smart Mobility Corridor, and if we could pull that up, I'd appreciate it. And I want to express agreement with everything that Rob and Brent just said. And I hope our audience and us as a panel can draw alignment between these different things when we talked about doing this panel. Uh, you know, when you get down to it, there are very little differences between a city, a factory, 
a university campus, you know, large institutions. And that's what this is about. Um, I hope that people will think of a city as an enterprise. And uh, I, as a technologist, often think of a city as a stack, uh, you know, a technology stack. And I just uh, correct you a little bit uh, there, Pat. Uh, city of Dublin is a small city, not a large city, but big enough uh, to keep us all confused and, and trying to keep everything in good order. Um, just briefly, the, uh, well, as briefly as I can, the 33 Smart Mobility Corridor, if folks have not heard of it, is a 35 mile stretch of fiber. The intent there is uh, to put an infrastructure in place that uh, makes it possible for the testing of connected and autonomous vehicles uh, and a number of other goals. Uh, uh, from an infrastructure point of view, it's a redundant fiber loop uh, that includes a 432 strand fiber cable that we're splitting up between the partners of the project. Um, it's about 98 RSUs or roadside units. Uh, it utilizes uh, uh, a, a wireless standard to communicate with the vehicles, dedicated short range communications, DRC, DSRC and hundreds and hundreds of onboard units that go in the vehicles themselves, uh, which communicate uh, to them. <clears throat> we have a couple of opportunities to test some uh, technologies or really some data sharing kind of uh, and analysis kinds of things. As an example, a red light warning, uh, pedestrian crossing warnings, uh, those kinds of things. One of the things that connected and autonomous vehicles have not been measuring that much yet are things like near misses and patterns of what's happening at some intersections uh, where we think we know what's going on, but what we really measure is accidents and injuries. We don't measure the effectiveness of that intersection and how it's been planned out. And so this is the generation and gathering of data that's gonna allow us to do analytics at a far higher level than we have before. And once again, calling back to the concept of, uh, you know, the city as an enterprise, we often think of a city as, as unrelated operations and activities and technologies. We need to begin to think of it, <clears throat> as has been said, like a shipyard or a big battle cruiser or, or something enclosed that we can actually measure and, and work with. Uh, the project includes a human machine interface so that drivers can be communicated with and city staff can be communicated with about the data that's being gathered on essentially mobility. This is an opportunity to do uh, multiple environments. So not only rural or not only an urban environment, but ex-urban and, and rural, so that um, the equipment goes outside of the city of Dublin. Uh, it is managed by a council of governments that includes the city of Dublin, the city of Marysville, Union <laughs> County, and the Union County Port Authority. And so we have these kind of uh, uh, different types of environments, even different types of governments, that if you could test your vehicles and your data and analytics within them, uh, we feel you get a much richer uh, kind of uh, experience. Uh, other partners of the project include the Ohio Department of Transportation, Drive Ohio, uh, Federal Highway Administration, the U.S. Department of, of Transportation, uh, Honda R&D, the Transportation Research Center, Battelle, the Ohio State University Center for Automotive Research, uh, Logan County, and we also partner with uh, uh These technologies and infrastructure allows, essentially the project is about making a smart infrastructure. I've been doing infrastructure for a long, long time. And you, know, you hook wires up to computers and, and you build roads and infrastructure is kind of a, a dead technology in, in theory. We're trying to build a smart infrastructure that uh, is, uh, a lot more innovative. Obviously, a key goal is improving safety. Uh, this project actually also improves fiber connectivity. So while the, the goal here is kind of smart mobility, the laying of fiber in the interest of smart mobility actually extends broadband networks that can be used for all sorts of different uh, smart activities. I don't have too much time to talk about uh, the different kinds of mobility, but it includes more than just vehicles or, or uh, automobile vehicles and, and trucks. Uh, we also have an opportunity for unmanned aerial vehicles. And so there's a lot of drone
have when we're trying to add uh, maybe the user experience and um, what the customers might be expecting. We may have we may have uh, lost Kimberly there for a moment too. So well, you have you have me. I don't know how long I was out. <laughs> I okay. Do apologize. Yeah, 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 Doug, you did you did uh, come out a little bit. Oh, there she's coming back now. So okay. Kimberly, are you are you there? You're on mute, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think she might be frozen too. There she goes. Okay, so am I back? There you go. Yep, you're back now. There we go. Okay, good. Yeah. So, was, so Doug was right when my time you, comes up, I get muted. Uh huh. So you, I don't know if you heard the the last portion or towards the end of uh, Doug's discussion, but he was talking about like all of the different um, partnerships that are involved in. Uh, the Route 33 corridor, whether it's the government sector or the private sector. And I know you've created a lot of, um, been involved in a lot of non-traditional partnerships. And also, you know, a lot of these smart initiatives involve a lot of the customer expectations and the user experience. So maybe, can you, can you talk a little bit about, like maybe some of those lessons learned from some of those non-traditional partnerships? Sure, sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you, Pat. And yeah, the, I love this panel because it really is encompassing all different aspects of connected technology. Um, so I think I actually have some slides as well. If we want to pop those up. By the way, I've had a first in conferences. My pen literally exploded as I was taking notes. So there's a high chance that I have black all over my face. So. <laughs> Not so far. You look good. Okay, good, good. Yeah, it's good. like whoa. Um, so yeah, so customer expectations are changing, and they're they're changing so quickly. How do you, as companies, uh, keep with that? How do you keep agile enough that you can keep up with the consumers? And that's really through this connected technology and all the data, as we mentioned previously, that's coming out of that and uh, getting the right data out. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some how companies are accomplishing that in industries that may be out of your own. Um, but this is really a B2C example, which may not be as applicable as B2B in some cases, but we're going to sort of extrapolate it into B2B. So this is a person trying to get to the hospital. Um, she potentially drove there and it had uh, with an autonomous vehicle. There's a smart parking meter. Um, she's all connected within this district connectivity on being able to get there. And there's all these layers of technology. Now in a B2B sense, this could be somebody on a factory line who's trying to accomplish a task, um, and potentially a, the line went down and there was four hours of troubleshooting what happened, you know, so these, the connected technology and connecting these people and the things and the data and the places is really helping with that ease of getting someplace or accomplishing a task on a factory line and uh, making it really simple. And I love what D Doug said. He said, you know, with a shipyard, we have an enclosed space, um, you know, where you can kind of take some measurables and how do we do that? And I, I think that we're going from having industries to having experiences as our closed space. So rather than having a car or having an object, a washing machine, instead we will be measuring by human experience through this action of going from point A to B or doing a task. Um, so we're gradually going to that. But to talk a little bit about partnerships, if we can go to the next slide. So here are some examples of some partnerships that I think are pretty fascinating. And there's, there's a ton more. Um, but these are, like I said, more B2C type examples. So Google and Levi come together. Uh, to make a jacket. And I've been following this one for years. It was originally called the Jacquard Project, and they still left Jacquard in the, in the name of the jacket. But it's a jacket that has a um, touch, set, touch sensor on the sleeve, so you can change the radio station, you can answer a phone, 
et cetera. And that was the reason I really liked that one is because it was a very early partnership of two companies that you normally wouldn't think coming together. And they really did struggle a lot of initially with culture and mostly um, like scale because you can't wash the piece that goes on the coast to figure out how you how can people take it off. Um, so there were a lot of challenges in that respect. Another one is the Alphabet Logic P and G example. They were at CES this year demonstrating this diaper. And what it does is it, it it's got a Velcro with a sensor on it. And the sensor feeds wetness and sleep patterns to your parents, to the parent's phone, and it does auto subscription reorder, et cetera. Um, again, a lot of cultural uh, challenges here because you've got a traditional company doing product development meshing with a technology company who generally probably don't even have the same type of project management. One's doing waterfall, one's doing agile. So how do you get these two together to operate at the same pace? and learn each other's ways of working. Um, it's a really complicated thing to do, but uh, people have great processes to go about it. So, and as you can see from the success of, of the diaper, the B, uh, BMW Louis Vuitton, that one's just, that was kind of interesting. There's a couple that are kind of one-off interesting ones that you'll see out there. Um, this was luggage that they made specific for your BMW. Um, it very much fits, and there's all sorts of fancy bells and whistles behind it. But it's kind of neat that these two came together and said, hey, we're luxurious brands. Let's come together and do something. And so there's luggage that's specific to the car. That's interesting. So Uber and Spotify, um, this one, you can play your list automatically when you're on an Uber trip. So you pre-populate it. And when you get in the Uber, you're jamming out, and you're going to wherever you're going, you're ready to to hit the dance floor the minute you get to wherever you're going. Um, but there are all sorts of partnerships of this sort where it's companies that traditionally are into this product that maybe isn't connected, most likely is not, but then they partner with a technology company or somebody offering a technology company to get an all-encompassing experience. But we're getting that even more and more so, not just with a couple companies come together. And to Doug's uh, point, especially I'm, I'm quite familiar with the 33 Innovation Corridor, it's not just about the autonomous vehicles. It's about the ease of travel and all the aspects that come around it. So there's a lot of partners that have to come to that table that, from the different fields and areas to make it happen. So if you go to the next slide, really what consumers are going for, and this is in the B2C and the B2B market, is that rather than being in this if mode, like if my car breaks or if I trip when I'm working or I hurt my back when I'm working, I want good medical insurance to going to avoid, to avoid my back being broken at work. Tell me when I'm lifting a box that's too heavy. Um, so all of this technology is helping us to, to really get to the customer uh, um, expectations of preventive and uh, being proactive with, with where we're going. So yeah, that's what, that's what the, yeah. I had to talk about. Well, I think that's, I think that's very fascinating and, and really even, shows that the private sector innovations could apply even to the military side of things. You know, I definitely could see, you know, Air Force pilots using the the sensors that uh, in the uniforms and things like that, or uh, the equipment automatically telling them to avoid uh, uh, collisions or uh, giving them basic safety messages that might be there and things like that. Um, I'm sure a lot of our audience is kind of figuring, you know, all these things are great, but you know, how do they get started? Um, and Rob, you know, what what do you think is uh, a place that um, people normally start when they're when they're thinking about some of these smart initiatives? How do they how do they get started? No, thanks, Pat. So, what we've seen is most most of the of the work we're doing, most of the initiatives start actually small. Um, at, uh, at Hill Air Force Base, we were working a digital model where they had a, a specific plating shop and they wanted to um, know what the, the NEPA um, scenarios would be. So it was modeling a plating shop uh, to see if they move things around, how, how could they conform. Um, 
when we were working at uh, the Marine Corps Air Base uh, for at FRC East in Cherry Point, they, they wanted to model a blade shop and a, and a hydraulic pump shop um, with the new uh, new aircraft coming on. They wanted to make sure they had the throughput, or, or would they have to build a new building, military construction approved by Congress, in order to make the help the work throughput? So again, we modeled just a, a, a couple of components there for them to kind of show how they could do it without new construction. Um, at Corpus Christi Air Depot, again, uh, Army Depot, again, we're looking at doing uh, a plating shop again for an energy savings performance contract. So how could we reduce energy? How can we make the cost lower and, and have a better ROI uh, for the factory? Um, what what NAVC did with the four shipyards is they went big. <laughs> uh, so the, there, theirs was a, a all four shipyards, and they wanted wanted us to model uh, an availability or or the work throughput uh, through the shipyard when it's fully loaded, and that was to um, uh, because their concern was infrastructure. What new infrastructure was needed at the shipyards? They wanted the shipyards to be common and uh, have the same work practices, and so we were modeling how the infrastructure affects all four shipyards. Uh, so that, that's a much larger project. Um, and, and Nav Air, based on, on, on the air depots, going back to the air depots, they came back and said, okay, let's do all three air depots. We now have confidence in, in, in a few processes. Let's, let's look at the whole thing. So, you know, it, it, usually they start small. Industry also starts uh, usually small and leads larger. Um, I would also say that it's it, it's an it, it's a it's a commitment in time by you know the depot uh, or industry because they have to validate the work that's being that we're putting our teams putting together and that's that's um, there's a lot of buy in there there it, it's uh, it can be difficult for the workforce to accept sometimes uh, also every every uh, factory thinks that they're unique and they are but there's commonalities too and so working through the process um, is important and we need to work through each each shop each uh, depot um, and and you can't just you can't just uh, cookie cutter uh, what you learned at one across others you, you need to work with all the depots so oh. there's a learning process as well um, gotcha so so coming back to you, Pat, I, it, a lot of times they start small, they, so even when they start big, we, it, it's, a, it's an introduction and a learning yeah. curve. Uh, right. Yeah, and I can, I can imagine, um, you know, if, if you're a champion of one of these packs, you're going to have to challenge the status quo, but then also get stakeholders to adopt that digital transformation strategy. And... Doug, um, when you were looking at, you know, the the initiation of the smart corridor, how did you um, kind of get buy-in from your stakeholders, and did you have to challenge people with the status quo? I mean, normally smart roadways aren't aren't a new thing out there. Yeah, I think what we were challenged by is just not a lot of great knowledge about what smart mobility was as a concept. So there was a learning curve. I do want to go back to something Brent said in, in the beginning. He said really starting huge at the at the universe level and just really saying, let's just look at the whole big thing and think from that perspective. And then also thinking about extracting value. He said those two things. The other thing then is then starting really, really small on things that you can prove and those kinds of things. We did have a grant opportunity. And so I have to give kudos to the federal government for understanding that local governments were not going to just move forward on these things. They put money on the table. And so that really helps as federal highway administration saying, if you do these things, we will put up this money. And that helps local communities see the value behind what they're trying to do. Um, but the barriers, some of the barriers that we face, we also really, we were talking about economic development. We were not talking about connected and autonomous vehicles. When you combine a value like economic development, attracting or retaining 
companies that are in automotive manufacturing, uh, those kinds of things that we have in Ohio with something like safety, public safety, driver safety. Um, you know, we talk a lot about distracted driving and those kinds of things. Also construction worker safety, also truck driver safety in terms of knowledge of, of where they can pull over and rest and all of those things were on the table. Um, that made it very easy for us to come together as a group of communities and realize that we needed to put our differences down and focus on this opportunity because it really is a regional opportunity to extract value. Hmm. That's very interesting. You know, when, when you talk about leaders trying to put some of their differences aside, um, it kind of makes me wonder like how do leaders succeed in a disruptive world like this when things are changing so quickly? And, you know, Kimberly, when, you know, when you're working in the private sector, how did you see like some of those leaders, you know, make changes and really figure out how to succeed when things are changing so quickly on the technology side? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think I, I imagine being towards the end of this conference, people are thinking, oh my gosh, this seems like a lot. I don't even know how we would go about this. And so it start, you start to put up the walls of like, it's just, we can't do this. Especially when you start thinking, I think one of the number one challenges that has companies stop is the issue of privacy, data and privacy, um, and also data ownership, who owns data. Those pieces will almost just shut down innovation because we don't want to tackle it. We don't know how to tackle it. It just seems like too much. Um, so my, I mean, my advice to leaders would be to have that no constraints mindset uh, to be able to work through it. Because there are professionals that have gone through this that know the process and things that you could do. I wouldn't um, uh, automatically just shut out the idea of doing anything connected for your organization or going this approach of digital strategy. Um, but the other thing I would say, um, so some of the top challenges our scale, privacy, process, culture, and talent. Um, mm. So that seems like a lot. Oh, there's just a little bit. Those are the only challenges four, you got. Five, yeah. yeah, yeah, no worries. Process, that's easy to talk about, right? Yeah. Um, but my recommendation to get through this is really the thin slicing, and I Doug kind of touched base on this too. Don't try and boil the ocean initially. Come up with that little piece, well first, Spend a lot of time on strategy. That is one thing. Dumping, jumping into development can sometimes be detrimental because you really do need to develop a really good value stories, road mapping, um, data monetization strategy, what data you need, what you, sensors you're going to need to get the data. So all of that has to be up front, which is all part of that process. But taking it in thin slices, coming up with a way to just do a little bit to get your feet wet and then growing upon that as you go and getting better at the process and sort of growing it within the organization or with other projects. Um, the other thing that I see a lot too is the, how should we acquire companies? Should we partner with companies? Should we grow an innovation center internally to do this and have kind of a growth of an innovation center? Um, companies of all sorts are doing it differently and they all have successes in their different ways. Uh, I do think the acquisition method works quite well from what I've seen. Sometimes internal innovation works, sometimes it's not as successful. Uh, it depends on how you set it up and how you empower people within the innovation center. And sometimes you uh, hire out the innovation, so consulting firms. Um, they're all great methodologies, so I wouldn't shut, those, shut any of those ideas out. But again, I would take the thin slices. And um, also, like I said, within the presentation, it's considering strategic partnerships. That's very helpful. I think it's more like the additive manufacturing approach where you're layering on as, and with the strategy, yeah. you know that you're going in the right direction. So that's very helpful. You know, and I think, you know, a lot of these in initiatives, uh, people are fearful, like you mentioned, from a leadership standpoint, and not always having all the information, but um, I know like there's a lot of benefits to adopting this digital transformation. And, you know, Brent, maybe you can address, you know, what what is the, you know, 
pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and, and what benefits can people um, uh, see by, by implementing some of these? Well, I, I think there are many benefits. One of them is this, you know, this technology is here uh, and folks at, at some point have to embrace it. You know, I, I like to tell folks, you know, at one time we used to go to work with a horse and buggy and you, you could still do that today. You could get a horse and a buggy, you could still get to work. It would be very painful, take you a long time. So we all embrace, you know, the, the automobile. Now, I'm, I'm sure there were folks at the time saying, uh, do I really want to embrace this? But you know, in the in the final analysis, a lot of this comes down to return on investment. And I think all the panel members have done an amazing job of really kind of laying that out. You really have to develop a business case. You know, and just a quick couple of you know examples we've seen. Uh, a major aerospace company is getting ready to add a lot of capital investment equipment uh, to their plant. And they did a brilliant factory IoT uh, inside their factory, and they found out they didn't need to buy anything. They just needed to utilize the equipment they had. And another great example is a major uh, aerospace company uh, decided, hey, we need to do a better job of handling baggage. And once they figured out how to do baggage handling, they said, we could use the same technology on our jet bridges. And if we can get our aircraft you know, to the jet bridge faster, get it hooked up faster, that saves millions of dollars, millions of gallons of gas and, and millions of dollars uh, you know, in cost savings as well. So. You know, to, to me, I, I think it, in the end, the reason you want to do this technology is because it is there is great, great value in doing that. And we see this all the time with folks that it is a plunge. You have to take the plunge. But uh, after they, they do it, they're, they're always thankful that they did. Oh, that's that's very helpful. You know, and um, we're we're coming up on on the end of our panel discussion. So, you know, as we're hopefully coming out of the COVID pandemic, you know, I'd like to give everybody maybe a, a chance to share some of their parting thoughts on what do you think the impact, you know, on the business value of these smart initiatives might be. Um, I did, you know, uh, have a slide that shows like some of the 10 questions for embracing like what the new normal might be. And um, so, so Doug, you know, maybe you can kick off. What do you, what do you think, um, you know, your parting thoughts there on the impact to the business value of some of these things. Sure. Uh, one of the things we're noticing or several things we're noticing from a public experience is that uh, touchlessness is becoming far more important. The ability to give people services or experiences where they don't have to be next to each other, shorter lines, distance. Uh, they don't have to touch things like, like doors and, and uh, computer screens and those kinds of things are becoming uh, pretty important. Um, also, sharing data with the public has never been more important. Uh, it, it sounds uh, trite, but the, the truth is, is that people are really freaking out. And uh, it's up to us as a public sector to provide timely, accurate information and as well as feedback loops so that uh, people can, uh, can feel confident in their public experiences. So none of those things were on your list there, but those are key things that we're noticing as a city and a local government. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Kimberly, what do you think? Might have lost Kimberly. Rob, what do you think? So we think, uh, so, excuse me, I think. So um, a digital model of, of like COVID or uh, of your factory would help you respond to uh, cases like COVID or anything else that's unexpected that comes up. And so how do you put in new, um, new processes in the face of the, the COVID-19 pandemic could be digitally modeled. If you have a surge because of an accident or, you know, you need to put higher throughput uh, through your depots can be modeled uh, so that you can react properly and send uh, the right ship to the right shipyard or the right aircraft to the right uh, air depot. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so that's the, the COVID-19 experience is teaching us, I think that, you know, th there will, there has always been things that upset your, uh, your process, the way you normally do work and how do you recover? So Excellent. thank you. Brent, Brent, what do you think? Well, you know, Pat, you ask a, an interesting question about why you should adopt this. I think COVID has really illustrated that fact 
Uh, and in some uh, regards, I said it earlier, it's really accelerated some of these trends. You know, you know a, a great example directly related to COVID, uh, when there was a, a challenge called the ventilator mm -hmm. challenge in Europe, so that those folks were able to remote, you know, collaborate remotely uh, using an online, you know, like a CAD system and then be able to train their folks using an expert capture tool, uh, which is a digital training tool. They were able to train hundreds of people literally around the globe at the same time. So, you know, I thought Rob made a really good point. You, you, sometimes you got to do some of this technology because you are preparing for some of the unknowns. Uh, and so, again, this, this type of technology it helps you better prepare uh, for the inevitable. That's great. And Kimberly, did you have one parting thought before uh, we go into break? Well, I just love what you just said because you're right. One of the things that also, besides, I love what Doug said, touchless, mobile services, remote work, all of those things are obviously big, um, transparency and data. But also this, uh, the issues with supply chain are a big piece. And so if companies had prepared for something like this through digital technology, there could be better real-time supply chain, diversification of supply chain. And um, a lot of those problems we're currently having could be allevi alleviated but if we were to have prepared with some sort of predictive analytics and doing the supply chain piece. So I just wanted to add that. I think that was in the list as uh, something that yeah. we're seeing. Because some companies yeah. are really doing great and they're, but they're suffering because they can't get the parts that they need right now. Right. Yeah, this hour went by very fast, didn't it? So I appreciate everybody participating in this panel and uh, uh, hopefully uh, everyone that uh, joined us online will uh, get a lot of value. And I think uh, we'll be leading up to a break and uh, also participating in some networking sessions later. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. See this runway behind me? On July 1st, 1931, it was redesignated as Patterson Field in honor of Lieutenant Frank Stewart Patterson, the son of Frank J. Patterson, the co-founder of the National Cash Register. Lieutenant Patterson was killed shortly before the end of World War I when his plane crashed at Wright Field. In 1948, the Patterson and Wright Fields merged and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was established. Today, with over 30,000 employees, including military, civilian, and contractors, it is the largest single-site employer in the state of Ohio, with an economic impact of $4.2 billion per year. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far and have learned something about Dayton's aviation history. Welcome back. Good afternoon and welcome to the last panel session of this year's WIT Symposium. I'm Rachel Mackey, Proposal Manager with JJR Solutions and SDVOSB headquartered in Dayton, Ohio, whose mission is to promote the health, well-being, and security of our communities and nation through management consulting and IT solutions. I'll be the moderator of the panel this afternoon. Our panel is titled Air Force Opportunities in the Digital Environment, and some of the themes of this panel will include discussion around industrial control systems and base operating support, acquisition and life cycle management, and sustainment of weapons systems, and how we manage smart factory, to name a few. We're joined by Dr. Tim Meixner, Ms. Debbie Nagai, and Mr. Randy Parker as our panelists having a wealth of expertise in leading complex organizations, helping navigate strategies in a digital environment. Dr. Tim Meixner is chief of the Air Force Sustainment Center's Information Technology Office. Dr. Meixner manages the AFSC portfolio of IT systems, facilitates the center's information system requirements management, government, governance processes, and acts as the center's senior functional for the cyber operations related to career fields. These enabling functions affect the work of approximately 33,000 Air Force sustainment personnel. Dr. Meixner began his governmental service as a stay at stay in school clerk with the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Ohio in 1991. He began his military career in 1995 when he attended the officer training school at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. He transitioned to the USAF Reserves and joined commercial industry in 2001. 
He began his civilian career in 2005 at Wright Patterson Air Force Base as a management analyst developing programmatic documentation for financial management IT systems. His career includes experience in combat readiness, deployments, and transportation operations, enterprise architecture, acquisition logistics, and program management of Air Force Material Command and Air Force Sustainment Center Systems, staff experience at Headquarters AFMC and Headquarters U.S. Air Force, and all phases of IT development and sustainment. Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Hey, thanks for the introduction. Um, you know, really, as we get into this panel, just really wanted to spend uh, most of the time uh, taking the questions, uh, but I did really want to um, uh, put an emphasis on AFSC's commitment to supporting uh, the Material Command's uh, digital campaign. We have our own digital strategy, which we'll get into, that's directly linked to that. Uh, we have a robust team that's supporting our Industry 4.0 approach and just look forward to having a great discussion with the other panelists and uh, thanks for hanging with us this last panel of the day. So uh, uh, back to you, Rachel. Great, thank you. Next is Ms. Debbie Nagai. In 2019, she retired from the Air Force after 33 years of civilian service. Ms. Nagai has ex extensive experience in product support, engineering, and logistics. While in the Air Force, she was the Division Chief of the Product Support Engineering Division within Air Force Lifecycle Management Center and was responsible for implementing new programs including predictive maintenance, additive manufacturing, and robotics to increase readiness and reduce the same uh, data analytics insight. Um, we've got the group back, but what I really wanted to hit in on this question, then we'll go back to the introduction, is um, you know, we are supporting the lines of effort under the digital campaign. Uh, one of our key aspects is not only bringing the human capital to, to that, um, we are supporting the different lines of effort within the digital campaign, uh, but we've also linked this to our digital strategy and also the congressional organic industrial base. So we have several focus areas that I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but I think we wanted to keep, probably keep bring the panel back, uh, continue with the introduction for uh, Ms. Ne Negai. Um, and so, Rachel, I think we got your back. Awesome. Well, um, let's go back to Ms. Negai and I will introduce her. So, in 2019, Ms. Debbie Negai retired from the Air Force after 33 years of civilian service. Ms. Nagai has extensive experience in product support, engineering, and logistics. While in the Air Force, she was the Division Chief of the Product Support Engineering Division within Air Force Lifecycle Management Center and was responsible for implementing new programs including predictive maintenance, additive manufacturing, and robotics to increase readiness and reduce sustainment costs. Today, Ms. Nagai is the project leader at MITRE for the Logistics in a Contested Environment Portfolio. Many of the current initiatives are focused on leveraging data in a digital environment for rapid decision making necessary to win the great power competition. Debbie, over to you. Let's head over to Mr. Randy Parker for an intro with Randy. Randall Randy Parker is the director in civil. Senior Civil Engineer, Detachment 6, Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center, forward located at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. He leads 36 personnel in liaison with Headquarters Air Force Material Command, supporting and advocating for AFM's installation commander's critical installation and mission support requirements, ensuring timely and responsive delivery of capabilities to 55 billion physical plant and fleet basis three geographically separated units, and five Air Force plants supporting 90,000 personnel. He was commissioned in 1982 as a graduate of the Air Force ROTC program at the Virginia Military Institute. He was assigned as a project civil engineering officer at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Upon separation from active duty in 1987, he was assigned as an individual localization augmentee to the civil engineer in Services School of the Air Force Institute of Technology and retired from the Air Force Reserves in June 2006. He has had a distinguished career in the Air Force with leadership posts at the EDA Air, Air Base Wing, Civil Engineering Group, 
Air Force Imperial Command and Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center. Randy, over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, so if you'll pull up the first slide, please. So uh, a lot of going on in the um, digital community. And so uh, first, I just want to make sure that our audience understands the uh, Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center as the uh, sixth center in Air Force Material Command. Next slide, please. So uh, just a couple of these charts. These are available to you um, uh, after this uh, discussion. Uh, just to give you a sense of the size of the a center. It's a $10 billion company, 77 installations worldwide, and the uh, sun never sets on uh, Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, next slide, we'll show how kind of we fit in and how we support the national defense strategy and how our installations are uh, our weapon system platforms. It's how we maintain ourselves as, as the most powerful Air Force on the planet. Next slide, please. Here's how we're organized. I just want to highlight, uh, so I work for uh, both for General Bunch. I serve on his staff as his uh, face for, as the director of installations for Air Force Material Command. Uh, but uh, for this audience, I wanted to point out the uh, text box, the Cyber Support Division, which is located down at Joint Base San Antonio, where my two-star commander Major General Wilcox also uh, works. So you can see the Enterprise Management for Base Communications Portfolio and Cyber Support Transmission Systems. Also uh, along the bottom, you can see the detachments and you can see Air Force Material Command. And so each major command is represented uh, with their installations. Next slide, please. This slide just shows uh, we're a worldwide presence, and you can uh, dissect that later. But uh, here at Wright-Patterson, we also have the uh, headquarters for the uh, Air Force uh, Installation Contracting Agency. All right, next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about uh, enterprise information technology as a service. So this is a large muscle movement that the Air Force is doing, and you consider our installations this has always been done uh, traditionally in-house. Um, we have a large uh, labor force, workforce, program managers, engineers that oversee our uh, digital community, not only computers, but phones, all things, uh, how we communicate. And so the Air Force has decided that, you know, it's time we really can't keep up this shelf life of the assets just uh, you know, we just, we can't, we can't uh, do what we need to do as an Air Force and stay ahead of the bad guys. So ultimately, uh, the enterprise IT as a service, we're basically looking to flip this whole workload and privatize it. And so uh, looking at some of the large um, capabilities that are in the, in our uh, communities uh, that are uh, globally, um, they can do it better. We have to uh, modernize the old uh, facilities, physical plant and infrastructure and capability, you know, everything, the fiber optic network, uh, the, the computers, the phone systems, and how we manage all that data. Uh, we got to get after this uh, to continue to be uh, the Air Force that we are today. Fun fact, uh, yesterday marks uh, 20 years where the, uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps stepped off and essentially uh, attempted this, and they uh, stubbed their their foot numerous times. And so the Air Force has been looking at those lessons learned, and so we want to do it obviously uh, better, faster, cheaper. And uh, ultimately, as taxpayers, we all are going to pay that bill. But it's a multi-billion-dollar acquisition that's taking place right now and over the next several years. Um, the Army is actually behind us. They're they're watching the Air Force. Of course, they're looking at the Navy model and the lessons learned there, but uh, the Army is waiting to see how the Air Force is gonna roll this out. So you can see we are uh, on this slide, modernization of, of all the assets in that domain. Um, and of course, looking at best of breed industry practices, you know, own a Verizon or AT&T capability or Microsoft, 
you know, they're all industry leaders and they all have uh, great things to uh, um, uh, in terms of capability. And so we're looking at all of those um, uh, different uh, uh, industry leaders and how to do it. And then ultimately cyber defense. So how do we protect the uh, data and the systems and uh, industrial control systems? All of that is linked. And so um, uh, this is a huge, wonderful undertaking. And I'm really delighted to see the Air Force step out on that. Next slide, please. So here's a quick picture, site picture to show us how we're going to get there. Roadmap. Um, you can see that uh, uh, all the difference in terms of uh, the six mission areas in the center of the screen under the governance and oversight. And then ultimately, um, we hope to repurpose um, those uh, that manpower and resources um, once we have uh, done this worldwide. So uh, a couple other points. Uh, right now, it's a research project. There are eight bases that are currently uh, being um, uh, worked. Uh, and over the next several years, we're looking at um, uh, essentially a $365 million in fiscal year 21, where we're rolling this program out. Uh, those bases are currently uh, Joint Base um, uh, Elmendorf Richardson in Alaska, Maxwell Air Force Base Alabama, Spangdalem Air Base in Germany, Cannon Air Force Base New Mexico, Hurlbert Air Force Base in Florida, and Pope Air Force Base, North Carolina. We're also looking as of the uh, recent uh, Enterprise IT Council uh, that just took place here uh, last month, they're talking about scaling up an additional 20 bases. So uh, depending on how this path uh, emerges, um, the success of these milestones, we're looking at actually accelerating that. So of course, you're looking at 77 bases worldwide and then, of course, the guard and reserve components. So um, uh, taking kind of the operational uh, risk perspective, you can see the risk reduction effort, uh, how we're uh, rolling this out. And you can also see at the bottom of the page, um, uh, if those of you in the business community that are interested in this kind of uh, uh, large muscle movement and acquisition, perhaps you, you own uh, – a piece of that or want to uh, partner because it's a huge undertaking and we're going to need uh, all of you to get in the game. Uh, ultimately, this capability will underpin the digital Air Force and uh, when you consider the risk to uh, this program, uh, Enterprise IT as a service, it affects the risk to all of the other Air Force programs. So we're going to do this uh, uh, smartly. We're going to uh, get after these first eight bases that I've uh, shared with you. And then after they fully delivered, I can see us accelerating the next 20 bases. And so with that, um, I look forward to uh, networking uh, opportunity and further discussion. And so back to you, Rachel. Thanks so much, Randy. Debbie, I'm going to turn it over to you. I don't think that we heard your intro. We were having some audio issues. so. Um, I'll just turn it over for, to you for a basic intro, and then we're going to jump into questions. Nope, not hearing you. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So um, <laughs> I apologize for all the network issues. It's funny. You have an IT conference, and, of course, uh, digital uh, infrastructure sometimes is the, the challenge, and, and that's perfectly a great topic as we talk about today. So I'm Debbie Nagai. I'm excited to be here today. Hopefully I can share some of the initiatives doing within um, the Air Force, um, MITRE supporting the Air Force, um, and some of the high impact areas that have to do with digital engineering. So with that, I'll turn it back over for questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Debbie. And we're going to go right back to you for this first question. And um, I think just with a little bit of the hiccups at the beginning, we'll, we'll get through some of these pretty quickly. Um, the Air Force appears to be going through significant transformation in training. This can be seen through the lens of the digital campaign and its comprehensive levels of effort. What's being done by the Air Force to ensure linkages and integration across the digital transformation to help ensure that digital stovepipes are not being created? So I'm sure during the conference, there's been a lot of discussion about the digital campaign that was sponsored by General Bunch 
and led by Major General Cooley. Um, with the six LOEs, the interesting way that they set up the LOE, very focused on, for example, workforce shaping. So ensuring that across all program offices, all um, personnel, that, that policies and training will be put in place to address workforce shaping. Same is true with policy and guidance, uh, life cycle structures and processes, standards and data. So the LOEs were set up in such a manner that they were cross-cutting into themselves. And then initiatives were set up to ensure that there was communication between the LOEs. In from a minor perspective, we are actually supporting the digital campaign heavily with the unity of effort. That is one of the focus areas that MITRE is bringing to the table is taking a look at the cross-cutting efforts and seeing how they'll, um, they'll roll across all six of the LOEs. One of the initiatives that we're working, um, it's a pathfinder called the PLM, Product Life Sector Management. And it actually impacts all of the five LOEs or six LOEs. And as we demonstrate this, we're using the B52 as our prototype platform. And as we start looking at how we digitize data, how we use data in the in digital environment, we will have to address challenges with the IT infrastructure. We're gonna to have to look at how we um, leverage the models and the tools in the digital environment, how we need to change our data and our architecture so that we can leverage the, the old data that we have as well as new data. We're gonna to have to look at new processes as we use these digital tools and how we manage our, our data, our configuration control of the engineering data, and that will all drive new policies and how we do training. So it's interesting, just as you look at a pathfinder, crosses all of those LOEs, and we'll impact each one of those as we are going through that. And I think that's what you're seeing in a lot of the pathfinders that were picked by the digital campaign. They really cross multiple LOEs and then we'll speed and, and, and form as um, the Air Force goes through and um, determines the right processes, policies that needs to be put in place to, um, to really leverage a true digital environment. Great, thank you. Debbie and Tim, this next question is a little bit of a tag up and Debbie, we're gonna go to you first and Tim would like your perspective as well on this, when we consider the advanced battle management system vision for a military internet of things, establishing a digital environment is foundational. It will pull data from air, space, sea, and ground assets, and that data will need to be ingested, tagged, curated, architected, and shared to enable data analytics, AI, and machine learning delivered to the tactical edge. Given the daunting scope of this kind of change, what are some smaller tactical steps that you see the Air Force making that will enable programs such as ABMS? Okay, so I'll talk on a very top level and then um, Tim can kind of talk this tactical uh, within the sustainment center. So the ABMS, or Advanced Battle Management System, really is an internet of things. And to be able to have this interconnection between all of these different systems and sensors, we need a baseline. And so within it, that baseline provides us the ability to focus on um, tactical areas. For example, secure processes. To really achieve um, ABMS, we need a capability for secure processing where we can put a data in a secure environment. So Cloud One is one of the um, areas that we're looking at. And that is something that we're working on across the Air Force to look at these cloud environments that are secure, where we can process data and host our data. Another part of ABMS is sensor integration, being able to talk to multiple platforms. And again, there's a lot of efforts that are focusing on the sensors and the integration and the open architecture so that an F-20 talks to an F-35 in the battle space. Um, common data architecture is another portion of the ABMS. And so there's initiatives going on with framework that we can share that data. Uh, activity, <laughs> that's a really important thing. So especially in a contested environment, so there's numerous smaller tactical efforts looking at how we, how we ensure we have connectivity. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. 
Oh, sure. Hey, thanks, Debbie. So um, here within the Sustainment Center, one of the key attributes that we continually look at is basically deciding what is the most important at that tactical edge. So we look at the tactical edge at that point at which we are delivering readiness through our artisans and our tenants at the shop floor. So one of the big components that we are uh, leaning in on is figuring out what the edge network needs to look like, how we can extend it all the way back to the cloud so that we can have the machine learning, artificial intelligence applications but then more importantly, what can we do with all of that sensor data? How can we capture it? So we're looking at how do we pilot? How do we integrate uh, the different applications at the edge? We have several different uh, activities going on with a, an IoT pilot. We're looking at um, how do we do 5G integration at the shop floor? Uh, how does that integrate into the uh, broadband wireless that we already have on um, and securing that network? And then working all the way back through the additive manufacturing supply chain, organic manufacturing, how we're getting the specs and pushing those uh, to the point of use. And then all of the edge devices that we envision into that, really we cannot, um, I, I think, pilot enough. But the big thing is making sure that we're going after those tactical wins so that then we can set the metrics, notice that we are improving, and then how do we sort of learn, iterate, and repeat to scale through an acquisition approach that actually doesn't do piloting for pilot's sake, but we're integrating, be it uh, organic pilots that we're already running, um, uh, transition through the SIBR process, how do we work through a um, acquisition roadmap to build that, that requires a, a synergized effort that links our architecture with the in-state goals and objectives that leadership has established. We'll get into our digital strategy a bit later, but that's what we are focused on. That's our North Star. We are trying to really, um, as some of the earlier panelists said, uh, incorporate that smart factory, smart building concept into our architecture and then working a long-term acquisition strategy for that. Uh, for the success of the sustainment center. that I led into earlier. So we are supporting the digital campaign. Our focus areas within the uh, sustainment center are around providing that resilient and secure network and information technology infrastructure that links to the LOE zero that I'm on within AFSC. Um, that will in turn um, allow us to enable that agile adoption of operational technology and, and technical or tactical uh, information technology at the edge, which was the major theme of this effort. Um, and then digitally optimize the execution and information generating readiness either through the supply chain, through the tactical edge with the artisan that's either delivering commodities or uh, aircraft. So we have uh, those four focus areas areas turns into lines of effort. So our digital solutions is, of course, looking at our digital manufacturing, being that in the uh, react, rearm uh, cells that are doing that additive manufacturing piece or bringing in um, integrated sensors into the shop floor with our um, uh, category management um, and through our capital investment program budget. Um, and then we're also looking at how do we integrate the um, PLM and do that value stream digital twins uh, through to the digital technician. And then we're looking at the focus areas for the execution and information services. So um, we are really looking at how do we go through this line of effort, the digital C2, we need that digital uh, command and control. We're working that 
um, through some dashboarding activities, through a, um, you know, those manufacturing information systems so that we can get better ops control. Um, and then we're looking at that operational technology architecture. All of this starts with an operational technology architecture that really has to be integrated into our OT, IT environment and press that forward. Our, our second focus area is that adoption of agile um, or the agile adoption of uh, operational and tactical uh, technology. So we, we really rely heavily on our, our business systems. We have several efforts in partnership with A4 where we're looking at uh, MROI and ESCAPE. We also have to look at integration of the efforts around um, PLM, as Ms. Daigai mentioned, um, and several of the other panelists mentioned. And then we have the item master for our cataloging. So our um, IT efforts around that is obviously the IT risk and portfolio management. We had several panelists talk about acceptable risk, um, risk avoidance rather than, uh, or risk management as opposed to risk avoidance. We're working heavily with our um, authorizing officials, both within the SWINT, the software engineering organization, and our industrial depot maintenance to make sure that we're linked in there. And then our third line of effort is around this operational technology ecosystem. How are we building an integration of all of this and how can we scale it through the pilot activities? So our fourth focus area is really around that resilient and secure information technology. We talked about the digital backbone. How do we secure that digital backbone? I know that we talked a little bit about enterprise IT as a service and those mission defense components. We, as the, um, uh, Rachel mentioned, I have the Cyber Operations uh, Center Senior Functional. So we are remaking this uh, comm type of focus into a cyber focus. How do we integrate those efforts into our authorizing officials so that we can have continuous assessments of the um, items within their boundary? Um, how can we put those on a secure network like the uh, Air Force Control Systems Network? How can we integrate our industrial um, control systems on and SCADA from the CE side into CE coin? And then what does that data integration effort look like, like Ms. Negai was talking about, and really extend that business case? Um, because that is a big um, investment area for us. So what we really need to do is ensure that we are, uh, again, going back to piloting, learning, and scaling so that we can build a comprehensive acquisition strategy that builds on each other, that supports our digital strategy and where leadership wants us to go. And then it links back to that digital campaign that General Bunch has uh, Major General Cooley working on so that we can ensure linkage all the way through the life cycle with it being with our um, uh, customers on the nuke weapon side or the life, cy life cycle management center side or our service partners that are delivering that base infrastructure with IMSC. So that's really where we're headed with our digital uh, transformation effort, how we link to the digital campaign. And so then from there, I think we'll turn it back to Rachel and go from there. Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, and more on the AFMC digital transformation campaign, Debbie. So the Virtual Industry Industry Day provided a comprehensive overview of the scope of the campaign and various lines of effort and governance structure. It was encouraging to see the linkage between the acquisition community, South EQ and PEO, with the lines of effort. With the need for speed with discipline, when do you see actual use cases and opportunities for industry to engage occurring, especially given industry's adoption of digital transformation well underway? So I think the answer is now, immediately. Their Air Force is trying to leverage all the great innovative ideas and capabilities out there through small businesses, um, startup businesses, big businesses, whatever is out there. And I think that was just um, showcased with a recent award of 15 new contractors to the ABMS effort. So um, I think if a small business is interested in trying to um, showcase or integrate some of their innovative products, there's so many initiatives that are going on. Uh, you have AFWorks that was stood up down in, in Las Vegas and Strikeworks is set up at, outside of Barksdale. You have MGM Works that's out of uh, Montgomery, Alabama for Business Enterprise System. Softworks in Tampa. 
uh, the Techstars Starburst Space Accelerator out in LA, uh, Techstars Air Force in Boston. There's just tons of initiatives. Uh, there's mass robotics initiatives for drones. So there's two, a huge amount of opportunities, I think, today that, um, that we could start leveraging. And that is what the Air Force is very much interested in, is leveraging those great innovations, um, those new cap uh, capabilities. And although it's speed with discipline, it's also fail fast. So bring in a new capability, experiment it, demonstrate it, test it, evaluate it. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then bring another new capability in. And that is what uh, Dr. Roper is trying to encourage with a lot of these new initiatives where they are uh, leveraging um, you know, new technologies, new solutions um, to help the Air Force transform faster, help us um, leverage artificial intelligence. I will also give a plug um, from, from the MITRE side. Um, MITRE also has an uh, innovate, uh, bridging innovation uh, organization that helps um, build pathways to discover and accelerate and deliver innovations across government organizations, not just D, but um, other organizations such as the CDC, uh, such as Homeland Security. And so if you're interested in learning more about the Bridging Innovation, you can go to bridge.mitre.org or you can send me uh, an email or connect up with me in the chat room and I'll talk about how MITRE is trying to um, tie small businesses to uh, government requirements. I think that's all I have, Rachel. Great. We're going to do rapid fire on the next three questions because I would like to end on some use cases from each of you for the audience. Um, but Randy, what lessons learned is the civil engineering community, community deriving from Tyndall Air Force Base rebuild efforts? Do you see the Air Force, and particularly the civil engineering community, embracing smart buildings, smart city techniques? Do you see these digital transformation concepts being applied to AFMC headquarters at Wright Pat, their renovation projects? Thank you, Rachel. So, of course, uh, starting with the Tyndall question that you asked, all of us have a frame of reference. Now, uh, we can't forget uh, 10 October. Uh, 2018 is when uh, this Category 5 uh, uh, basically trashed the Tyndall Air Force Base with a storm surge of 19 to 14 feet, and that created a huge opportunity, and the Air Force struggled with, do we keep the base? Do we get rid of it? Um, do we uh, move on, or do we do something, just rebuild it as it was, or, or do something different that uh, doesn't exist today? And the Air Force, thankfully, uh, this created a huge opportunity and strategic partnerships for the Air Force to essentially, we're going to do the build this base of the future, allow us to do rapid prototyping, and essentially then uh, make it game changing for the rest of the Air Force. So one of the uh, cool things that they they looked at, uh, for instance, embedding sensors, building automation, energy management, uh, life cycle safety, um, even gunshot detection sensors throughout the installation, creating an operations center concept that brings all the command and control functions together, including security forces and fire emergency services um, and the uh, 325th uh, fire wing leadership. And then uh, building that into kind of an internet of things and vis visualization of building systems uh, from anywhere in the world so that um, our partners, regardless of where they are, have the site picture. So for the next hurricane, as we're looking at uh, Hurricane Delta now getting ready to ravage the uh, um, uh, Mexican uh, coastline uh, in the Gulf. But anyway, uh, looking at uh, exploring energy resilience at uh, Tyndall Air Force Base and concepts to include microgrids and renewable energy sources and on-site generation you know, this is really cool stuff uh, for a civil engineer as a um, career civil engineer and uh, looking at the installation of future. And as I mentioned, to then um, uh, essentially bottle that and take those successes and then um, uh, use those same successes throughout the enterprise. So uh, as we're working with the uh, AFWORKS challenges, which were installation security and defense, installation resilience, additive manufacturing, leveraging technology for operational effectiveness, and even a cultural 
uh, creating a culture of innovation. Those are, uh, um, and, and just uh, quoting the, the uh, Colonel Brian Laidlaw, the 325th uh, Fire Wing Commander, we're not rebuilding the base we had, but the base we need for the future. And so to bring that home, uh, Tyn the Tyndall Program Management Office is, uh, has awarded 15 million in uh, AFWORK's uh, Base of the Future contracts. And this was uh, just recently in an article uh, dated 1 October. And just to bring that even further home, they received over 1,700 submissions across, across the six challenges. And the AFWORKS Fusion Showcase 2020, um, uh, that, which was held in uh, July uh, this year, uh, building the installation of future with industry experts. And from the um, uh, roughly 1,700 submissions, 374 were selected to present during the AFWORKS Digital Showcase event, and 92 finalists were moved uh, on to the demonstration phase. So hopefully some of you in our audience are uh, with uh, uh, some of those, are, are demonstrating some of those innovations. Now quickly, I'd like to move on to the Headquarters Air Force Materiel Command renovation. So uh, recently it was approved to proceed with renovating our Headquarters Air Force Material Command, uh, roughly 3,000 personnel, a $400 million undertaking. The buildings uh, were built, uh, two, two of the large buildings, uh, the headquarters where the four-star sits, you know, was built in World War II and the uh, the building that I sit in, Building 266, was built in the 1970s. The buildings are on life support. So um, when we look at some of those innovations, um, unfortunately, the Air Force is still looking at Tyndall for that rapid prototyping to demonstrate some of the um, 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 some of the areas where, if it's demonstrated and proved successful, like the Internet of Things and pulling all these things together then ultimately we'll look at uh, projects. But some of the cool stuff that we're looking at for the headquarters, for instance, it's huge, fiber com network and fiber to every uh, desk. You know, that's not just everywhere in the world, but that's obviously to speed the uh, flow of data from the cloud and from other uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, Wi-Fi in key areas so that uh, you don't end up uh, with dead spots in the building. Sound masking systems uh, to support the flexible design, you know, minimum hard walls and use of systems furniture. Another uh, thing that just popped up on the horizon as a result of COVID, for instance, we're looking at 30% of our workforce teleworking. And so we're looking at robust uh, telework capabilities to support that. Um, LED lighting, obviously, uh, that's, a, that's a big thing and a, and a huge uh, cost savings. Um, touchless fixture. So when you think of COVID, you know, uh, automatic doors um, and uh, touchless fixtures, you know, no more restroom doors. Think of it as like airports. So you walk in and there's a serpentine uh, capability there. You're not touching anything in the bathroom. So, uh, and ultraviolet lights uh, in the uh, HVAC systems to, uh, to kill any kind of germs uh, flowing so, so, you know, COVID may be with us uh, for, forever, even after a vaccine. And so um, ultimately having these smart uh, building systems to protect the workforce and uh, maintain a high productive, uh, productive workforce and um, uh, ultimately to uh, fly, fight, and win. So with that, back to you, Rachel. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to finish this off. We're running out of time. So the last question for each of you I think you'll have about one minute each to answer to stay on time here. What specific use cases, if you can do this in a minute, what specific use cases are your organizations working on in regards to adopting new technologies into the missions? And Tim, I'm going to start with you, head to Debbie, and we'll finish with Randy. Sure. So in a minute, uh, we are linked uh, directly with the digital campaign through our digital strategy and support of the organic industrial base. So the organic industrial base really has multiple use cases in addition to what Randy talked about in terms of the quality of life, be the telework or keep the employees safe. But we are actually looking at use cases uh, for digitization and IT infrastructure around our facilities and um, campus layouts. We're looking at uh, 
equipment purchases uh, through, uh, or, you know, kind of natively censored that can go straight on and get an ATO um, and then be plugged right in through to the uh, uh, control systems network via a um, fast track ATO. Uh, we're looking obviously at the digital depot and how we introduce industry 4.0 concepts through IoT, through advanced analytics, through wearables at the edge all of the things that a lot of the panelists talked about today and then of course those hidden infrastructure that we would rely on our CE partners to to really work through with us and improve through either the um, IMSC, AFCEC or through the Army Corps partnership to improve that but we would love to be able to get all of that data uh, be able to man uh, get our manufacturing execution systems up, get that command center concept going so that we can truly manage the digitized factory of the future. So that's where AFSC is headed. Um, uh, so back to you, Rachel. Great, Demi, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Same question. Okay, well, it's good that I can talk really fast. So one of the things I'd like to just highlight is that we are working on for the Air Force for the logistics and sustainment community an ecosystem of logistics and sustainment decision support capabilities. So one of the areas we're working on is a capability to help the field scheduling and optimization um, for uh, every weapon system that would actually help them improve readiness, look at health metrics versus availability metrics, um, look at the predictive maintenance and determine you know, how to optimize maintenance tasks based on the current conditions. Another one is doing a fleet management capabilities um, initiative where the match comms would have an uh, ability to look at how to uh, increase availability, managing a fleet, um, a, you know, managing a, by fleets, um, and understanding really more of the um, impacts to that availability. We're doing a kickoff right now, which is I'm pretty excited about. It is a predictive program depot maintenance brochure. Right now, we um, induct our aircraft into heavy um, into depot maintenance. Each one of those aircraft has a standard work package. What we're trying to do is build a health record by tail number by linking and infusing data using some AI so we can actually predict what we would need to do uh, in the depot which will reduce the depot um, possessed time, reduce cost, and then increase availability to the warfighter. And the last initiative we're working that we're kicking off this year is a initiative for the uh, IMSC, uh, Installation Management uh, Maintenance Support Center down in uh, San Antonio. And we're looking at how do we how do we optimize logistics and basing in an agile combat? What are those things that will improve uh, and increase flexibility, agility, uh, a smaller footprint um, so that we can get in and get out um, based on the new fighting concepts? So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Rachel. Great, and Randy, you're gonna round us out. What use cases are your organization, uh, is your organization working for new technologies into the mission? So I, I couldn't leave without talking uh, about the uh, Air Force Spark Tank. So if you're familiar with Shark Tank, okay, uh, think of that and now for the Air Force, and this is the annual event designed to empower airmen, uh, encourage entrepreneurship, retain innovation, innovators, and speed adoption of emerging technologies that provide solutions to some of our most challenging Air Force problems. And uh, imagine 50% of these um, uh, innovations, ideas, have come from our airmen. But that means the other 50% have come from industry professionals. So those of you that are sitting in the viewing audience, um, don't forget the deadline is coming up here on 16 October. So if you have no idea, Google it. Uh, spark tank. This is uh, where the Air Force is investing time and energy. We need those innovative ideas. Uh, it's speed of change. It is critical. If you've been paying attention to what the Air Force Chief of Staff is, our new Air Force Chief of Staff, General Brown, is saying, it's uh, it's critical to the survival of our nation and critical to the uh, to the mission set of the United States Air Force. We need that innovation. You all have great ideas. This is to get it to the first, you know, get it up front and get, uh, more importantly, get some of those uh, rapid prototyping dollars uh, in your hands. And so with that, back to you, Rachel. Awesome. Thank you so much. And with that, I want to um, just thank all the participants and bearing with us through technical difficulties. 
I think uh, it's safe to say our panelists are quite adaptive and uh, would also uh, thank you guys so much, our panelists, for sharing your insights, your wisdom, and just um, all the information about your organizations. Very uh, a wealth of knowledge. I appreciate it. Um, with that, that's going to wrap us up, and I'm going to hand it over to Tim Meixner for closing remarks for the WIDS conference. Tim. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, panelists. Um, folks, we are at wit's end. So thank you for attending our two-day Write IT Summit. I'd definitely like to thank our virtual event providers, ITA Audio Visual Solutions, and our WITS event coordinator, and, ex and AFSIA Executive Vice President, Yvonne Vermillion. Uh, we encourage you to fill out a, sur a short survey that's going to appear on screen uh, at the completion of this, and then obviously afterwards you'll be directed to the uh, networking session. So again, thanks to the panelists, thanks to the keynote speakers, and especially thanks to you, the participants, for uh, spending two days out of your busy schedules with us. And we hope to see you next year for WITS 2021. Thanks and goodbye. At the conclusion of the day, a window will appear on screen which will direct you to the virtual networking session. Click the button to be transported to the networking landing page. Click the button to sign into the event. You will be prompted to create a personal account. Then it will take you through a quick onboarding procedure. Next, you will be asked to fill in your profile so that everyone knows who you are. This information will be available to other attendees in your virtual business card. The virtual networking area is divided into booths. When you first enter the room, you will be placed randomly in a booth with a free seat. You can navigate around the room with your mouse and zoom utilizing the center wheel or a pinch motion on your trackpad. This session provides the best experience when you utilize your camera and microphone to interact with the vendors, sponsors, speakers, and other attendees. Simply click the camera and microphone at the bottom of the screen to enable them. You have the ability to trigger tile view, which will bring the people in your booth into spotlight, or floor plan view, which will show everyone at the top of the screen while allowing you to view the rest of the room. The chat window also allows you to interact with others in a general chat, table chat, and direct chat. You also have the ability to send files through the chat window. Additionally, there is a whiteboard feature if illustration will help communicate your point. If the session has a second floor, you may access it using the icon at the top. Once again, thank you for your participation in the event, and we hope you have a wonderful experience. If you do have any technical issues or questions throughout the event, please call our help desk at 1-800-899-8877.